No, there are still a few people coming in. I would, I would wait two minutes or so. Um, so people are still in the room. Valeria is there. Is it Valeria? Pulignano. In, in Italian, it's quite easy because it's the name of a city. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Pulignano. Okay. 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 Good morning, everyone. In a few instant, we will start. Okay, good morning. Can you hear me well? Hi. <laughs> okay, the advantage of this room, which is tiny, is that there is good audio and sound. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Sorry. Oh. There's an echo. So it's not so good. I don't know if there is a technician around. <laughs> okay, Maria. Ah, there is an echo. Maybe it's the computer. Yeah. Ah, it's the computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Oops. Yes. It's a false start. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try. Yeah, better, right? Okay. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> okay, welcome everyone. Let's start again. So welcome everyone in this conference. And we are very happy to see so many people. We are very happy to have seen so many call for paper when we launched the call, uh, many, many abstracts were sent and many, many familiar faces here from different disciplines and different countries. So this is great. So I just briefly opened the conference. It's gonna be a two days conference. It's quite intense. The program is tight. Um, hopefully we will enjoy and we will have time to relax as well. Um, without further ado, I just give the word to the two person who will be open uh, today sessions. Uh, the first is uh, Bart Van Erke, uh, is the director of the research department of the HUI. And then we will have Ludovic Vogt, confederal secretary. And it's, I'm very happy that he's here with us because, well, he, he really did as much as was possible to do in behalf of the HUC to make the best possible in relation to the platform work directive. And that's a complicated story and uh, we will hear more. Okay, so please, Bart, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Happy to, to kick it off. We don't manage to find time to have lunch together, Ludovic, but at least we open conferences together. So that's good. Um, so happy to be able to open this uh, event with a nicely full room and we're expecting some more crowds um, uh, to talk about now, uh, I think for the fifth time or something like that. Uh, about the future of um, work. Um, and I admit that I, when I looked at the program again this morning, I was again quite puzzled about what it actually means, uh, the future of work, uh, because it indeed seems that it's, the things are uh, evolving uh, so rapidly uh, that what we think of as the future today, um, in fact, tomorrow or a uh, few, uh, months or years later already is uh, very clear in our present lives and work. And you know the examples, of course, uh, during the pandemic, yeah, the issue of uh, remote work uh, gained uh, a lot of momentum, was considered to change the world of work in, uh, in very important ways. Uh, and today, of course, uh, uh, just a few years later, it is uh, a reality uh, of, uh, of, every, of every single day. The same we've seen with uh, platform work, uh, we see it with uh, algorithmic uh, management, and there are many other examples which will be discussed uh, during um, uh, these days. Um, so, um, not a surprise that policymakers are 
uh, still trying to get a grip on all of these changes. They are so rapid. Uh, and I hope indeed uh, that you will be able to comment on uh, what happened recently or what is happening for the moment with regard to, um, to, or to platform work. Um, so rest assured, we are well aware that things are revolving uh, rapidly. And at the same time, um, and so with regard to generative artificial intelligence, etc. And at the same time, of course, um, the topic of digitalization is still very much uh, at the core of our work uh, at ETI. It will also be at the core of uh, this uh, conference today um, and tomorrow. Um, and we're very happy that we can now indeed have a... Uh, co a conference every year, two days, uh, full of uh, rich discussions. I see some old friends, some new friends, uh, and happy to be able to be uh, part of that now. So um, I've seen on the program uh, lawyers, political scientists, uh, psychologists, sociologists, economists, and many others that I miss out uh, for sure. So that's, I think, also very important uh, that we have this multidisciplinary approach, not only in the Institute, but also uh, during uh, this event. And that is, of course, um, our ambition uh, to have this uh, multidisciplinary exchange of views, cross fertilization also between uh, disciplines, which is not always um, so easy. But also cross fertilization and exchange of views, not only among academics and researchers, as we are, but also with policymakers, uh, with the people who make it happen, like Ludovic, like the people uh, at ETUC, social partners more broadly, uh, policymakers, um, other uh, social stakeholders. And so happy to have uh, these people here uh, today as well. That is absolutely crucial. Um, so we'll be listening to a variety of uh, different interventions on many topics from scholars, researchers in different stages of um, their career, of course, in fully uh, gender balanced uh, panels, as it has to be. Uh, we'll learn about the business models of uh, digital actors. Uh, we'll learn about industrial relations strategies to improve uh, working conditions. And we'll have some surprises, at least for me, I don't know about you. I saw that Melanie Hack, I don't know where you are, Melanie, is going to uh, talking to talk about finding costs in digitalized working life. I'm not sure what that is, but we'll find out. And so that's, I, I really look forward to that. Um, so um, the debates here today, the debates uh, tomorrow, uh, we'll uh, also uh, we'll be able to explain what we do at the, uh, the ETY. We'll continue uh, to do that and, and, and you know, to some extent try to, to take the lead on, on such topics, um, but also show how it feeds into the world of notably the European Trade Union uh, Confederation. Because as far as we are concerned, of course, our work only makes sense if it's then picked up by actors, if it's being used and indeed uh, is uh, being fed into uh, the policy cycle. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and the, 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 the results are, of course, um, varied. Um, so, um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say, Ludovic. I leave it... Uh, to you to welcome us also on, on behalf of the ETUC. And then I'll just change my hat and introduce uh, the first uh, the first panel. So Ludovic, please. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Bart, and uh, thanks for organizing this uh, as it's uh, highly essential for us uh, to have uh, uh, this community of discussion, uh, community of exchange of, of, um, of ideas. Uh, which has been fruitful in the last uh, few years on the uh, on all the topics related to the digital world uh, in uh, shaping policy making. Uh, even if we are not yet uh, done, we would have hope, of course, today to be in a situation of celebrating mm -hmm. uh, the vote uh, last week uh, of uh, the platform work directive. Uh, we are not uh, in this situation, uh, but we were close to. Uh, so that's the. <laughs> That's the positive <laughs> side of the news. Uh, 23 countries out of 27 last week uh, did support the text that is on the table on uh, the platform work directive. And we were never as close as that. So let's see. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of deception, of course, uh, last Friday. Uh, but uh, we have always, as trade unionists, to, uh, like the cats, uh, to fall on our uh, feet. Uh, and it's important uh, to see uh, the... Uh, what we have done and, and what can still be done in this regard. So of course, not only on platform work, but uh, this uh, le legislative 
term of the commission has also be, I would say, the first one to try to uh, uh, to tackle the social dimension of uh, all the digitalization. Uh, so uh, through uh, div different uh, uh, initiatives, of course, uh, the directive on platform work, of course, the first talks on uh, algorithm management uh, at work included in the directive also on platform work uh, in the case of uh, platform workers, all the discussion on AI, uh, all the discussion on the transformations uh, linked to uh, uh, digitalization and uh, uh, telework that arrived in our life uh, for a lot of us uh, after COVID, uh, during COVID. Uh, and there has been a lot of initiative in this uh, regard, uh, also at trade union, uh, uh, of course, uh, level, uh, either to set the agenda of the institutions, either to set the agenda also of uh, social dialogue. And unfortunately, in social dialogue, we have tried our best uh, to uh, have a, to, to be able to negotiate a directive uh, to uh, on the right to disconnect and uh, and telework, uh, which the employers have not been able to um, uh, to agree on the final mandate. Uh, unfortunately, at the uh, at the year, uh, at the end of last uh, year, so this could have we could have been in a situation uh, today uh, if employers would have taken their um, uh, their responsibility, if platforms would have taken their responsibility, and if the pro countries that are the proxies of the platforms would have taken their responsibility uh, to be celebrating a directive on platform work, to be celebrating a directive on uh, telework and the right to disconnect, and to discuss about the implementation, uh, to discuss about strategies of implementation to secure uh, workers' rights. So that's not yet the case, but that's uh, still, the, of course, uh, the ambition uh, that we should, uh, should have, because in all these uh, discussions, we have been able uh, to print the debate uh, with the uh, with a strong trade union uh, aspect in the discussion uh, on all these discussions and how uh, digi uh, the digital world in fact reshape the world of work in terms of working time in terms of health and safety in terms of training in terms of uh, uh, contracts uh, in terms of discrimination in terms of firing um, well, all these debates uh, add an angle uh, of how to best protect workers uh, in uh, this uh, transformation and all our demands uh, went into uh, this uh, direction. Uh, we have also had last year the promise of the president of the commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, at our Congress to deliver also a directive on algorithm management in the world of work. It's not yet on the table, but that's a promise that was done in May uh, 2023. We would have hoped it would have come also before the end of the legislative term, but this is at least foreseen for normally the beginning of the next uh, legislative term. Uh, of course, there's an interaction with Platform Work Directive because a, a big part of the Platform Work Directive, uh, which was the chapter that was maybe less uh, divisive, uh, was the part on the algorithm management rights uh, for workers. Uh, in uh, in the platform economy, uh, which would have been one of, uh, if the directive would have passed, uh, one of the most ambitious uh, legislation in the world uh, on the topic. So, which would uh, so it's really a pity that it was blocked. Uh, I I cannot say that I have a lot of hope that it will be resolved in the uh, in the next few weeks, but it's still a possibility. So it's not that there was a vote. Uh, there was no vote, uh, technically speaking, last week. So there was no rejection. It was just that no majority was uh, achievable on the table, but we were one country close to a majority. So 23 countries out of 27 were in favor of the text that it was on the table, which means 23 countries can already if there's a blockage, begin to implement legislation on platform work, and they should not wait anymore uh, to do this. A lot of countries has, have engaged in the negotiations on platform work by saying, we were already seeing, uh, wa wanting to have national legislation on the topic, and we were waiting to have a European framework in order to do it. If they see that they cannot have a European framework, they should not wait anymore to advance on the national framework. What All what is uh, in the text now is not perfect, it can, of course, be improved. Trade unions can engage uh, in uh, discussing at national level with these 23 countries 
how to implement the best national uh, strategy. Of course, it would be better to avoid fragmentation and to have a EU uh, directive. Uh, and this is, of course, what we will continue to uh, advocate for. And let's see in the following weeks uh, what the Belgian presidency will do uh, in order to unblock uh, the uh, situation as we were really one country close uh, to, uh, to a deal. Um, so yeah, I don't want to be uh, too long. I think it's already uh, enough. I think uh, in all these uh, discussions, uh, the trade union demands uh, were, uh, I think, were crystal clear, and we have been able to be agenda setters. Now we have to be able to be uh, uh, to use all what, uh, all these works, uh, all this work to uh, to sh uh, to shape also the national uh, nas national implementation to uh, to shape also the trade unions. Uh, involvement uh, in uh, these discussions and there will be a lot of tools uh, there would have been a lot of tools in the directive but there are also a lot of tools that were discussed that can now be used uh, to uh, uh, to try to with the recognition of the role of representatives uh, in platform work in the uh, same thing with the different rights in the chapter three of the uh, algorithm management there's a lot of i would say agreement on uh, tools that can be now implement and that can now be also a, a starting point for uh, designing uh, strategies for trade unions uh, in uh, continue the fight against uh, well big platforms that would like to avoid uh, legislation and are still uh, trying to avoid legislation which shows in fact the reactions of the lobbies of the platform last week uh, asking uh, the council to reject uh, the directive which means that the directive is still a valid one because there was a lot of discussions of course on uh, did all the changes to the text in the negotiations completely dilute uh, the presumption of employment relationship that's a valid discussion to have but i think that the reaction of the enemy determines a little bit if you're still right or if you're blind uh, in the uh, in your assessment uh, so the reaction of the enemy uh, shows that uh, the the directive that is on the table uh, is still something that they fear which means that it's still something that uh, uh, that might bring um, um, an extra uh, added value, even if we understood clearly that there was a lot of uh, scope to of improvement in terms of enforcement, etc., and that this will be in any case uh, the fight that trade unions will have to to bring in the next uh, few years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ludovic, for introducing uh, those key issues on the current political agenda, the games real actors play, and also for staying optimistic, even though you're not very hopeful, important nuance. Um, I'm not actually chairing this introductory panel, but still, now that you're here, and I don't know how long you can stay, Ludovic, we don't have a confederal secretary with us every day. Is there anybody who would like to raise a two hands question to Ludovic, if you still have a few minutes for that? So who dares to take the floor so that we're done with that? The first question has been raised. Ludovic is with us now. Any questions on the directive, on the negotiations, on any topic you would like to raise? Please go ahead. I hate silences like that. So. <laughs> Anyone? Yes, sir. And if you can just say who you are. Ivan Williams. I'm a senior uh, policy in public affairs, working on occupational safety and health for an yes. international NGO in, in the UK. Um, I just wanted to ask you in terms of the uh, because I, I tend to see like a big, still like a big working in policy, having a back, um, background in research, I still see like a big disconnection uh, from the research discourse when it comes to engaging with uh, policy makers or uh, at a public policy level. So I wonder if we should be as researchers, like more critics with ourselves, how we engage in, I mean, with rapporteurs, engaging with trade unions, uh, with workers, are we getting our messages across? At, as for platform work, I think it's one of the most research um, areas in the past few few years, but I don't think we're really getting our messages uh, across uh, mm -hmm. policymakers. So any guidance on that? Any other questions? We can have maybe have a second one. Yes, there is somebody raised their hand. Hi, my name is Ben Ray. I'm a journalist. I coordinate the Gig Economy Project. Probably the only journalist in the room, so I thought I'd better ask the question. Um, Ludovic, do you think that the, the, the strategy should be to try to bring up this again, the Platform Work Directive again, in the same uh, formulation as this time in the next parliamentary term? Or has that time passed and is it now better to just focus on member state strategies 
because it's possible that the next parliamentary term could the the situation in the parliament could be more unfavorable for platform workers rights um so so is it is it now time to think of a different different strategy for for trying to to fight for platform workers rights okay thank you so much if there are no other two hand interventions there is please happy about that and then little back to you Thank you. My name is Monica Tepfer. I'm legal officer at the ITOC. And I, I'm really happy to hear that you're still positive. I also have the feeling, positive feeling about that. But also because next year we, we, we may have to start discussion, the standard setting on platform economy at the ILO level, which is very, very important. We may end with a convention recommendation, still need to discuss about that. But how do you see is also discussion at the ILO and the connection between the ILO and the EU directive. Thank you so much. Okay, so Lidovok, are we getting our messages across as researchers some guidance from a policymaker, platform work, I think with the next parliamentary uh, session and then question from Monica, the link with the ILO and the EU debate, please. Yeah, thank okay. you. Uh, on the first question, I hope that the answer you will have it at the end. Of the conference. <laughs> we'll uh, but the um, I would say that uh, for sure, at the level of uh, the ETUC and the collaboration with ETY, mm -hmm. it's quite uh, important. Uh, mm -hmm. We have already this collaboration, and uh, and we 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 try to align a little bit uh, the agenda and uh, discuss uh, uh, what uh, what is uh, clearly needed because we are more, of course, as ETUC engaged with policymakers, and we we identify the needs that are uh, that, that are there. So at at national level, it's also important to have these discussions, uh, even uh, to, uh, in order to uh, uh, to see what are the agendas and uh, and calendars of the uh, of the policymakers to engage mm -hmm. directly. Because as as you rightly identified, a lot of people are working on this. Uh, the uh, the problem is that. Uh, we uh, we are still uh, failing to uh, to convince. Uh, I was I'm I, I'm in fact uh, quite astonished. In fact, uh, when I see arguments uh, counter arguments to the platform work directive, still uh, last week, for example, of uh, the German liberals uh, that were happy of the rejection of the deal, uh, saying uh, this directive will lead to massive reclassification. This directive will lead to fragmentation. Um, well, uh, and and you're there, you're. We are 804 days after the publication of the directive. And there are still people that uh, can use fake argument in this discussion, uh, okay. completely fake arguments. Uh, everybody who reads uh, the text uh, and who understands a little bit the text knows that if there's reclassification, it means that there's subordination. So there will never be massive reclassification of genuine self-employed. This doesn't exist. Even it doesn't exist. Even if we say uh, all the platform uh, workers of this platform have to be have to get a contract, nobody will force those who were uh, self-employed to take the contracts. They will have the uh, the choose uh, the choice to uh, to to work for another platform. So this doesn't exist. A massive rec uh, reclassification of genuine self-employed. So I'm I'm quite astonished by uh, by the fact that uh, it means also that we are not uh, completely reaching uh, all. Uh, the um, well, or, or complete, not completely printing all the debate. Uh, we are uh, able to uh, print the debate with all our allies, etc. Uh, but uh, there's still uh, there's still a way to um, to improve. Uh, I think if we want to win. Um, in the uh, about the next uh, next term or now, uh, of course, I've, I think it would have been better now. And if there's a way to unblock it now, it's I think uh, I think it has to be done. Uh, because if we uh, if it's after the this term, uh, I would not see a uh, resolution by the Hungarian presidency. I would not see a new parliament uh, more positive uh, to uh, the text uh, than now. So we risk also their reshaping of portfolios and losing also key allies uh, in uh, in the files. So there the political dynamic might change in the parliament. Which means that and there's no uh, big elections in the four countries that are blocking uh, that might make a change. Uh, so Greece, Estonia, France, and Germany will not have big elections uh, before uh, next year. Uh, so there's no uh, hope that uh, there's uh, uh, and that it will uh, improve uh, uh, in the near future if we don't finish it uh, now. So that's why. 
Um, that's why I think if we can't finish it now, we have to begin with the national implementation uh, strategies. That's, of course, a strategy by default because we would prefer to have a European directive uh, that would uh, help for that. But uh, we cannot wait. Uh, these workers cannot wait. They are waiting since two years, as, as I was saying, the, uh, the proposal, uh, the, uh, since the, uh, the publication of the proposal. But even more, they are waiting since uh, we are engaged in this discussion with the Commission since 2019. So the world of work has changed since 2019. The world of platform work has changed since 2019. And regulatory uh, uh, approach uh, are always lagging behind the models of the platform. So they are already ready for the next step uh, in order to circumvent. They already know how to circumvent the, uh, the low rider in Spain. So uh, that was that was more ambitious than the platform work directive on the setting of the employment status. So, if they already know this, uh, it means that we need uh, to uh, to yeah to to advance quickly. And on the last question, mm -hmm. I think that it was important uh, also uh, to have the platform work directive in order to print the discussion in the ILO. Because if we have no platform work directive, it means also that the discussions in the ILO next year will be more difficult on the presumption of employment relationship because you would have failed on this discussion in one continent. Uh, that is uh, uh, ambitious on the topic. Um, if we, yeah, so the interaction is quite clear that uh, if we uh, do not uh, advance well at European level on this question, it will not help the, uh, the, the ILO standard setting on in 2025 on platform work. Okay, thank you very much, Ludovic. Thanks for the questions. And I guess indeed that we'll get back to your question about whether we are getting our messages across to policymakers at the very end of this event. Thank you for joining us, Ludovic. I would like now to call the ETUI speakers for the first panel to this side uh, of the table, and then we kick off with the landscape of the future of digital work. It doesn't matter. Yeah. 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 Shall I accept it? And then uh, I should not. I don't care, but just mix the guys a bit. Mix the guys a bit. <laughs> what does it mean? I need to move? No, no, no. no I can sit there. You can not to have swap three places. men in the middle and women um, on the sides. No, it's fine. I need no, to but uh, that's places. perfect. <laughs> okay, we can. Oh, that's my positive energy. I think that it's transmitted into the microphone. Okay, so I've now changed hats. Um, to chair the first panel, um, let's say the E2I panel. Uh, we're going to talk about the landscape of the future of uh, digital work. Um, each of the colleagues here around the table uh, will present in about 10 minutes. And I know that that's extremely uh, challenging, but well, that's the way we have to do it. In about 10 minutes, uh, a flavor of the impressive body of work that has been uh, produced at the European Trade Union Institute. Um, the word landscape is already in the title, so indeed, let's be, I'll invite each of you to be a little bit uh, impressionistic. We cannot do more than that. And then the next panels, I will dive deeper in uh, the topics that we are going to um, dive into here. Um, I will allow for one or two two hands interventions or questions from the room, if needs be, after each talk. But two hands means that it's really urgent to speak. If not, we just collect a few questions at, um, at the end. OK, so we'll kick off with um, Sylvia. And yet it moves. <laughs> Please, you have 10 minutes. Sylvia. Thank you very much for the introduction, Bart. Um, yeah, and yet it moves. It was probably more 
made more sense if the directive would have been adopted by now. It hasn't, but uh, I still yes, wanted to stick to the title because the program was printed. So I, I tried to shape the, the presentation accordingly. Now, simply, I would like to give just a brief landscape introduction to, um, from a legal perspective, why is important to look beyond a bit the deceiving and disappointing uh, phenomena and, and trends that have been happening so far. And there are also positive aspects to, to explore and to push forward, as Ludovic also mentioned. Um, so in, in my presentation, I would like to point to indeed this tension, this contradiction between a pressure from policy making, uh, from lobbying towards yeah, making labor law basically ineffective to empty its, its effectiveness. Uh, and the other, but still on the other end, there is a bit of resistance. There is a bit of a uh, new lymph running to the veins of labor law that we can spot this new uh, promising um, evolution. And I think it's worth focusing on that, uh, trying to see how this tension eventually may also balance out for a good outcome. Um, so first I would like to start with the drivers that have so far have been reducing quite substantially the impact of labor law. On the one end, uh, we're talking about platform work here. So there is, of course, the digital transformation of labor and the platformization of work. Um, but on the other end, which also consider a more contextual and general trend, that is a specific uh, um, approach that EU policymaking often has toward the function of labor law. Uh, reducing labor law, not much as pursuing a protective function, but more a labor market regulation function. Um, starting from the first for the digital transformation and platformization of labor, I think we can see these um, materializing different aspects. The first is, um, well, an increase of self-employment, meaning a decrease of the scope of coverage of labor law. This comes with reclassi reclassification issues that partially could have been uh, tampered and approached by the platform work directive, but also the increase of genuine, probably genuine, vulnerable self-employed workers. Um, the fact is that digitalization, platformization has been very successful in putting and shifting labor market risk onto the individual and not to the business and the, the entity that has labor market power. The second effect, let's say labor market effect is an increase of the imbalance in labor market power, right? So we see more and more emerging, very powerful um, business actor, market actor, uh, acting uh, through and within the digital uh, realm, digital markets, and uh, they have a very disrupting effect on labor markets because they are being able to acquire a very strong uh, bargaining power. They have been able to settle uh, wage and term of condition of performance of work uh, in an unprecedented fashion. And this is very strongly connected with their uh, domination of technology and the use of technology in a way that conceal and uh, avoid application of labor law and other regulation. Then we also see another driver, which is the increased fragmentation, subcontracting, remoteness of work, meaning that the corporate structure, the firm platform in this sense, is changing nature. We are having this yet still very corporate uh, powerful actor, but in a way they manage to escape accountability of the employer because of the fragmented structure they're able to set up. In a way, there is, they, they manage to um, use their, to, in a way, use a corporate veil to hide their responsibility. And uh, yeah, this is problematic for the application of labor law. But then I also want to point to the other um, contextual aspects, so which is the approach that the, the EU and policymakers, including the commission, are having with respect to the function of labor law. I don't want to go into a deep conversation because we have no time, but um, just in more like um, informal way, we can also look another parallel phenomena to um, lawmaking, um, which is the soft law, right? Is the European semester. And this is quite interesting to look just because there is quite evident the position of the commission and the council in relation to the uh, policy of the member state, because in the context of this exercise, the council, on proposal of the Commission, provide recommendation of national policy, also in relation to labor law. And we see here, I wanted to show, that when it's about labor and policies, there is an accent, you will see on the, the first, on the left, 
graph, there is an accent, the blue line is labor market regulation. A lot of policy recommendations go in the direction of activating labor market, not more protection. And on the right side, we see one is about protection. Many recommendations, the red one, especially in the past, have been focusing on decreasing protection, removing obstacles from labor market. So these are trends that really go hand in hand. Um, so what is the effect of all this is narrowing the, cap the protecting capacity of labor law. This is a very like, simplistic image, but the darker triangle is the scope of application of currently of labor law. The lighter triangle is where it probably should be. So there is a really big gap in the capacity of labor law to cover vulnerabilities, to cover employer accountability, to cover uh, workers as subject of protection, not only those who fell now under the employee status, and also addressing new vulnerability provided by technology, algorithmic management, surveillance, et cetera. Um, I say something that is moving. Yeah? There is an accident of some, some positive ten trends happening out there, and I wanted to show them. Um, but before doing that, uh, it's important to think um, in terms of paradigm shifts here. It's important to look at where focus, research, policy, advocacy, focus should be placed. And I think it's very important to put focus on widening the notion of worker. Uh, accounting vulnerabilities are not covered by the concept of control or direction, which are normally in, uh, encompassed by labor law legislation, but also allocating employer accountability at the right level. This is something that is widely overlooked by policy discourse at the moment. Um, are there some positive trends? Well, yes and no, I try to identify some um, in two stages. One in the policy and legal framework. First of all, the platform work directive was promising, especially in the chapter that was less contentious, the one on algorithmic management, because it provides um, data rights or specific set of rights also to workers who are not classified as employee. So there is a broadening of the notion of those who have uh, vulnerabilities. Um, reserving, deserving of protection. Then it's very important to point at the Commission guideline on collective bargaining for self-employed. This is not a lawmaking instrument, but it shows the understanding from the Commission that actors um, such as platform workers, regardless of the status, but also others who are in the position of vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis the other bargaining power party, have right to collective bargaining. So broadening the scope. Then it's interesting to see that from other disciplines, there is more awareness, especially competition law, there is more awareness of the necessity to look at labor and the imbalance in the labor market to improve fairness in the labor market. So I think looking at competition law, the emerging con attention towards monopsony in competition law, but also the emerging functional concept of undertaking that goes beyond the legal structure is very important. Um, and finally, is, we can also explore other legal constructs happening in labor law. There is a whole case law from the Court of Justice on the transfer of undertaking directive, where the concept of undertaking is developed in a way that may be very useful and interesting to look at from a labor perspective to see how to pierce the corporate veil. So there are scope, there, is, there are angles. And finally, uh, there are also, or maybe not. <laughs> It's blocked. When you have to block it. Yeah. Oh, voila. Mm -hmm. uh, there is also emerging trends happening in litigation. And here I need to uh, give credit to the work of Chris, Professor Christina Hissel um, because she created this extensive mapping of case law in platform work. And there are very interesting um, aspects happening also there. More and more litigation use criteria that go beyond the notion of control to um, to as enlarge the scope of the notion of worker, including the fact that workers are in a impossibility to negotiate the term and condition of labor, impossibility to negotiate the wages. So you see there are this paradigm that go beyond the control and they're able to enlarge. Um, and also new paradigm that points to a new nature of the firm, including the fact that it's not important that the platform worker uses on bicycle, is on scooter, is on phone, because the real means of production is the platform. And new jurisprudence, new emerging jurisprudence, especially in Spain, is pointing that direction and it's quite successful. I tried to um, assess the, the successful uh, the um, success rate and you can see in red is the success rate of in general uh, case law on reclassification. And when the litigation strategies use a new concept of work 
such in the blue um, column, or a new concept of undertaking, including also uh, the fact that assets are the platform in the purple, the success rate is higher. So these strategies are successful. And finally, uh, there is also an emerging case law on piercing corporate bail, try to allocate uh, accountability to the employer, such as the platform and not at the subcontracting level. The results are mixed, um, but yeah, so there is something positive and interesting emerging out there. So this was the end. Uh, some of these reflection in a working paper, but that's it for me. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for this uh, impressive overview. Uh, <laughs> Two hands. Uh, mm, okay, you have the floor. Oh, no, it's, if it's can, really two hands and it. very brief. I want to just talk about the slides. Okay. Okay, can we put the slides back up, please, for one second? Oh, we can, no, we can't. We can't. Do, we you, can't. do you remember your well, question? Well, there was a really cool slide. slide on uh, deregulation and protection yeah. of workers over time. Can you tell us a little bit more about that data? Um, I can do briefly, it's data collected from the country-specific recommendation, which are policy recommendations that every year the Council address to member states uh, in order to make sure that their overall policy is aligned with a growth strategy of the EU. So labour policy is interesting because it's a variable for the Council to achieve growth. So they also look at labour in, in a way that often has been the regulatory. So that was the bit. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And so linking up to the long-standing research of EQI on the, yeah, the legacy. The legacy of the country specific recommendations and challenging a bit that notion of the socialization of the European semester, as some have put it <laughs> longer ago. Um, so thank you for pointing out the drivers uh, that reduce the uh, the impact of labor law, but also flagging some positive trends, uh, including perhaps a new paradigm on the topic, but you're very prudent uh, on that. So, so thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. Nieszka, we um, move to you. Disruptive impact of platforms on social partners and social dialogue. And again, please, you have 10 minutes. Um, thank you very much. Um, so what I will present um, to you briefly is based on a more extensive research presented in the paper uh, that it's cited on, on the cover. I'll just try to um, distill the, the, the essence of, of that. And what I look at is uh, the process. So not so much outcomes of all the uh, legislative hassle around the platform economy in terms of what solutions are needed, but by the process that leads to the elaboration of any policy proposals, and in particular, social dialogue and the social policy. So um, very briefly sketching the context and challenges. Uh, one of them uh, that everyone is aware of is what platforms build around themselves. And this is the, the image of exceptionalism. They put themselves cells outside of everything that we know. Um, no old labor uh, law categories should apply to them. They're at the forefront of innovation, so their progress should not be stalled by any uh, regulation or, or, um, uh, or laws applicable to them. And as a result, they uh, significantly slowed down any uh, regulation in, in the area of platform work. Um, what we do know is that they also change the constellation of actors that are involved in the platform economy, most notably by renouncing the role of the employer and pushing workers into different roles than uh, dependent employees. Um, and all the research, advocacy, and, and protest litigation uh, in the platform economy seems to point to the importance of the balance of power between the actors. So they do reshuffle the roles, but what happens between the actors is actually um, the essence of, of the conundrum in the platform economy. However, the calls for regulation so far has mostly focused on one uh, of, the, of the parties, which is the worker. So what worker, workers need, how to define them, what provisions they should get to ensure a fairer working conditions. But for the tango, uh, you, have, you need two, right? So uh, there needs to be another actor sitting in the driving chair. So it needs to be the employer. And so far, um, not much attention has been focused on, on clearly designating and enforcing the role of the employer. What I argue here that without this counter partner, this other, the, the other party in the, in the uh, process, we cannot arrive at much and actually it has damaging consequences for um, regulation and social dialogue. Um, so the argument, uh, indeed, I built on the power relations between the actors in the platform economy as key to, to focus as a starting point. 
um, and that the, the, the redefinition of the roles has wider implications for social partners. It affects not only the future of social dialogue, but also legislation and enforcement, because you need, as I said, to, uh, you need to enforce it on someone, for someone. Um, the absence of a negotiating partner for unions negatively affects the extent of bargaining coverage and the organizational capacity. So that's the quite immediate consequence, but it can have broader consequences in terms of collective bargaining and social dialogue. So when we look at uh, what's observed now uh, across Europe, um, the gradual withdrawal of traditional employers from multi-employer bargaining, and also there's a declining uh, importance put to the relation, relationship building with employer associations uh, at the industry level. So in this context, platforms actually can pave the way or set the model, the precedent for other employers to engage less and less uh, as a negotiating partner in, in, the, in industrial uh, agreements. So that can spill over into uh, different sectors as well. Um, I think I have time to just very briefly um, sketch the main arguments about uh, actors and their roles. So something that is a starting point to then um, analyze more closely what was actually unfolding over the last two years uh, at the EU level. So workers, um, workers are removed from the chair of a worker by being considered uh, by law as independent contractors or self-employed. So they're effectively businesses, small, but still. Um, there are mini corporations, not, uh, not workers. And yet this group is very vulnerable and works in very precarious conditions. So there is this contradiction. Uh, however, what's most more interesting is what's happening in the employer seat in this, uh, in this arrangement. So platforms uh, renounce taking the seat. Um, they claim they are not the employer, but the control they exercise over workers and work process has um, many of the, um, well, I would say the power of that is not less than the employment relationship would allow them. They just use different means to that. They use algorithmic management, uh, control via uh, the task allocation, rating of uh, workers, streaming work to, uh, to uh, those that comply with uh, platforms want to achieve. So the control means are different, but the outcome of the control is quite similar. Um, there is also a complicating role of clients who assume some of the functions of, um, of employers, such as disciplining, controlling, defining tasks. So that uh, introduces some haziness in, into the, in the employer seat. But what is important is that um, platforms renounce the role of, of, the, of the firm, of the company, but actually they assume much broader one. They not only um, should be considered as someone fit for the seat of the employer, but they take on the market making function of the whole exchange. They set the rules of the game. They set the, their own institutions that in the normal arrangement would be taken by um, institutions, public institutions and uh, labor law and protection. So for instance, they, they set up their own litigation mechanism. Uh, they set up own insurance provisions. So they, they, they define who can access the market, who can even access the, the exchange. So they act beyond the notion of a normal employer as um, confined to the limit of the, of the firm. Um, it's also very difficult to pin them down uh, because they operate as, as multi-sided markets. They hide when needed behind layers of subsidiaries, different corporate structures, many of them borderline with the informal economy, um, which makes obviously social dialogue challenging in itself. Uh, platforms are quite powerful players that influence through the back door, not at the negotiating table, table through lobbying research, PR campaigns, um, industry and employer associations should, in theory, uh, be reluctant to take them on board because there are direct competition to their incumbents. They bypass uh, law and gain a um, competitive advantage through that means. And uh, trade unions, um, well, they have no one to negotiate with if there's no one in the uh, employer seat, but also workforces who are dispersed are a challenge in, in, in themselves. Um, so the objective of the research is to examine the role of platforms assume are assigned um, in the regret regulatory process that was uh, surrounding the platform work directive. Um, what was the impact on other actors involved and for social dialogue and collective bargaining more broadly? Um, how the prerogatives of the European social partners are affected uh, by this redefinition of traditional categories and actors? And then... Uh, the aim or the, the end aim is to understand our improved understanding of obstacles 
and opportunities for social Europe um, from the perspective of, of social partners. Now, I think the photo is fake, uh, by the way, just a disclaimer. Yeah, I was going to ask you, really. <laughs> but I saw it, yeah, I saw it so often coming up when I was uh, uh, doing my, uh, some research. I thought I'll just. Sure. There is something to it, I, I think. Um, so um, anyway, the analysis, I will not go into detail, is based on uh, all the documents and public statements issued uh, at the occasion of consultations towards the, uh, around the directive uh, over two years by the formal social partners. So it you see on the side of workers, Business Europe, SGI Europe, SME United on the part of employers, and also two platform associations that were formed at EU level and operated um, at EU policy. Um, I mean, uh, actively lobbied the uh, the parliament, and is that no secret because the, there is a nice recording of all meetings with MEPs involved in the negotiations. And those two, um, DP, the Delivery Platforms Europe and Move EU, are frequent guests on on that list. That's why I also included them. Um, so results. Uh, there was actually a lot of interesting um, nuance coming from those documents, and I encourage you to, to read the paper um, just to kind of um, highlight um, some some main uh, the main picture. So trade unions were uh, so it, you see they were very consistent in their message. They refused to uh, embark on any renegotiation of roles. That their vision is quite simple. You have workers and you have employers. Platforms fulfill the role of the employer. That's pretty much it. And the regulation should target the employer seat because that's where the where we lack no we lack this counterpart to enforce existing rights that was the main and quite clear message on the employer side it wasn't that clear and actually there is much uh, conflicting um con conflicting narratives you could see there is a tension between the free organizations but also when business europe was speaking it wasn't it wasn't a consistent voice so it somehow diluted their, their message by being so inconsistent and, uh, and shifting within one um, consultation process. So on one hand, they denied platforms are exceptional and um, the platforms should be covered by the same rules to ensure fair competition with traditional companies. Of course, rules should be minimal, but that's a traditional demand of, of employers, uh, but they should be the same. So all companies should be covered. There is no need for new regulation. We already have regulation for non-standard work, which platform work should, like, seems to be. So that's one line of, of arguments. But the other, which was completely conflicting, is not even uh, defining platforms as companies or employers. So the rules should apply, but then to whom? It wasn't very clear. And then the, the narrative of Uber uh, or of platforms was very clearly um, intertwined with what um, uh, employer associations were saying. Uber, by the way, is not, any of the, none of the platforms is formally a member of employers associations, but Uber sits on some sort of advisory committee or board of Business Europe. So just to have the, perfect. Um, so um, another interesting thing that emerged is that SME United, who represents small and medium-sized enterprises, so effectively entrepreneurs, self-employed, in this case, they actually represented workers, right? Platform workers are self-employed in the current constellation. So SME United was advocating for giving them more um, social protection rights, some sort of access to um, social dialogue or collective bargaining. So the employer association, one of them at least, was on the side of the workers. There was a bit of a confusion with um, how they formulate the postulates. They definitely didn't align their, their narrative um, into what they want to achieve. Platforms, um, they distanced themselves from all of those players. They never formally joined the social dialogue. They negotiated, so to say, through the back door with uh, quite powerful lobbying, um, both at the EU level, and there's no secret, there was also lobbying at country level with um, targeting member states. What is interesting is that they tailored the uh, communication as, uh, as if they benefit all actors. They didn't side particularly with neither. However, they aligned the most with worker perspective. So their communication was targeted at the benefits of flexibility to workers. So we do what workers need. We represent the interests. So everyone was in representing workers' interests in this uh, tripartite uh, forum. Um, and yet, yeah. Um, then, um, and just the last uh, point is uh, that they would very welcome inclusion in any negotiations, platforms, the platform companies. Uh, they would like to be consulted by the commission in more formal way, not just by uh, backdoor lobbying. Um, they wanted to build 
consultations with worker representatives, so then implying they would actually sit on the other side of the table, but that could never involve unions. So um, again, there is um, resetting the scene, renegotiating the, the boundaries. Uh, so very briefly, in terms of conclusions, we saw that um, the last sentence, um, they did restructure the renegotiated the boundaries of who are the social partners, what roles they should uh, take. There are quite powerful actors, that's why they seem to be successful. It does have implications for the power or, or the capacity of social dialogue to shape regulation, because as you know, European social dialogue, um, if social partners decide to meet, the legislative process stops and the commission waits for what proposal comes from uh, social partners. So they kind of destroyed that route. Uh, employers were not even uh, willing to, to enter negotiations. Uh, on the other hand, because commission acted as a broker of regulation and put on the table the proposal, uh, partner uh, platforms felt somehow called out uh, to, to act and they formed their own <laughs> associations. So it is a step very small step, I, I agree, but nonetheless a step towards um, negotiating table by forming some sort of interest group that is more official and, and looks like a social partner, even if doesn't act like one yet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Agnieszka, for putting... Ignore the two hands that I see. Okay, yes. We'll have one two-hand intervention, please. Okay, just on the, the three sources of evidence, why, why didn't you include the EU Commission as what that you mentioned the EU Commission? Because I did a similar thing. It kept stop. Sorry, I, I won't start again. No, okay. So it, uh, in the UK in 2017, we had the Taylor Review of Employment Practices, and we did a um, University of Leeds, and we did a similar process thing looking at that process and most of the evidence we looked at the evidence from the different groups as you did but over the sort of period of the development of policy proposals there were key interventions from the government at various points which shifted kind of the framework of legitimacy and then the actors shifted in order to accommodate to that so i just wonder if there's a there's a there's a role of the eu not just as an audience but as an active participant in this process yeah, um, I decided to focus on social partners, really. There was a lot of attention of, of what commission does, says, uh, so I felt that's covered. And there was not, nothing that striking coming from them over the process. They acted as a broker of regulation in the end, that had an impact, but what the narrative or what they were doing in the process didn't, did not seem to alter this weird uh, constellation that platforms were constructing very meticulously in the process. Okay, thank you very much also for the question and the two of you will continue the discussion over lunch, I'm sure. So thank you, um, Nishka, for flagging the, how the narrative of uh, the image of exceptionalism, I think it perfectly illustrates the point that Ludovic was, Ludovic was also making before. And by the way, I saw Ludovic Boots nodding several times while you were speaking. So I think in this case, the message um, uh, was delivered. So, so thank you very much. Um, so we move to Kurt now. So we've just heard, Kurt, that um, it takes two to tango and that there is a big problem because one of the negotiating partners uh, doesn't want to dance. Uh, but you're going to talk about one of them, namely, are platform workers willing to un unionize, which is another aspect. You have 10 minutes again. Thank you, Bar. To be continued indeed, Kurt. I don't know if there is a two hands intervention. Um, if not, Kurt, thank you for uh, flagging that uh, platform workers are more willing to unionize than um, equivalent groups in the non-platform uh, economy. Uh, I'm not sure that the term um, unis unionism by accident is going to be picked up by ETUC. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Ludovic just correct. left, but I'm sure he didn't for this reason, but I like the term. Uh, but of course, more seriously, uh, the, the positive attitude of um, uh, these workers towards trade unions is, of course, uh, a hopeful message and a, a useful one uh, for, for policymakers. So I do see a two-hand intervention, a very brief one. Thank you. And then we move on to Pierre. Hi, Sig Silverman, currently at the University of Oxford, formerly at IG Metall. I've been in this room with many of you for a few years now. Thanks so much for all this great work. I just 
because this came to mind in this talk and in the last one, I wanted to flag it. Article 15 of the Platform Work Directive proposal, communication channels for persons performing platform work. This is two sentences, very, very exciting two sentences. Of course, we didn't get it. it this is just a note to all of us. Like when we go to Geneva, let's not forget Article 15 uh, saying digital labor platforms have to give communication channels for persons performing platform work, not only to talk to each other, but also must give access to the representatives, not only of platform workers with an employment contract, but of all persons performing platform work. Who are they? We don't know yet, but like mm. it's in there and nobody was arguing about it. So this is a very interesting two sentences. I just wanted to remind us all, let's not forget that one. That was an important one. Thanks. Okay, thank you for the reminder. Of course, you want to comment on that? No? It, no, no, it's okay. no. But thank you for the reminder. Excellent. Okay, so this is the moment I think to talk about occupational health and safety in this context. Will you agree with that? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Please, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. And if you could just switch off your microphone, please. I think it's still on. Ah, no. no? So, um, so today we'll talk about the metaverse. So we are moving from platform work to the metaverse. So quite a, a different topic and also um, a concept that lost maybe a bit of its uh, relevance. Um, so you probably heard about the metaverse like one year or two years ago, but it's quite an old uh, concept. It was first created uh, in the context of a, a science fiction novel called Snow Crash. And it was about um, uh, the, what would be the future of Internet, a place where you can connect with other, interact with other, uh, uh, with the help of uh, an avatar. And then 10 years later, the first practical example of a metaverse was created. It was called Second Life. It was a computer game uh, on Windows. And uh, it was like a sandbox environment where you can do whatever you like. You can buy uh, a piece of land. You can uh, uh, have a, a job because there is a labor market. There is an economy. There is a currency. So you can have your second life in this uh, game. But it was not quite popular. And uh, it's only 20 years later that uh, the term metaverse came to the forefront with uh, Facebook rebranding to Meta and launch launching its uh, metaverse called Horizon World. Horizon World, like you can see on the picture, picture uh, is a universe where you can uh, chat, you can dance, you can eat marshmallow with your friends. And uh, um, some, some of you who knows a bit about video games maybe wonder why is it so ugly? Why does it look like a video game from 15 years ago? Why would I want to eat virtual marshmallow? Actually, you are not the only one. And it was one of the main uh, reasons of the complete fiasco that was uh, Horizon World. Out of the 500,000 expected users, uh, um, the Horizon World only attracted 200,000 users, and they lost half of them within the second year. It was such a fiasco that it scared of the competition. All the big tech actors, I like, I like moving away from the term metaverse because it's marked with meta's failure. Does it mean that the metaverse is dead? Not necessarily, but there is a new spin to it. It's, it's no longer the buzzword that is used to describe those new environments because it's plagued with, it's marked with failure. Now the emphasis is on equipment, not the software part, but the hardware part with increasingly sophisticated headset. And also with it a decisively more work oriented purpose. What this technology can offer is a new user interface paradigm moving from standard to two-dimensional computing to 3D virtual workspaces. So it's no longer about virtual reality. It's no longer about a virtual universe around you. It's about augmented reality. It's about virtual elements on top of the real world. So you still see things around you, but there are virtual elements on top of those real things. It's no longer about the metaverse, it's about spatial computing, a term that uh, Apple came, uh, came up with. It is framed now as the future of remote work. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg said it is the next major computing platform. 
uh, Tim Cook from Apple say it's an ideal productivity tool. So, okay, it's about work. If it's about work, then it's about health and safety at work. So it's about anticipating the hazard. It's about assessing the hazard. It's about preventing, mitigating the hazard these devices can pose to health and safety at work. In this context, we conducted a review of the available evidence on extended reality, covering both virtual reality and augmented reality, and its impact on uh, health and safety indicators. We identified uh, five broad category of hazards, and today I will only speak about one of those uh, categories, uh, uh, which are psychosocial hazards. The first uh, issue that is commonly reported is about usability, because the technology is still uh, not really mature yet. Uh, poor ergonomics, both of the physical headset, which caused discomfort because of the weight uh, distribution, but also uh, poor usability of the software interface that is not really efficient and that co can cause feeling of frustration, anxiety, uh, and eye strain. And obviously those aspects make this kind of technology not compatible yet with sustained use in work settings. Actually, the, the, the headset of Apple that was just released like two or three weeks ago is massively returned by users for those very reasons, because of a comfort issue, because of usability issue, because of headaches, be because of motion sickness. What's interesting is uh, that when you look at uh, how you perceive work within those environments, uh, what appears is that there is a, a, an increased perceived workload. If you perform the same task on a computer and on, uh, uh, with a VR headset, time will seem longer because it's tedious, because it's sometimes infuriating. So uh, uh, the, the, the workload you perceive will be higher, generating further uh, 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 work pressures or PSR, psychosocial risks. Some studies attempted to uh, uh, assess this gap. So, so in this study, um, um, 16 participants were asked to perform a set of tasks on a standard computer and the same set of tasks on uh, uh, a virtual reality headset. And this for five days, eight hours a day. So really uh, torture. And uh, you can you can have a, a look at, uh, at, at, the, at the figures. Huh? Uh, um, the red lines are uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, virtual reality condition and the uh, computer condition is a green one. You can see increased perceived uh, task load, decreased system usability, decreased well-being uh, ratings, and uh, uh, decreased productivity, uh, perceived productivity, um, increased feeling of frustration, and a whopping 119% uh, uh, increase in anxiety ratings between the two conditions. So we are still very far from the usability uh, that is required for work settings, and we are actually uh, exposing uh, workers to massive psychosocial uh, risks. Uh, another aspect is digital surveillance, of course. Uh, we talk about platform work, we know how that works, we know how those kind of technology can be used to track uh, workers, uh, to monitor workers' performance. Well, uh, virtual reality headset could be the most pervasive, pervasive form of digital surveillance because you can collect a wide range of information. Gas, uh, gaze, eye gaze, uh, um, fixation, um, body movement. Even one company managed to, to assess emotional states based on eye parameters that can be assessed with the headset. Uh, so it allows for more fine grained measure of uh, user behavior. And it's, of course, very appealing for advertisers because it can be used to assess consumer habits, consumer interest. It could also become very appealing for employers because it offers new way of monitoring uh, work performance. And all those data are already available for testing to VR developers. If, if you want to develop a VR application, you have access to a, a, a tech uh, a tool, a toolkit uh, that allow, allow you to test your environment and you can access those variables. So what about work-related apps? Uh, what about apps that could be created to uh, 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 track uh, uh, work performance for uh, employers. This is totally plausible. 
We know those practices are, are strain inducing, uh, 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 notably uh, from the extensive body of research in the platform economy on, uh, on uh, digital surveillance. We know it leads to work intensification and long working hours, so psychosocial risks. Last aspect I want to talk about today is cyberbullying. So the idea of having increasingly realistic environments uh, with new way of interacting with each other and better immersion could worsen cyberbullying because what we call confrontational behavior, so it's a broad category of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, behavior, cyberbullying and, and so on, would induce more anxiety because of the increased realism. And this is even more concerning now that we uh, see new uh, uh, trends in technology with sensing and haptic technology, where you can, with haptic gloves and haptic feedback, you can sense virtual object and have a physical sensation of, of, this, of this sensing. And this could, of course, uh, uh, introduce a physical e element to uh, harassment, to uh, bullying, to uh, 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 to those uh, uh, abusive behavior. And so it could uh, worsen a cyber workplace cyberbullying because of uh, those new way of interacting with each other. So in conclusion, uh, those environments pose new challenges for health and safety because of the growing integration of physical and digital space. There are two plans. Uh, each bringing their set of risks. You wear a helmet, you can trip on, on the cable and you can hurt yourself. This is physical space. Within the environment, you can be exposed to cyberbullying. You can be uh, intensively uh, monitored, tracked, so PSR. So we have two plans where two category of, uh, two, two, two set of risks, risks happen and the prevention and the assessment can also has to happen on those two plans. So it's raising new challenge for health and safety. Further research is needed to move from anecdotal uh, reports to more systematic studies because it's still early work, not much to work with, and also studies on sustained use in work context. Some variables that would be of interest in terms of psychosocial risk are, of course, so social isolation, but also work-life balance. What about the, the frontier between work and life when those two universes are in the same room? You put your helmet, your colleague are there. Monitoring this, those development will be uh, really key uh, because technology is moving fast uh, 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 and the issue of psychosocial risk will be at the forefront of this development, we believe. You can have a look at the full paper on our website if you wish to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre, for this very... Uh concise and uh, impressive introduction. And yes, you can make some publicity for the paper. Uh, thanks for taking us uh, by the hand, uh, leading us from a failed computer game to this new user uh, interface paradigm and the very serious occupational um, health and safety issues that are um, involved and that are indeed at the very heart of what we are doing at the uh, ETY. I think it also nicely reflects and shows how we constantly have to adapt our research agenda, including on OSH, uh, to uh, reality as it develops. Are there, is there a two-hand intervention? If there is not, okay, reassured. We're all getting a little bit hungry, I suppose. But we're not going to go for lunch before we have listened to Ida, uh, because the question all of this discussion begs, of course, is... What is the EU doing and what is the EU approach towards regulating artificial intelligence at work? Ida, you have 10 minutes. First of all, a, a word of gratitude to my colleague, Silvia Rainoni, who has invited me to participate in this conference. I will speak about the AI Act uh, governing through exceptions and ambiguity. And I will provide my analysis of that through in three steps. The first, I will explain about the complex in, and intricate architecture of the AI Act. I will select only some provisions and exceptions that I will delve into, and then I will provide a further analysis about that. The provisions are selected just because of the times constraint, but of course the AI Act is much more broader than that. Why is the AI Act such an interesting piece of, of regulation? Because 
it has a very complex structure and architecture. Of course, it is for, for foremost of uh, targeting the correct and efficient functioning of the EU internal market or the data market as Thierry Breton normally uh, refers to. And it, you know, it is an horizontal framework providing uh, the place to host products and services developed through AI systems into uh, the EU market. But also it does have another secondary objective, which is the promotion uh, of um, the, um, the innovation, promotion, promoting an AI market as such, as an industry in the EU, uh, will, while of course protecting fundamental rights and perhaps social rights too, including health, safety of people and broad uh, fundamental rights enshrined in the EU Charter. Uh, it does have an intricate, uh, it's not only about the eight or nine legal obligations that we have in the, in the AI Act uh, very clearly this, uh, explained since the beginning of the process, but also we have a harmonized standards, codes of conduct, codes of practice, technical specifications, delegated acts, ethical guidelines, and uh, all sorts of different instruments that the AI Act uniquely in, in, um, group them together in, and it will be up to the implementation to, to rely on which uh, provision we should apply what, whether a, a, a legal obligation, a code of practice, a code of conduct, a standard, harm, and, and so on and so forth. Noting that the European Commission has powers to uh, issue delegated acts or implemented acts in order to specifically go govern one pinpoint aspect of the regulation. It is a B2B regulation. The AI Act is a regulation for business by businesses. And this is clearly shown in the value chain that I have tried to explain here. It is breakdown in developers or deployers, in developers, in deployers, in distributors, in providers, uh, operators, importers, but also authorized representatives. And all of the provisions, code of conducts and um, code of practices and harmonized standards are developed by and with them. Not, notwithstanding, the EU Act also has a very specific governance structure, heading with the European Commission, but also um, um, assisted by a new uh, governance structure, which is the EU AI Office and a scientific panels of independent experts, coupled with another new uh, um, pillar, which is European board, who has to be supported by subgroups on market surveillance and certified bureaus and advisory forums. All of them need to be held by the competent authorities and national levels and experts, 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 experts sitting in all of these groups. Now I will move on to those key provisions that I have consciously selected for the purpose of this talk. And the first one is related to those prohibited practices, the point of the pyramid uh, of the risk-based approach that the commission has crafted in the AI Act. The prohibited practices are various and has, have been a subject of intense contention, especially those related to biometric identification of people. Law enforcement is, prohibited, biometric identification of people through law enforcement is indeed prohibited, but with clearly ex exceptions that are very well defined. A second one will be related to emotions, emotion recognition. Here, the AI Act clearly says that there is indeed an imbalance of power between those who are uh, providing the emotion recognition systems and those who are being or intended to be recognized by their emotions. Uh, here, they say that the emotion recognition should be exempted in, should be prohibited in the context of work, employment, or in the, con and in the context of education. Emotions are, uh, um, emotions or the, the ability to infer also intentions, the willingness of natural persons on the basis of very specific biometric data. So here we have an exemption too. This is normally prohibited at, bo at work or in education, but with a very big exemption. We have 
uh, the Commission has allowed to, uh, to be deployed emotion recognition systems at work for medical reasons, for safety reasons, and for therapeutical uses. For example, to uh, state to identify the state of fatigue or tiredness or boredom in professional pilots and in truck drivers. And that doesn't, of course, mean the, just the readily apparent expressions, gestures of movements of the face or other uh, expressions that the human face can portray, um, and so on and so forth. Um, then we have, as a second provision or a third provision that I would like to highlight, the legal requirements that we all know since the beginning of the AI Act. Uh, but uh, there is a specific exception to those who have to comply with them, which is the European Commission can modify the use cases that Annex 3 de delineates as high risk uses. So those high risk uses that have to be complied with the legal requirements with the legal obligations uh, when or the risk is equal or higher than the risk of the harm or adverse impact posed by the high risk system already uh, referred to in Annex 3. So if the, high, if the risk of the high AI system that we know that is high increases, uh, or is, and then the commission has the ability to uh, adjust the list of Annex 3 and add more. That's interesting, but it also works on the other way around. The commission has the power to remove high risk AI systems from such list if they no longer pose any risk, and if they don't uh, decrease the overall protection of health, safety, and fundamental rights. Here, there is no uh, provision to see in which conditions a decrease is, a, a risk is, uh, should be deemed as lower or, or high in any way. It will be up to the providers to decide that on their own assessment of, of, of how their AI systems work. Uh, we have in the Annex 3 this uh, interesting exception that, or uh, delineation that employment, workers' management, and access to employment is, of course, a high risk, something that is interestingly very good. But of course, it, will be, it can be reduced or removed or modified whether the commission or the providers say, well, it's not a high risk anymore. What happens if the, if the provider decides that the, the, that the risk that it puts into the market is not a high risk? Mm -hmm. The provider has this ability to just document its own assessment informally to say, I certify or I declare that my, that my system that I put into the market in perhaps in a form of surveillance system doesn't, know, doesn't pose a high risk. It doesn't have to provide it to any other authority, except if the AI office will request it or the national authority will request such documentation. Fundamental rights impact assessment, it has been a provision that the European Parliament really tried to push forward into the AI Act and it managed to get it through. However, the whole assessment and the, the the engineering behind the how fundamental rights impact assessment should be done, I for whom, have been watered down by some European member states. And now certain fundamental rights impact assessment or FRIAS have to be uh, uh, developed ex ante only by deployers that are bodies governed by public law and deployers who are private operators with uh, the impact assessment uh, quite uh, watered down from what the parliament has provided. The last provision that I would like to talk through, it's the provision that I, I like the most because it's about general purpose AI system. It is the provision that has shifted the whole rationale of the AI Act because the AI Act has functioned on four levels, uh, le four levels of risk and the, the appearance of general purpose AI models or LLMs or large language models has, has brought or input another fifth level of risk, which is the so-called systemic risk. Here, the AI Act distinguishes between GPAI models, so general purpose AI models with systemic risk and general purpose AI models with no systemic risk. On top of that, with general purpose AI systems. Such systems have to comply with the eight legal obligations 
and it will be up to the provider to decide how to comply with that. What are those GPIAs or general purpose AI systems that pose systemic risk? That was the question that was mostly debated in the last couple of months in which the AI Act has been uh, discussed. And it is not easy because LLMs, large language models, are incomplete pieces of technology. And yet we have managed to put them in a very huge piece of regulation, the AI Act. It is unique. But AI models, why are they so impactful? Because how can we measure the level of risk? What is the systemic impact that they pose? Well, this has been decided that they have to comply with two criteria, the capability, the computing power, and, um, and based on a decision of the European Commission, just ex officio. So what is that high impact? Why are GPAIs, generative AI, can propose systemic risk? But it has to have a community amount of compute used for its training that this will be greater than 10 to the power of 25. That, according to uh, scientific literature, is not that a lot because many supercomputers in member states are higher than 10 to the power of 25. The obligations for providers of GPAI models or for Latin language models are very interesting because it's just technical documentation, information and documentation to providers of AI systems, of course, to those people who have to uh, adopt the model and apply it in their own corporate structure, a policy to protect copyright law, copyright material, and a summary about the content used for the training of the LLM. Those LLMs or those GPI models that are not covered by the AI Act are those used for research and those models that are open, or open, open and they are not put into the market. The obligations for providers of the AI, AI, AI GPI models with systemic risk are on top of the previous ones that I have mentioned, they have to provide an evaluation, uh, mathematical evaluation perhaps of the model assess and mitigate the systemic risks that they pose or might pose, report serious AI incidents, and ensure a proper cybersecurity. I, I close to with my analysis. First of all, the AI Act is a regulation with a complex architecture and a multiplicity of governance actors with numerous exceptions. This translates into a flexible regulatory system that is both ambiguous and is open to various interpretations. This result of various factors is, is input because of the refocus of the AI Act to incorporate large language models, because of the intense lobbying of AI companies not to regulate LLMs, and of course in some specific countries, clearly Germany, France and Italy, saying no, we have our own LLM industry in, in Europe and we don't want to be overprotective. From the beginning, however, my analysis is that lawmakers wanted that the AI Act to be a flexible legal framework which would not restrict the EU in its efforts to build a strong competitive AI sector. But within the AI Act, I have found five trigger points that I think they are very important for this audience and for trade unions to trigger. And the first one is there is an obligation to provide ex ante information to workers and their representatives when an AI system is going to be put into a company. There is, there are, the AI Act recognizes that there are favorable laws and collective agreements that can go beyond what the AI Act prescribes in, with, the, with the obligations. The AI Act also invites all stakeholders in the creation of codes of conduct that companies have to provide. Providers and employers shouldn't ensure sufficient AI literacy of their staff, of employees, of workers. And of course, there is this involvement and effective participation in standardization processes. And with that, uh, thank you very much for the attention. And thank you very much, um, Aida. So much uh, in there. A uh, flexible regulatory system, which even from a governance perspective, I find uh, very, very impressive. Um, I got worried on many points, I must say, not only on fundamental rights, the fact that providers can document their own uh, risks 
And the large power is attributed to the European Commission. I'm happy that you closed with some trigger points uh, that uh, leave us with some optimism perhaps at the end. I don't know if they're on this intervention. Uh, two hands interventions, uh, questions. I think we have a few minutes left. We're all getting a little bit hungry, but just maybe to wrap up, let's see whether on this talk or any of the other talks, now that you've been able to reflect a bit, uh, digest, whether you have any questions at uh, this stage before we break for lunch. Yes, please, sir, if you can also say who you are. Thank you, my name is Victor Berhardt, I work for the Trade Union Union in Sweden. Uh, ask a question for Ida on this uh, last uh, slide on trigger points. What do you think about engaging or the possibilities of engaging in the complex process of experts that you referred to a couple of slides before because they will be so key. So uh, what entry points or trigger points do you see there, if any? Other questions? We can gather a few. We have a few more minutes. Yes, please. I think it's Valeria. Yes, thank you very much. It's really interesting. I just wanted to ask, based on your last positive thoughts, um, I was thinking, how can we reach out to that point, or how trade unions can you know, enforce what is in there, if we operate in a context, as you said before, where competition of II and all these kind of uh, big corporates are still there, you know, imposing the rules of the game. So it's not that... The, the moment where we think to, you know, try to capture both elements to make a bit more stronger uh, the, the possibilities also for unions to kind of uh, break or workers. Just one, yeah, just, uh, just doubt, no doubt, but a question which came into my mind. Thanks. How can trade unions enforce the trigger points? Please, Aida, so the two questions. Uh, the trigger points are very open. As I say, this is an ambiguous and open to interpretation regulatory framework. So it will be up to the actors to jump in right now. Uh, implementing the AI Act will be <laughs> our tasks from now on. Uh, we, have we have a new AI office, a new scientific panel of independent experts, a new or European AI board and a new advisory forum, which is needs to provide support to the AI board. Uh, originally speaking, originally the AI Act only foresaw the European AI board. In two months, they created four different new structures that have to be implemented at the EU level. So far, the scientific panel and the AI office are fully covered by EU officials. There is no openness to uh, social stakeholders, societal partners, but still, there are windows of opportunities because there is nothing written on stone. The only formal or body in which it has recognized in the AI Act that has to be open to industry, startups, SMEs, civil society, and academia, it doesn't mention social partners though, it is the advisory forum. So it's the quiet bottom body down there in the chain of all these experts. All these bodies, those have the capacity to engage ad hoc expertise and that expertise is an open uh, open open an open floor uh, to provide any type of expertise and whether trade union is considered an expertise is also a possibility too okay any other questions we're good we're hungry Okay, then the only thing that remains to be done is to thank my colleagues at the Institute for what I think is really an amazing job of presenting all that research that is so rich in a very concise uh, intervention. So well done, all of you. Uh, we break for lunch now. And yes, that is a really good place. Maria, yeah. <laughs> that gives you time for your know, initiation. Ah, that works. Can you all hear me well now? Yes.
Perfect. Good afternoon. Thank you for choosing this panel and trust me, you won't be disappointed. Uh, we have excellent speakers for this panel on testing regulatory leverage to improve working conditions in the platform economy. I'm going to give a brief presentation of the four speakers and what they are going to offer to us. And trust me, that is going to save you from the well-known food coma that we're going to avoid together. So first of all, uh, it will be actually a collective paper uh, that has been written by Carol Muzinki, who is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Sociology, University of Warsaw, and a research associate at the Center for Sociological Research, KU Leuven, also written uh, in a collaboration with Valeria Puligano, who is professor at the Center for Sociological Research at KU Leuven, and the one who is going to present this uh, work uh, for us today is David Mengen, who is a barrister and solicitor based in Manhuth University with visiting position at Usgood Hall Professional Development and UC Lyon. What is really interesting with this paper, it will be on the uh, platform work directive proposal. I think we are mostly, I don't know, labor lawyers, at least for my part, I am. So I'm usually using at this looking at this initiative with other labor law legislation and pieces. What he's going to offer uh, and present is what are the overlap with another existing regulation, the platform to business one. So I think it would be really interesting to hear more about it. The second presentation, it will be done by uh, Giuliano Landono, Giuliana Landono, sorry. <laughs> Uh, who is a lawyer and holds an LLM and he's a PhD researcher at Tilburg University, uh, Department of Private Business and Labor Law, who is investigating the issue of collective voice and representation of platform workers and how this can be threatened and promote, promoted in order to provide the digital workforce with decent working condition. And I have to say that I'm very excited by her paper. She's going to offer us a comprehensive global mapping of not only jurisprudence, but also what exists in terms of social dialogue and legislative initiatives in platform work economy. And here she's going to bring us beyond the question of like misqualification, also working condition, health and safety. So yeah. Exciting. Uh, the third presentation is by Gabrielle Van Rosmalen, who is a PhD student in the field of European competition law and, po and political philosophy at Utrecht University. Uh, he is always bringing the question of what legislative and regulatory measures are needed to improve the position of platform workers. And what is fascinating is the research and methods that he use, uh, which like combined doctrinal legal research, political physical theory, uh, in order to provide a comprehensive normative examination of the issue at hand. And this is exactly what he's going to do today. And last but not least, uh, Ana Teresa Riberio, who is an assistant professor at the Universidad Católica Portuguesa. Uh, and she's also the coordinator for the undergrad study there and her main research focus on uh, trade unionism and collective bargaining. And here she's going to basically bring a bit of practical also very concrete national example on the European theory that we have around platform work and also the presumption, I guess, uh, of employment, uh, because there have been reform in Portugal. And so she will tell us what work, what doesn't, and also we can go from there. So all of you, you will have 15 minutes. I'm going to be really harsh on this. Also, not so we have time for question, but also as a solidarity for the other speaker. So uh, there will be a five minutes warning, one minute, and at the stop, really, for the other, please stop, and then you can address comment during the Q&A. So first thing first, David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, this is part of research that's being undertaken through an ERC that's led by Valeria Polignano. That's why all the uh, uh, labeling is for the ERC. As Odd said, uh, I'm looking at not just the platform to work, uh, sorry, platform to business directive, but also comparing it with the platform work directive, which we heard this morning uh, is still suffering an agonizing attempt to live uh, earlier this morning. I'll refer to the platform work directive as PWD and the uh, uh, business uh, platform to business regulation as P2B. So we have some similarities. And I think I should say, because I'll, I'll be fairly critical, uh, I think what the EU is doing is quite laudable in terms of trying to regulate this area. If you look at the US, as an example, there's really nothing being done. So even though there's lots to say that's critical, 
I think it's important to underscore the positive uh, that these things are actually being attempted in a thoughtful way. So some of the similarities that we see between the these two pieces are uh, the main this focus on main parameters. The main parameters for ranking, if you look at the platform to business directive, or the main parameters that uh, take into account automated decision making, if you look at the platform work directive. I apologize for those of you in the room, uh, the titles were a bit cut off, uh, but what it says here is why the platform work directive and platform to business directive are important for work. We heard earlier today about the current state of the platform work uh, directive. Uh, the reclassification criteria remain uncertain. Uh, it seems that last uh, statement that this would be left to member states in their domestic law, uh, which would create further uncertainty. If you look at the platform work directive, it admits that there will be a simultaneous presence of employees and self-employed, which is the whole issue for why the platform work directive or one of the drivers for the reclassification part. So it raises the issue of uh, bogus self-employment. But if you look at article four, subsection three, uh, there's particular concern within the platform work directive that it should avoid capturing genuine self-employed. And this is where we have, what I would call, we have a, a, a divide within a divide. We have the binary divide of labor law, but I suggest that we also have this other divide within broadly commercial law. And I'll unpack that in a bit. Based on EU estimates, we have 5.1, sorry, 5.51 individuals who be subject to reclassification. That still leaves about 28 million. Sorry, uh, that's out of 28 million with a projected further 43 million by 2025 working on labor platforms. So the platform work directive would only really engage with a certain part of platform work. Again, looking at the overlap between these two, if you focus on Article 10 of the Platform Work Directive, it says that, uh, well, in subsection one, certain articles, the algorithmic management articles will uh, apply to people regardless of their employment status. But then we have subsection two. And I think subsection two raises some significant questions because it basically says the platform to business directive will supersede if there is a conflict. What does that mean? And I think it's still unclear what that would mean, partly because the platform work directive is not passed and not finalized. So if we just use the text that we have, it seems as though if the self-employed are classified as business users, then it's questionable the extent to which the platform work directive would apply to them. So what does that mean? It could be that the platform work directive and the platform to business directive are mutually exclusive, which would then bring into question Article 10, subsection one. To what extent is Article 10, subsection one effective? How this idea that you don't have to be in an employment relationship. Now there are some transparency uh, rights within the platform to business directive, but they're a lot more tame as we'll see than the platform work directive. So if we take the example, and again, I apologize for the title. What I'm looking at here is termination. If we look at termination from the platform between these two pieces, what do we see? Well, with the platform work directive, you have transparency of automated decisions uh, human monitoring, and then human review of significant decisions, ter uh, termination being obviously a significant decision. But if you look at the platform to business directive, what do you have? I suggest you only have a right to be told you're being terminated. You don't have rights. You don't have a remedy. I think the, the enforcement that's set out in Article 15 is quite bare, uh, particularly if you look at who's delegated to enforce it, it's the member states. 
so if we look at the two two pieces together, the platform work directive addresses some problems with working conditions. I don't think we can look at it as solving all of them. I would look at the platform work directive being part of a platoon of efforts to regulate this area. But if we look at the platform to business directive, there are really only information rights, which the enforcement of is questionable. So if we look at this, what does the platform to business directive do? It seems to be in part this difference between the fairness by means of transparency versus fairness and transparency, where the difference here is fairness and transparency are separate individualized rights or, or concepts. But the way that the directive is currently structured, this is really fairness by means of transparency, where if we're transparent, then we're fair. If we tell you what we're doing to you, then that must be fair. And those are two different ideas. So a measure of the difference is to some extent we have substantive rights in the platform work directive compared to the platform to business directive, which has really only information rights and a questionable framework for enforcement. I mentioned before the binary divide, everybody in this room is probably a bit tired of hearing about the labor law divide. But I'd suggest that there's another divide that is uh, important for this discussion, and that is in commercial law. Commercial law has a divide as well. Its binary divide is between businesses and consumers. But if we look at the self-employed, we have a cohort that slips between both of these binary divides because we have individuals, as the presentation said this morning, who are in a much more vulnerable position. So if, a, if an individual working on a platform does not fall under the platform work directive, they're treated as a business user for the platform to business directive. What does that mean? Well, it means that a self-employed person can only really rely upon contract arguments. And even though it's not a jurisdiction that everybody here would be familiar with, I'll point you to the Canadian decision of Heller and Uber. If you don't know this case, uh, Mr. Heller was an Uber driver and he drove in Toronto, Canada. But the dispute resolution clause that he had in his contract with Uber said, any dispute has to go to Amsterdam under Dutch law and under international commercial court rules. And it was struck down for being uh, in common law. There's a concept called unconscionability, which means it's just too far removed from fairness. But I use Heller as an example of what we're talking about with contract arguments. These are hard to make with questionable uh, or uncertain results. There are further issues if we look at these two directives. Charging of fees uh, that, uh, for operating on the platforms. The platform work directive does not specifically deal with this. Perhaps national level regulations do but I'm not sure if we have a uniform approach across EU member states on that. Certainly the platform to business directive uh, charges for uh, operating costs. And so there's an incentive from the platform perspective to have people classified as self-employed because it can financialize the, uh, the platform in a further way. Ranking. Ranking is a big part of the platform to business directive. There, is also a, there are also guidelines that the EU provided on ranking. Again, the platform work directive is rather ambiguous about this. Perhaps there are national level regulations. I think this is an ongoing issue for the platform work directive. But if we look at platform to business, this is specifically allowed. So you can pay to get access to work, basically. If you're a self-employed person, you're, being, you're paying the platform to rank you higher or to make you more visible. But as I said with enforcement, how do business users challenge the extent of transparency? If they're told this is what we do, how do they challenge whether or not that is seen as fair? Again, we have that fairness 
embedded in transparency idea versus fairness and transparency as separate concepts. Furthermore, with the Platform Work Directive and the Platform to Business Directive, how do employees and self-employed coexist? If one is paying for ranking and you can't make the other, the employees pay, does that mean the self-employed gain a competitive advantage because they're paying for greater visibility? Human review of decisions, we've seen this with the Platform Work Directive, but the Platform to Business Directive does not have this. It only has information provision. So again, we can ask, how do self-employed and employees work on these systems? Are there different rules depending on which group you fall into? So really, with when we look at these two, we have a split in terms of regulation. The bifurcation of the platform economy into pure online intermediation services without engagement in employment relationships, and then uh, those based solely on an employment relationship. Then we have a split within platforms, a bifurcation of the worker's status within the same labor platform, reclassified workers and self-employed. Finally, I'd suggest that there are further questions to ask just more broadly. There seems to be a general theme, I would suggest if we look at the European Court of Human Rights cases, that informing people ahead of time satisfies their rights. If you're told ahead of time you're going to be monitored, then you can't complain later. And I think we need to question this. To what extent is information provision the extent of a right? So if we take the platform to business directive and we look at a self-employed person knowing the main parameters for ranking, how are they better off? If they know, they know, but what can they do? Maybe they can pay for ranking, but beyond that, my question is what is the entitlement? What is a substantive right? Especially when you consider that uh, the platform to business directive lacks clear enforcement mechanisms. And it doesn't address the reputational aspects, which I think raises some, uh, some competition law arguments. Why can't you be portable with your reputation amongst different platforms? And more generally, I'd say that the platform to business directive raises questions about the effectiveness of remedies, which are said to be a pillar of the digital law framework as set out in 2018. So altogether, I'd suggest we have a number of questions that are being raised within these two, and we don't even need to have the platform work directive passed in order to pose them. So I've provided here some further work that's been done uh, under the auspices of the Respect Me project, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much for these interesting insights and also for keeping on time. Uh, we're going to dive into, I guess, more questions afterwards, but now I give the floor to Juliana. Please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Odd, for in that introduction. And I also want to take the opportunity to thank Etui for allowing me to share my current research here today uh, as an early scholar. And the, oh, the slides are not there coming, yet. Coming. Okay. <laughs> But uh, this is part of my ongoing PhD research that is um, looking at the issue of uh, effective representation and voice of platform workers. And it's uh, attempting to go beyond the European context and try to have a clear idea of how this is moving at a global scale, taking advantage of the fact that digital labor platforms have been uh, expanding or have a global presence. And uh, the strand that I will be sharing today of my research is, at least for the time being, titled Do Titans Tumble? A Global Mapping of Case Law, Social Dialogue, and Legislative Reform in the Platform Economy. Although the title promises to look into the three of them, due to time constraints, I will mostly share uh, case law and a bit of social dialogue uh, because it's a bit too uh, extensive to, to dive into everything today. Um, the purpose of the research is, as I said, to conduct a global mapping of how platform workers are enforcing their labor rights by dif different institutional uh, mechanisms, so a case law or litigation and uh, social dialogue initiatives and legislative reform to try to 
get a current state of play of how these, uh, this is working at a global scale and attempt to answer the question, how are different actors responding to the disruptive <coughs> practices of digital labor platforms through institutional, institutional mechanisms and to what extent are they being su successful or do Titans stumble? Uh, so um, I want to briefly uh, touching upon the methodology, not too much because of time constraints, but I'm uh, more than happy to discuss more on this in the Q&A. Uh, basically the research uh, is uh, uh, first of all conducted a gathering of information on the three uh, initiatives uh, standing on the shoulders of previous research. So for instance, in Europe, the contributions of Professor Christina Hiso was uh, very useful. Uh, the uh, role of the digital labor platforms uh, by the ILO was also um, an important source. Uh, and in some uh, countries where the uh, cases were less than academic literature in that specific uh, country was, was also used uh, to then include the, the information in a research log and classify it with specific uh, data that was uh, interesting for the, for the next step that was quantitative and qualitative analysis of the data. Right now, it's, this is a stage at where the research is. So there is still much um, analysis going on, but I'm sharing a preliminary uh, outlook on, on what it's looking at, like. And I also want to uh, signal that there are important limitations that uh, I'm aware of. One of them being that it's an extensive but not all encompassing uh, mapping uh, because it is limited to the sources used uh, to gather the information and because the platform economy is a moving target which is constantly getting new decisions, new initiatives, which makes it hard to, to promise it is a up-to-date uh, database, but it is as extensive as, as it could be. And uh, a big player was left out. This is the case of China because uh, of the high amount of decisions found mm -hmm. between 2017 and 2020 only, there were already over 2000 decisions of first instance, which made it with the resources impossible to include, also because of some language barriers. So uh, that is important limitations that must be taken into account when arriving to any sort of conclusion. So a bit on what uh, so far has been uh, what I have found. And here is a bit of the amount of cases found uh, in case law. Here we see that uh, there was 1,004 cases uh, around 38 countries. However, this graph needs to be interpreted with two important caveats. The first of them being that in the global south, 87.5% uh, of the cases were found in just one jurisdiction that was Brazil. And they had a great amount of case law. And so this shows to a certain extent that although it appears they are more or less in an equitable di distribution, uh, if we take Brazil out of the picture, the amount of cases in the global south is uh, rather uh, rather small. Um, and the second uh, caveat that must be considered is the type of actors that was found because in the Global South, uh, the majority of the decisions identified uh, were brought up by an individual claimant and ended with a decision that affected an individual claimant. In the Global North, although the individual claimants were also the most, the most common act actor found, there were also a great amount of collective actors uh, as traditional trade unions, also uh, self-organized groups or large groups that uh, put a uh, collective lawsuit or class actions. So this of course had a bigger impact on the amount of workers that could benefit from it. Uh, and there were also an uh, important role of social security institutions or state institutions that also included a large amount of workers. So all of this to say that although in the global north, the amount of cases is not as large in the amount. It does not mean that uh, it has a, a lower impact or rather means the opposite. Um, so that was, uh, to put this into perspective, an example could be the Netherlands. Uh, the cases brought by the FMB were not uh, from an individual uh, claimant, but rather was against the business model of specific platforms that impacted the entire uh, workforce. So therefore these, this, uh, aspects must be taken into consideration when looking at these numbers. And here we can see a bit where were the cases, uh, the countries where more cases were found. Brazil was uh, by far uh, 
taking into account that China is not included. Um, but after Brazil and excluding Argentina, most of the cases were clearly found in the global north. Um, this could, to some extent, uh, be or allow to arrive to a preliminary conclusion that in the gl global north, the use of litigation has been more common as a strategy of labor unrest than in the global south. Um, and then we go into a bit social dialogue. Uh, already, the first thing I want to do is connect it with the previous slide because we also see that the amount of social dialogue initiatives found so far, 88% of them are in the global north. And I would even say even mostly focused in Europe with the exception of one uh, ex example in USA and, and Australia and two in uh, Chile and Argentina. Uh, but in general, the social dialogue initiatives are really very much uh, focused in the European um, region. Um, so this uh, speaks once again that the use of social dialogue is also uh, mostly uh, segmented in the global north and in Europe even, um, and not so common in the global south, which probably uh, shows the um, level of uh, collective representation and voice, at least through institutional mechanisms, is uh, much less uh, or, or weaker in the global south than, than in the global north. Uh, but an, an additional um, aspect that I would like to highlight in this, in this graph is that uh, in total, there were 93 initiatives identified, uh, which is already not too many if we look at the size of the platform economy. But from them, over 25% of them were either voluntary or stayed in the stage of negotiations. Um, so this, uh, this also speaks uh, a bit of the, the actual amount of social dialogue that is going on in the platform economy because they, they are not really a collective agreement per se in many of the cases. So, uh, and even more, if we look at the 75% approximate that has a binding initiatives, there are many of them that you must look with, with uh, precaution because there are several uh, examples where the collective agreement was then found to be not really legitimate or raised questions about the actual uh, quality of the of the dialogue or the presence of yellow or company unions, the presence of uh, platforms in, in the negotiations. So this even in the percentage that is binding has to be looked at with, with uh, care because there are many initiatives there that are not really uh, the, the textbook de definition of proper social <laughs> dialogue. So then uh, this raises the question if, if this is really or, or a bit of proves what has been said in the literature of the lack of, of collective representation and voice and, and, and actual uh, social dialogue that is going on in the platform economy is it's very questionable. Um, and then to look a bit about uh, the aspect of what were the most common claims that uh, could be seen in the different um, jurisdictions. Uh, well, not surprising, the most common claim by far was employment status, both in the global north and the global south, which is a bit of confirming what the literature uh, has already stated that regulatory arbitrage is a common uh, practice uh, by uh, platforms throughout the globe. Interesting to see that the second biggest, <coughs> sorry, claim was social security which is also not surprising because this is tightly uh, binded with employment status and it's a consequence of the misclassification. But um, what is interesting to see is how in the global north, this was 93.2% of the, of the cases. And it was not very common to, uh, to find this claim in the global south. Um, mostly this claim was brought up by state institutions or social security institutions trying to recover the uh, social security contributions that were not done due to the misclassification. So this, to some extent, can uh, can uh, speak about the role that the state and state institutions are playing in the plight of platform workers. And many explanations could be thought of, possibly the fact that the state institutions do not have the resources in the global south. Maybe they don't have the awareness, because another thing that was very common in the social security is that they were many times reacting to complaints presented by collective actors um, or trade unions. There was uh, important collaboration in some cases, so maybe this was less common in the global south. Uh, these are just hypotheses, but uh, it was 
indeed a fact that the social security was much more prevalent in the global north. And finally, other uh, claims, we also observed that uh, in general, um, they were predominant in the global north with the exception of uh, constitutionality and other sorts of claims, but uh, claims like applicability of the collective agreement or GDPR were mostly uh, prevalent in the global north. And this can, to some extent, when you see the type of actors that bring this claim, once again, reinforce the, uh, the role of collective voice because these were claims that were mostly brought up by uh, collective actors. Uh, GDPR was very commonly uh, uh, brought up by unions in the UK, for instance, um, or applicability of collective agreement was also one of the big claims that FNB in the Netherlands was using. So definitely speaks a bit about the role of collective actors, which is better seen maybe in this graph where we see where are collect collective actors most present Although the main actress, as, as I mentioned before, was both in the global north and the global south, individual claimants, we see that uh, collective actors still had a very relevant role in the global north, although not as, as big as uh, individual claimants, and it was almost uh, inexistent in the global south. So this definitely uh, leads to, to analyzing what what is the role that, that collective representation and voice has of, for these workers outside the, the global north and, and to what extent uh, this could actually impact in, the, in their um, plight for improvement of their rights. Um, we see, for instance, that in, in the global north, traditional trade unions were the main, um, the main act, collective actor to take role in litigation. Um, so maybe the lack of access to structures of representation uh, takes a toll, in, or for sure takes a toll in, in their general access to improvement of their working conditions. And here, just to show that the collective actors were mostly present in, in Europe, with a bit of presence in Australia and a bit in, in South America. Uh, and just uh, to finish up, I just wanted to uh, show this brief um, graph that tries to illustrate a, a bit where the tendency was going in the different states uh, with the main uh, uh, claim that was employment status. And just to reflect a bit on what we were hearing at the beginning on uh, well, the unlikely success of the uh, EU directive and the, we must now look ahead at what comes with the ILO. Uh, so maybe um, the, the uh, contribution that this mapping can have is is to look beyond, uh, we will have to look beyond uh, the European um, context if, if we are to uh, expect to do a general uh, standards of the ILO on platform work. And, and this type of mapping could, could contribute to having a more global idea of how platform work works at a global scale. So I will leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juliana. And I have to say that uh, clearly this is a titanic work uh, that you're doing. Congratulations. There is so many aspects to unpack and I think will be relevant to all the research that we are conducting in this room. So congratulations. Um, then I give the floor now to Gabrielle. And the floor is yours yeah. for the third presentation. This works, right? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just before I begin, a brief comment is that I'm still working on this uh, on this on this article or on this paper. So feel free to also come up with some feedback because at the end there's something that is still open for me. Uh, I don't say this as an as a disclaimer, but more as an invite to you all. Okay, let me just uh, briefly begin with um, mentioning the the problem the problem uh, which we want to resolve. Uh, these two days, and of course, uh, the issue of the platform workers. There's a great article written by Friedman Bieber. Uh, you might have read it in which he said uh, there are a lot of um, critiques, of course, on the platform economy. And But over the years, there are especially four practices that sent out the absence of social insurance, the lack of income stability, relatively low income and extensive control by the employee. And as he mentions in this article, they are not... Uh, unique or novel, but they are uh, in the sense that they are combined uh, when it comes to platform workers. And it shows, in the words of Friedman Bieber, 
uh, that it is inherently unfair organized unjust for the platform workers and daniel halliday said says that this unfair dynamic between digital labor platform and platform worker uh, actually stems from the power that the platform has to on the one hand of course deny the benefits of true employment such as stability and security and on the other hand deny the benefits of true self-employment such as freedom and autonomy okay so far nothing new so we have an imbalance of power because the platform worker has to accept this position and is uh, vulnerable to uh, you could say exploitation uh, by the digital platform and if we have this relationship between worker and digital platform and we want to rebalance this asymmetry there are basically two things very generally speaking we can do of course we could strengthen the position of the platform worker or we could minimize the power the digital labor platform has over the platform worker and this is sort of a i think maybe a brief outline of where my phd uh, is heading towards <laughs> but for today i will just focus on part three but maybe to outline the context here. Uh, the first is the very legal, in my case, descriptive question, how is the market currently regulated? And I think what we can establish is that uh, the European Union and also the several national member states have been focusing on the position of the platform worker. So on one, on trying to strengthen the position of the platform worker, either by using labor law as a way of reclassification the position of the worker or by using competition law or better <clears throat> not using competition law and removing the barriers competition law um, uh, formed for platform workers that wanted to collectively bargain. A, a second topic, and maybe we can discuss this later, is how <clears throat> we can also use competition law, and this steps also a little bit into the topic David was mentioning at the beginning, to minimize the power of the digital labor platform. But for today, I will discuss the third topic here, and that is the more normative question of how should we regulate these markets? No, not how can. And of course, when a uh, societal issue, um, in this case due to, to um, uh, technological developments arises, the question is, is, of course, how can we react? And as a legal scholar, you, you can be bound, you're bound by uh, only the use of doctrinal sources and um, political philosophy enables one to also go further than uh, positive law. So I hope we can do that today as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to take three different normative theories, three different political lenses, and we're going to apply it to the problem of the platform workers. You see an overview here, and I'm going to walk them through one by one. So let's begin with uh, the theory of liberal market economy. Of course, a theory that has greatly influenced the European Union. And we have to go back to 1939 when Friedrich Hayek, the well-known philosopher, well-known to you as well, wrote his article on the top of my head. I think it was Economic Conditions on Interstate Federalism. And at the time, he expressed his thoughts uh, on European integration. And as a matter of fact, he was in favor of European integration um, because he uh, expected that uh, an economically unified European Union would in fact stimulate his beloved market liberalism. So that's 1949. In 2009, Swartz wrote his famous article, The Double Asymmetry of European Integration, in which he basically um, said that Hayek was in fact right. It took some time though, but after analyzing the whole evolution of the European integration, Swartz uh, showed in 2009 that the European Union has been very successful in the process of negative integration, such as removal of um, barriers uh, by case law, uh, but has been less successful in the implementation of positive integration. So the introduction of welfare policy. And of course, the 1980s uh, was not great for this as well. Uh, since the economic integration accelerated the liberal transformation. So what, what happened here is we have the decoupling between a European market economy on the European level and social protection uh, still on national level. And of course, how does this speak to the issue? Well, the core value of a liberal market economy is, of course, enhancing competition. It's, it's the main belief that, um, that is relevant there. 
Uh, as Coleman describes it in his article, Competition and Cooperation, it stimulates individually rational, non-cooperative, unconstrained social interaction. And Hussein's uh, defines it as impeding people against each other. Liberal market economy can define a framework in which people have to struggle against each other. And so we've seen in the case of platform workers competing with each other individually with their labor as a surface. So you could say it's um, the wet dream of any uh, liberal market economist. Um, and did I want to say anything more here? Yeah, can you imagine that only until two years ago, it was not possible for the platform workers to come together and to actually uh, collectively bargain. Right, okay, so we could say that until two years ago, the situation in the European Union resonated with the theory of the liberal market economy in the case of the platform worker. Um, although, of course, the European Union has been trying to take steps uh, and also formulate and strengthen the social component of the European Union, um, making the shifts from a market economy to a social market economy, of course, not only in Worthing in the 2009 Lisbon Treaty, but also in concrete policy. For example, the last year with the Corona Recovery Fund in general and the, um, the minimum income, but also, of course, in the field of the digital economy and its workers. So we're moving towards somewhat of an abetted liberalism. And the term abettedness <laughs> is pioneered by Karl Polanyi in his influential and, and great book, The Great Transformation, in which he basically argues that the human being is, in fact, it was only written five years, uh, by the way, later than uh, uh, Hayek's paper, that the human being is, of course, a social being, not an economic one, which would result to um, the analysis that the market should always reflect the society, that the principles of the society in which it is situated, in which it is embedded. And Polanyi describes in his book how the rise of the classical liberalism has resulted in a market that is, in fact, like we saw on the previous slide, decoupled or detached or, as you may, disembedded um, from society. Uh, which has resulted in society actually adopting the, the, the logics and the principles of the market instead of the other way around. And now what we're seeing is, of course, that there are some resemblance, and I won't dive into too deeply for now, um, the same drivers and, and labor and, and data as new commodities in the platform economy. But we also see how the European Union is trying to find the balance between economic uh, market developments on the one hand, and also social protection for the workers working within the platform economy on the other. So they're trying to, uh, to bring this into this sort of social market economy. Um, and this is the part that I'm still working on, um, is of course what we've been seeing is that we have the liberal point of view. In the first one, we have the more embedded liberal or social democrat or which label you want to put it on the second. Uh, and we see that the approach, as mentioned also uh, uh, at the first slide, is focusing basically now on constraining some of the excesses of private power, maybe to use labor law or to remove competition laws or make competition uh, less important. However, uh, the power, of course, still remains in the hands of uh, well, not of the worker. So if we position the interest of the worker in the middle, yeah, thanks. And then we could see that there is still some sort of a misalignment between the interest of the worker on the one hand and the interest of the owners of the labor platform on the other. And this is where the relatively new idea of platform socialism comes into play, just as a different lens here, the third lens, as an answer to platform capitalism. Platform capitalism has mainly made the diagnose and platform socialism is trying to be the answer to make sure that the role of capitalism uh, is slim, but also the role of the state should be slim. And the alternative here is to democratize the ownership of the digital labor platforms. So instead, we're not working on the individual relationship between platform worker and digital labor platform and trying to either strengthen the first or minimize the power of the second, but either making uh, the direction into an ownership by workers uh, who are own uh, who own the digital labor platform. 
So these three, uh, th these were the three difficult, different political lenses I want to discuss with you. What I'm currently working on is also how I can translate different lenses, so the more normative, abstract political theory into concrete legal framework. But my main discipline is competition law and a bit of labor law. And it would be great to make a combination of not only the theoretical lens, but also how could we translate this and maybe come up with recommendations for the legal framework. So let's say you want to move towards a situation like this. What could we do from the perspective of competition law to actually stimulate this um, development? That was it so far. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for this uh, excellent start. Not, I mean, well advanced research, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of contribution and comments. Uh, and thank you for keeping on time. And now for the last presentation of the panel, I give the floor to Anna. Anna, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Aud. Well, um, good afternoon. Yes, afternoon already to, <laughs> to, to everyone. Um, my presentation, um, well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here and to discuss uh, now in a more national perspective, the issue of platform work and also our recently um, adopted um, presumption of employment in the Portuguese regime. And I will present therefore a more national approach regarding this, uh, this issue, showing you how or the uses it might have and the results it is already already showing in our in our regime. Um, this presumption that we have recently introduced um, was inserted into law just last year uh, through uh, an act uh, that was that, that that got known as the decent work agenda, and um, it was approved in April and it entered into force in the first of May, which was quite symbolic uh, actually, and um, ever since. Uh, that are I will speak about a, a very specific case because finally we are now having case law about this. So far, we hadn't had any any judicial decisions to show, uh, but ever since this um, reform took place, more cases now uh, the first cases uh, and more cases subsequently um, started appearing before the courts, and now we have the first decision. Although, as you will see. It's an interesting decision, but perhaps it will not um, work so much. And I'll explain afterwards uh, afterwards why. But um, this presumption was a needed uh, was a needed um, I'm sorry was a needed um, update to our legislation because previously we only had this traditional pre digital of sorts um, labor presumption that, as you can see. Well, considered and, and took into account circumstances, elements that are very difficult to prove where it comes to platform work. So it was clearly an inadequate instrument to help platform workers to prove uh, the existence of an employment relation. So, and to um, end all suspense, I don't know if you noticed, but I had here a question. Is this a step in the right direction? Yes, it is. This new mechanism is a step in the right direction. It's a, um, it was an important step to modernize our legislation, although it bears improvements, as I will um, show uh, in a few moments. So this um, new employment presumption is present at the Labor Code in Article 12a. Uh, this is... Um, well, um, a very long provision. It has 12 numbers. It occupies more than one page in our code, which is a lot. Um, and not only is it long, but it, it is also complex. Uh, sometimes its interpretation is not exactly easy. And at points, the legal technique is not exactly uh, the best, as, as you will see. Uh, still, um, it was, as I was just saying, an important uh, step to modernize our legislation and it's also a very uh, i think advanced solution in the sense that this presumption will apply to any kind of platform through which of course work is performed so it will apply not it will apply to online work to offline work to writers to um, private ride hailing services to everything basically and the idea is the service provider 
will have, as you can see here, so um, the employment relation will be presumed when some of the following characteristics occur. We have taken this, this to mean that only two will have to occur. If two of these, at least two of these characteristics occur, then the, serv the service provider will be able to invoke this presumption and the burden of proof will then shift to the, uh, to the beneficiary, uh, the presumed employer who will then have to prove that no, this is not an employer, this is not an employment relationship. And I will tell you um, some of the ways in which the presumed employer can try and take away this, uh, this presumption. We began uh, in Portugal discussing the possibility of introducing a employment presumption back in 2021. So um, th th this final product uh, is not only, um, it, it is not only, it was not only influenced by the proposal, by the European Commission's proposal, but as you can see through the, through the wording that was selected by the legislator, it was not the only influence, but it was a very heavy influence, because as you can see, um, so which characteristics? So the, the digital the digital platforms determines the payments or establishes a minimum or maximum limit for for that effect. And if we look here at the uh, at the proposal, effectively determining or setting up our limits to the level of remuneration. The same happens to the second characteristic: digital platforms. The digital platform exercises directive power and determines specific rules regarding the appearance of the service provider, their conduct, or the performance of the service. And we can find something similar in the proposal of the European Commission. Um, the digital platform controls and supervises the performance of work, including in real time, or verifies the quality of the performance, namely through electronic means. Again, the proposal also goes in this sense. Then we have a very poorly written um, subparagraph here. The digital platform restricts the service provider's autonomy regarding the organization of work, particularly concerning the choice of wor working or absence periods, regarding the acceptance or refusal of tasks, utilization of subcontractors or substitutes through the application of sanctions, but also this last part should should be at the end, and it's not doesn't make a lot of sense. Concerning the choice of clients or the ability to perform uh, to provide pardon services to third parties, and this is basically subparagraphs here um, C and D, I believe. Oh no, D and E of of the proposal, and also. Um, Another characteristic that we also take into consideration is the fact that the digital platform exercises employers' powers. I, I translated this myself. I, I didn't something better didn't occur, but it's basically the idea like disciplinary powers. And also, last characteristic, the work equipments and instruments belong to the digital platform or are explored by it. So basically, if at least two of this, I believe, six characteristics verify, then the service provider will be able, will be able to invoke the, um, the presumption and shift then in the, the burden of proof. Um, as I was saying, this is not a very well-written presumption, uh, namely here, so paragraph T does not make a lot of sense. We have to change to rearrange uh, what is written here. And also, um, as you can see here, there is the usage of expressions that are clearly associated already with the end result. Disciplinary powers, employment powers, directive powers. So it's kind of strange to include these, these expressions here because if this is as it is, a rebutable presumption, so I'm going to prove that there are directive powers or uh, disciplinary powers, and then the platform is going to prove that this is not an employment contract. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And another um, critical, I think, aspect is that some of these are the most characteristic uh, elements of an employment contract. And yet, the worker or the service provider will have to invoke two. One is not enough, which is peculiar and was also one of the criticisms regarding the, the proposal for um, the platform work directive. So as I said before, it is, of course, an interesting and advanced mechanism, but it does uh, bear some, some improvement, namely in its wording, but, but not only. Um, once invoked, once activated this presumption, it will be up for the... Um, 
I'm sorry. It will be up for the presumed employer to prove that no, this is not an employment presumption, uh, an employment pardon uh, relation. And how can the platform in this case prove that this is not the case? This is not the situation here at hand. So the platform can do that by demonstrating that the service provider works or performs with effective autonomy without being subject to its control direction and so on, which is kind of peculiar taking into consideration the previous expressions, but still it's one of the ways in which the platform can rebuke this. And it can also invoke, as you can see here, that yes, okay, this is an employment contract, but not between the platform and the service provider, but rather with an intermediary. And this is um, reminiscent of a, a very controversial solution that we have in Portugal. I don't know if you know about it. Um, that is called the Uber law, well, by us. Um, uh, it was uh, an act of 2018 that had, um, that basically um, intended to regulate ride hailing services. That's why we call it the Uber law. And uh, our literature rightly, justly, criticizes a lot this, this legislation because and accuses our legislation, our legislator of having uh, deferred to the interests of platforms because, because basically here we have a very strange configuration in this service. We have not three intervenients, but four. We have the platform, the driver, the client, but also a transportation operator. And this fourth intervenient, which was an invention of our legislator, is basically the entity with whom the driver enters into any kind of contract, be it an employment contract or a uh, service uh, provision uh, contract. So basically, following this legislation, there is no contractual relation between the driver and the platform, only between the driver and this entity that must exist always at all times. So it was interesting that here in this uh, new mechanism, this was not the choice of our legislators. So we did not at first allude to the presence of an, of an intermediary, but it was not totally forgotten because it is, yes, a way to... Uh, for the platform to try and, and, and push away the, the presumption. And, uh, well, in fact, it might be uh, demonstrated in the case at hand that, yes, the employer is the intermediary and not the platform. But if that is the case, if there is indeed an intermediary and if the intermediary ends up being the employer, Another interesting thing that was inserted in this regime is that in that case, there will be joint responsibility between the, between the platform and this intermediary, which is, I think, very important to try and prevent more pathological situations that have been occurring in some jurisdictions and will have, I think, a very important anti-fraud um, kind of effect. Um, another aspect, uh, that is present in this provision in number nine, when it's one of its many numbers, is um, that once activated, and if we end up concluding that, yes, there is an employment contract, um, then the labor code will, of course, be applicable to this situation, but not necessarily the whole of the labor code, because as you can see, the applicable provisions will be those compatible with the nature of the um, performed activity, which is... Um, a complicated situation because this will have to be ascertained case by case and this will create legal uncertainty. We risk having different decisions according to the courts. In this court, they will decide this way. In that court, they will decide differently. And it also leads to a fragmented uh, regulation regarding platform work, which is not, which is not ideal. And um, I will come back to this because I don't have a lot of time and, and I want to show you um, this last part. Um, of course, as it was previously said here during the morning, labor law is always lagging behind this phenomena. So of course, this regime was approved in April. It entered into force in May. And during that time, news uh, started appearing about the platform's reactions. Uh, and basically what they are saying is, we want to give more flexibility to our partners. So we are changing our, our MO, our 
business model. And indeed, you can see that some, um, uh, you can find this information on their websites. They're basically trying to provide, they say, more autonomy. And well, basically, the, the, the intention is quite clearly to try and get away from those characteristics that we inserted in our, uh, in our presumption. And to finish, uh, as I was saying before, we do have the first ruling. Uh, it was um, in a case that opposed a worker against Uber Eats. So we're, talk we're talking about a writer. The court decided that out of those six characteristics that we previously saw, five of them, the five first were filled, were fulfilled. So it declared that this was an employment contract. So it's a very interesting decision, uh, particularly because I get the feeling that it already took into consideration these uh, more flexible ways of working of Uber Eats following our um, recent legal change. But unfortunately, and this is the downside, apparently there was some um, mistake and instead of notifying Uber Eats, they notified Glovo, which means, so Uber Eats did not participate in this process because they were not notified as they should have been. Yeah. And um, this means that basically we'll have to go, well, Uber is going to appeal out of this saying precisely that their legal, uh, their procedural rights were not respected. So I have a feeling that we'll have to go to step one and redo this whole thing again. So, yeah, first decision, not for a long time, but we will have more, I am sure. And then we will be able to truly see how the courts, specifically with the arguments from the from the platform, how the courts read, read the platform, uh, read the, the presumption. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks uh, for this really interesting insight. And once again, I'm sure the room will have questions. I would like to thank you both for the quality uh, of your presentation, but also for keeping on time, because now we have 10 solid minutes uh, for the Q&A, which is great. I'm very happy about that. Uh, as a um, uh, rule, I will ask the comment to be extremely short, mm -hmm. the questions to be on point, and if you can even precise <laughs> to whom it is addressed, it will be even better. Uh, and also, I will invite the speakers, if they have questions to one another, mm -hmm. to not hesitate to take you know, the floor and raise your hand. So first, I'm going maybe to collect a couple of questions from the room or comments that are on point. I'm not that strict. Anyone, there is one question here and then another one, please. Thank you so much for excellent presentations. Victor Barrett from Union. And to the last speaker, I, I really would agree that this intermediate thing becomes the big challenge because in, in Sweden, we see not a challenge, not a problem with who are these people employed, but rather who is the employer, yeah. which is a difficult legal battle. So. Any, any further insights you might have in the future of that will be welcome. And, but continue the research. Excellent. There was another question here. Thank you. Uh, to Anna as well, and I think it picks up some of Juliana's points. Uh, Adam from Connect by Data. Um, my question is, is the exercise of the presumption of employment rights and whether or not that how that operates in terms of is it by an individual by individual basis mm -hmm. and that there can be any kind of like collective or like class based approach to basically like make it more effective and impactful rather than um, individualized. Mm -hmm. uh, third question here. Hi, um, Tuana. Um, I'm Pedro from uh, Edinburgh Business School. Uh, just a question whether you have seen uh, or do you have uh, any information on how uh, platform companies are actually, uh, you know, changing their models, uh, MO, as you were saying, mm -hmm. because in Spain, we've seen some of them subcontracting uh, temporary agency companies to to employ these uh, these workers, uh, so just wanted to know if you have any kind of more information mm -hmm. and could uh, uh, explain a little bit more. Thank you. And the last two questions, and then we'll give the opportunity to the speakers to uh, answer. Please. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Matteo Marenko, Max Planck Institute. Um, to Juliana, I wanted to 
first congratulate on the uh, on the impressive work of data collection and the mapping that you're doing. Um, and this Brazil case is very interesting, right? I, I just wanted to ask you whether you have more insights on, on that because, like, of course, I mean, the results uh, can be partly, at least, I think, explained by the fact that Brazil is a huge country and and you know it's a, a great, um, like, considerable labor uh, force. But this is not the, the only factor in, you know, at play because India, otherwise, you know. So I just wanted to ask you whether uh, you have some insights on that, uh, and if you put into relation the the findings that you that you have with the population and you know, labor market force for the countries, this will I think enhance your data uh, presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Last question, and then I will let the speaker there is one that was here yeah first row thank you maria hi yeah um uh, simon joyce university of leeds and it's a question for juliana because uh, i work on just first i work on the leeds index of platform labor protest so it's just a chapeau to the work that goes into compiling these databases and know all about it the the question was so what you a comment you made about the sort of on the legal cases north and south that, that you said in the south they're mainly individual cases that because this is something that we've come across because we document we we catalog legal challenges as a form of work labor protest so um but the, the just i wonder if you could say something more about the individual cases because in a, in a lot of legal regimes that's the avenue through which collective grievances have to be taken so, you know, in Britain, you can, uh, until recently, there was no such thing as case law. And even now, employment tribunals are individual cases. But there's, but the, but there's evidence that out, outside of platform work, for instance, in Britain, large companies, 50% of employment tribunal cases result in a change to company policy into some sort of HR or safety level or whatever. So there are collective implications of individual cases. And even where the case is one person, that doesn't mean there wasn't some kind of collective decision about who was going to pursue the case. I mean, I've interviewed IWGB activists who say we have to decide who's going to go to court. You know, so um, I just wondered if you'd looked at that at all, uh, the, the, the possible uh, collective dimensions of what in legal and, and outcome dimensions of what in legal terms of individual. And some of them might be, but some probably are. But have, have you looked at how many of them are broader than that? Thank you very much. Uh, I will give the floor to the speakers to address, and then I will reopen the floor for questions. Uh, Anna, do you want to start first, maybe? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, beginning with the first one uh, regarding the intermediary. Ah, is it? Oh, OK, yeah. yes, it is. I'm sorry. Uh, regarding the intermediaries, uh, this can become quite tricky, particularly regarding the ride hailing services, because a few years back, basically before that piece of legislation, the drivers, they could perform directly to the platform. And following that le le legislation, they were forced basically to create these companies in order to perform the services. I think that with this solution um, of joint responsibility, it is hard sometimes determining, but as long as there is joint responsibility, it can be this intermediary, but the platform is always called upon also to um, to fulfill whichever uh, fees, duties, whatever are in relation to this worker. But still, this is kind of, um, it was an, an aspect in which I didn't have time to delve. But um, the truth is, now we have these two pieces of legislation. So we have the labor code with this presumption, and now we have this Uber law that enshrines these four entities. And this presumption is supposed to apply also to the ride hailing services. But how exactly if we are forced to have this fourth intermediary? So I think we have to do what we call a corrective interpretation, allowing also for the acknowledgement of drivers who work directly to the platform, aside from the ones who work to, to the intermediary. But this is what I think. Other people think that it's not necessary to change this. A member of parliament a few, uh, a few months ago went to a conference uh, at my university and, they, and he said that they were thinking about amending 
this uh, this act to try and articulate it with the last change to the, the labor uh, the labor code. But then political crisis in, ensued, and the government fell, and now we're going to have elections. So this is clearly not a priority right now. So, and it's interesting that. We are now having more cases, finally, cases and more cases on, on, on platform work. But as far as I'm as far as I know, all regarding delivery services, not uh, ride hailing services. So I don't really know how that is going to, to go, I must confess. Um, regarding the proposal of, of judicial um, matters uh, before the courts, uh, yeah trade unions can also can also do it but interestingly enough this case that i was telling you about was actually proposed presented by the public prosecutor prosecutor's uh, service uh, because uh, and i think that most cases perhaps will come through that avenue actually because when uh, our labor inspectorate um, realizes that, that there are situations that are irregular contracts that are not being acknowledged as employment contracts. If the situation is not dealt with by the employer, then the case goes to the public prosecutor's office and they can present a, court, uh, a case before the courts as happened here. So it might help accelerate things. And regarding the way this got uh, more flexible, their MO, um, I, I was just checking the, the, the website. So um, they are now introducing the possibility of substitution. Uh, they are now introducing the possibility of refusing uh, um, tasks. Uh, the um, classification given by the users will have no impact on their accounts. That's what they say. If they're going to do it or not in practice, if these are just bogus um, aspects of their operation or not, I'm not sure, but they're definitely trying to avoid this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juliana, for a brief answer. Yes, well, uh, actually, it will be very brief because I would have to say that these are very interesting questions. Uh, I don't <laughs> don't necessarily have the answers to them because it's it's precisely the the route where I, I wish that this uh, mapping can lead to answering precisely why these sorts of differences can be seen. It is indeed a very curious case in Brazil. I was surprised when I saw this because it was a lot of decisions and even in the literature in Brazil, there is much uh, written over the practice of manipulative conciliation that has tried to avoid actually more decisions in favor of, of the workers because when the platforms are in the position where they see this case is, is trembling, they settle. And uh, so it would even be more according to the literature, uh, but these are much harder to come across because then these are not published, they're not available. But these are the kind of questions that that uh, come up with, with this. Why, indeed, uh, the type of uh, judicial enforcement ma makes all the difference because not every country allows the uh, just collective, sorry, actors to to have a, a role or to present the procedure. So not the answers, but these are the questions that I seek to look a bit further into. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before so closing the floor, I want to give the opportunity to David and uh, Gabrielle. If you want to add something, like one or two sentences, please. No. No, thanks. you're fine. <laughs> yeah, as well, yeah. then thank you to all of you. Sorry for not being able to reopen, but it gives uh, food for thought for the coffee break. Thanks to the four speakers, but also to Maria Nikolova for her help. A big round of applause. And thank you very much. Yes. I mean, if it's not going, I will use the microphone. That's always. I know, I will keep it between us so that it's also for you. Hello, welcome to the afternoon session. Please join the room. I will start with uh, housekeeping uh, announcements. Maybe they will come. <laughs> so, <laughs> I will say the keyword drinks and cocktail reception uh, will happen after the last talk of today. So please stay if you have time. It's, it's just in the common area where we had lunch. Uh, so that's at 5.30 today. I think that's uh, after the last panel. This is the last but one. So uh, without further ado, because we are really pressed for time, we were very ambitious in terms of allocating, uh, over ambitious to be honest, um, allocating too many speakers for very short uh, time slots. 
but because it was based on uh, open call for papers, you, you, the submissions we received were so plentiful and so excellent. We felt we want to listen to everyone. So we just invited all of you <laughs> to listen to the presentation. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much for coming. And um, I understand that so much, so little time for the discussion is not ideal. So without further ado, we will have four presentations. I will ask speakers to perhaps limit the presentation time to 10, 12 minutes, oh, no. which will leave us a bit of time. Um, <laughs> that will leave us a bit of time for the, for hopefully some questions. And if not, there is the drinks reception that I mentioned at 5.30 where we can continue the debate. Um, so I hand over to Laura Schulze. Uh, you do have your slides uh, and you have the flipper. So the floor is, floor is yours. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to meet you. I'm Laura. Uh, as you can see in the title of my presentation, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I'm not from this field. Um, so it's very interesting for me to be here today and to learn about your views about algorithmic management, uh, digital labor platforms, and similar topics. Um, and I hope that I can also contribute something from my discipline um, to your uh, analysis. Um, so I'm here to present some of the PhD work that I did um, on algorithmic management. Um, but first, um, as we are in a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary uh, conference here, I would like to say a few words on the information systems conference, just because in the past I noticed that it helps facilitating conversations if you know, you know how this different disciplines, um, um, yeah, how they work. Uh, so basically, um, we focus on how IT systems are developed and how individuals, groups, organizations, and markets interact with IT. Um, and there are two main paradigms. So one is um, they actually develop uh, algorithms, systems, and so on. Uh, and the other is um, they explain how people interact with IT. And I'm going to focus on this behavioral science. Um, and uh, I want to start with a really really high level overview of uh, the literature on algorithmic management in information systems. So it's a recent topic, it's multidisciplinary, that's why I'm also here. Um, and um, there are uh, empirical studies in our field, um, mostly uh, qualitative work, mostly on cases like Uber. Um, but there's also a lot of debate and there are some things that we agree on and some things where we disagree on. So something that we agree on is, is, is that it's a social, that algorithmic management is a social technical phenomenon um, and it is a double-edged sword for workers. So on the one hand, we ha they have more opportunities, flexibilities, but on the other hand, um, things like justice, fairness, accountability, transparency, and so on are the main pressing issues that we also see in our field. And there are many open questions um, in this field. And one of them is the basic question, what is algorithmic management? Um, so I reviewed the literature and I um, theorized how uh, it can be described. And this is the definition that I'm going to use throughout this presentation. Algorithmic management refers to the delegation of decision-making along the work process among agentic information systems and human actors. Um, so you see that there are systems um, that take over management activities. Um, but there are also human actors involved in that. And sometimes the decisions are made by the systems and sometimes they delegate decision-making to one of the, or multiple of the actors. Um, and with that, um, I did um, yeah, some studies and I want to present one of them <laughs> here. Um, so if we accept that um, algorithmic management refers to the delegation of decision-making among the actors, um, then the subsequent um, question comes, how are those decision rights distributed in the case of digital labor platforms? Um, and then once we know that also how it influences um, satisfaction, I'm going to uh, talk about this um, later. So what I did here is a two study um, approach um, based on theory, uh, and I'm going to walk through this a little bit. Um, so first, in order to um, investigate how decisions are distributed. I first have to, I had to um, see what kind of decisions are made uh, on, on digital labor platforms and what those tasks are. So I used a service value chain that basically goes through a service and uh, goes through the different stages that are involved in services. Um, and this, um, based on that and my analysis of different digital labor platforms came up with um, those four um, decision-making tasks. So first matchmaking, a worker and a client have to find each other, they have to agree on working together. Then to condition setting, mostly price and scope. So what is to be done and at, at which price. Um, process control refers to how um, the work should be done. 
And then the last step, quality control, refers to um, follow-up activities uh, in this theory. So um, mostly this is um, about the evaluation of the work that has been done. Um, and um, you can see here, I brought an example for one of those stages matchmaking uh, on one of the platforms, which is Upwork in this example. Um, so what I looked at is their websites, their FAQs, their um, serve, help centers, service centers, and so on. And I tried to see who makes those decisions on the platform. Um, so for the matchmaking here in the first one, it is um, the, it says that the, the technology creates a short list uh, based on the project's needs that clients have. Um, so they shortlist some workers uh, to be um, selected for the job. So in, in fact, the platform that creates the shortlist and the client who decides on a worker make the decision to uh, hire somebody. But there are also two other ways on this platform how uh, matchmaking can be done. So the other one is that just uh, clients can browse through all of the workers that are there and just choose one uh, they want to work with. Or the other way around, um, the worker can choose the projects that are available and choose uh, who to work for. Right? So in this case, the resulting characteristic that I came up with is that uh, the platform, the client, and the worker um, can make the decision who to work with um, in the matchmaking stage. And what I then did is do this uh, throughout. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, OK. Okay, I just uh, tried to speak louder. <laughs> I hope you can still hear me. So um, what I did then is to go through um, over 100 um, digital labor uh, platforms and um, go through all of their materials and uh, all th uh, through all the stages and decided, okay, who makes those decisions for matchmaking, price scope, setting, process control, and quality control. So what you can see here in the percentages is um, how many of the platforms that I looked at um, show this characteristic. So for example, in the matchmaking, um, on most platforms, you can see 39%, um, there's this mixture where the platform, the client and the worker, they somehow influence this decision, uh, which is the last column. Uh, for price and scope setting, most platform, on most platforms, the platform, so the system determined what the price and what the scope is. Um, for how the work uh, is done, it's mostly left up to the clients and the workers to decide by themselves. And for quality control, um, it's mostly the platform, the clients who evaluate the worker. Um, so this is what I found here. And then I wanted to go beyond just the distributions of the frequencies of how the decision rights are distributed and then see what kind of effects it has um, on workers. I did it also on clients, but I'm going to um, focus on workers here and see how it affects their um, satisfaction. And the hypothesis here was that the more um, influence the worker has, the more satisfied they are, right? So because they can choose their own terms and so on. So this was my working uh, hypothesis. So the less influence the platform exerts on the worker, the happier they are, right? Um, and what I did to test this hypothesis is I used two proxies for worker satisfaction. One is the fair work scores, <laughs> and the other is um, the ratings of the worker facing apps on the Apple and uh, Android app stores. Um, and um, I did a qualitative comparative analysis, um, which is based on um, logical minimization of configurations. Um, and I'm going to just show you the results and explain uh, what I found here. So uh, what you can see here, the filled, um, sorry, the filled um, dots, um, those are the ones where the platform is involved in decision-making. And uh, the white ones is where the platform is not involved in decision-making. Um, and then you can see um, the different data sets. So the uh, worker app reviews and the fair work scores. And then you can see for each of them, because it's not uh, assuming a symmetry. Um, so you can see a different analysis for the high scores and then for the low scores, right? So it doesn't assume that it's uh, equal. Um, so you can see from this result, uh, I want to highlight um, the high scores for, um, for worker satisfaction, which is consistent across both types of data sets, is that if the platform does influence matchmaking, condition setting, and process control, but not quality control, um, then workers are satisfied, at least according to the data that we have. Um, you can see the scores. So if you're familiar with QCA, you can see that it's not a very, um, very um, yeah, good coverage um, because we ha only have very little data, but uh, still um, 
this method can be done with this amount of data. So yes, uh, I come to the uh, last slide. Um, just a conclusion slide. So algorithmic management can refer to the delegation of decision-making along the process, work process among agentic information systems and human actors. They may include matchmaking, condition setting, process control, and quality control. We saw that there's a huge variety of distribution of decision rights across the different stages, but also across different platforms. Um, and then worker satisfaction is based on configurations of these decision rights distributions. And, those, and there are configurations, and we saw that on the previous slide, where although workers don't have the decision rights in every stage, they, they show high satisfaction. Um, and this is kind of counterintuitive to what we expected. Um, and it's also um, yeah, implying that we need a holistic approach of identifying uh, configurations of decision rights in, in, in different stages um, that satisfy workers. Um, there's one of our previous research uh, linked here. And also, if you want to reach out, of course, at the conference, but also afterwards, please connect. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this presentation. I also get questions throughout the conference about uh, sharing slides. So I do hope we can ask every speaker to provide the slides and then uh, share them indeed with the speakers. So to, to ensure you of that. Uh, without uh, spending any more time on this, I hand over to Valeria, who actually, Valeria Polignano, uh, who will share the slides, uh, the her presentation with Nora. Again, I ask you to both uh, stick to more or less 10, 12 minutes if possible, in total. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Agnieszka. Um, so first of all, uh, let me say that we carry on talking about pricing, uh, but not satisfaction. But I hope that uh, will be anyhow interesting what we are going to talk about. Um, so this is a joint paper. Uh, we will share the presentation with uh, Nora. Uh, Uma is on the other side of the, the table, so <laughs> she can, she can, can uh, reply to the questions. <laughs> So uh, let me say that, uh, why did we write this paper? Uh, first of all, we wrote this paper because we uh, were working on uh, uh, two projects uh, at almost the same time, using different methodologies, quantitative and qualitative, but looking at the same problem, which saw the problem of pricing uh, strategies on platform work and unpaid labor uh, uh, time. And we uh, find that uh, we were sharing the same sort of uh, reflection based on our data, on the outcome of our data. What was this kind of reflection? Was the aim to challenge the kind of common view on the uh, boundless uh, nature of the online labor markets, uh, where in fact these uh, platforms, uh, they try to intermediate service provisions and, uh, and, and services uh, with, uh, with the clients. And we did it by exploring, in fact, the pricing strategies. Now, let me say that, uh, I mean, this is our challenge. So the challenge was, in fact, to challenge this idea, theoretically speaking, of, uh, you know, saying these online labor markets are not geographically boundless uh, labor market. But we also do see that there are a lot of studies out there, and that's why also, in fact, we were motivated to write this paper, that they argue uh, for the uh, uh, bundless nature of online labor market. And these kind of studies, they argue that based on what? Based on different sort of assumptions, which we have summarized here. Well, first of all, they say that workers, they work remotely, uh, and therefore they can sell their own labor power uh, in these kind of digital uh, transferable uh, services um, without any kind of physical or geographical proximity to the customer. The second uh, is that the digital services provided by those workers are, in fact, transacted uh, online via these uh, uh, platforms and consequently to that uh, uh, within this online labor market we see in fact that workers can work from different parts of the world and they can access work they can perform work uh, without any sort of fulfillment regarding the entry criteria the fourth interesting uh, argument made by these studies regards the institutional boundaries uh, and they say in fact uh, labor online labor market they don't have institutional boundaries or at least institutional boundaries are very minimal as in fact platform uh, they use self-employment uh, um, uh, or independent contractors and last but not least uh, we also see that uh, in fact uh, because of that because of being self-employed in most of the cases workers are not tied to the uh, kind of employment arrangements in any sort of national or even international or global uh, uh, arena so uh, that's the situation. But nevertheless, there are some exceptions in this literature. Uh, and one of these exceptions we found quite interesting and we wanted to, to contribute to is the kind of argument made by uh, Graham, Mark Graham, and Anwar. 
uh, we, uh, where the authors, they argue that uh, platforms within this online labor market, they take, they actually take advantage. So they seem to argue for some sort of boundary uh, relationship there because they say that platform, they uh, take advantage of this uh, planetary uh, uh, a workforce, uh, which in fact means for them, they, they don't do away uh, with uh, geography, but rather they take advantage of these uh, um, kind of uh, geography and uh, workforce distribute, distributed across different uh, regions. And therefore, we wanted in our study to build upon this kind of argument made by Graham and Anwar, and uh, particularly, we uh, uh, in fact were interested in looking at how platforms, uh, rules and practices, they, uh, they kind of, uh, uh, which are made uh, uh, in different uh, regional contexts, how the, these practices and uh, um, uh, strategies of platforms, they shape also the practices and strategies of online um, workers. And we found it quite interesting to look at it because in fact, in most of the literature, we see that there is a lot of attention on what platforms they do, but there is less attention on how what platforms they do have an effect on the strategies of the actors that they uh, basically uh, face these kind of uh, practices. And in fact, we wanted uh, to pay particular attention here on the strategies of pricing uh, of online uh, uh, freelancers and look also at the role of unpaid labor in that kind of sense, since also the fact that uh, we do know there is now a little bit of research more also on freelancing, looking at unpaid labor and and particularly uh, theorizing unpaid labor in the incapacity that these freelancers they do have to determine their own prices on uh, platforms. So uh, research question we posed are the ones that you can see here. I'm not gonna uh, uh, you know, read them, but particularly, as I said, we wanted to assess by using quantitative and qualitative uh, methodology. Uh, first of all, um, you know, uh, which pricing strategies these freelancers they use on platform, how these pricing strategies are developed, and also how far unpaid labor accounts for the uh, disparities we observed in pricing strategies across different regions, particularly the global north and the global south, and how all these is reflected also in the earnings capacities, how you know, uh, these freelancers, they earn by providing their own services through platforms. And I would uh, escape here without perhaps just saying that we did, as I said before, an integration between quantitative survey run by the ILO and some qualitative study interviews we have been doing within the Respect Me project. And I pass over to uh, Nora. Thank you very Thank much, you. Nora. <laughs> yes, so we use the ILO we use the ILO survey, so the global survey, from which around two thirds of the respondents are coming from developing and one third from developed countries. And this is a sample of Up Upwork um, freelancers, which means 418 respondents. And the qualitative part is mostly coming from in-depth interviews um, that were conducted in different European um, countries. So from the data, we can see that these workers are average are 33 years old they are typically highly educated and many of them rely on uh, freelance, online freelance work um, financially. Uh, regarding their main motivation, we can see from one hand, it's uh, come from the flexibility and the preference of working from home, particularly in developed countries. And we can also see some financial consideration more in the developing countries, such as better earnings or complementing their income. Um, we found that around half of the freelancers had an, had an other job other than freelancing. And we saw them that they undertook a diverse range of tasks and we could see some differences by regions. So we could see that accounting and legal work were more common in developed countries while data analytics and transcription were most more common in um, developing ones. But where the clients are located, that's also very important to look at because there might be a higher probability to get better or uh, higher prices from uh, international clients. And especially the case for those in developing countries. And if you look at the graph, you can see that uh, those residing in developing countries, almost all of them work with um, foreign clients. And we can also see like a globalization of tasks where clients are um, residing in the developed part of the world while the workers in the developing countries undertake the actual tasks. 
And now we also have to look at the regularity of the clients, not just the location of them, because we saw that uh, more workers in the developed countries reported having several regular clients compared to those in developing ones. And a regression analysis showed um, positive correlation with the earnings, um, they're having a real client and earnings in developed countries, not in developing ones. And from qualitative responses, we found that regular or having regular clients can um, lead to more direct interactions, more work, better ratings, and and the uh, workers can also comment better prices, not just from their regular clients, but from other clients as well. And that's what the quotes um, illustrate. Now, um, for accessing works, ratings are crucial. And I we listed some of the uh, different activities what workers undertake to, to build a reputation, such as requesting past uh, clients to complete their feedback or uploading their portfolio, building a social media presence. And here is a quote, um, I was able to gradually increase my rates as my work volume grew and my ratings went up. So it's also their rates that they can um, increase through better ratings and more work. Now, um, it's important to see there is a very high competition on platforms, which leads to workers adopting different strategies. So we can see, and you can see from this graph, that many of the workers um, underbid projects, and they also subsidize their own work um, through accepting work that otherwise they would decline, um, accepting work for lower pay, or even lowering their own prices. And you can see that this is a common practice across um, the regions. And here is a quote that it also illustrates the situation. Um, one of the mistakes most people make, and I made, is just going in too low. You are desperate and will even do stuff for free. Now, talking about doing stuff for free, unpaid work is, um, is also very important to talk about uh, when it comes to platform work, because there is a difference between the traditional market. So in the traditional labor market, we can see that um, self-employed workers are able to incorporate their unpaid work in their pricing. But this is not the case on platforms where we can again see the high competition. And it makes it very difficult for workers to uh, account for this unpaid work. And we can see that they do a lot of unpaid work. So what um, the survey results show that on average, they spend eight hours a week doing unpaid tasks, which is about 28% uh, of their total working time. And this was um, even higher in developing countries. And just some of the examples that it means preparing proposals, promoting themselves, self-study, administrative work, among, um, among other things. And finally, we looked at workers' earnings. And here, again, you can see um, the hourly earnings of workers in US dollars on this graph um, by developed and developing countries. And you can see a huge gap there. So we looked at it uh, by the location of clients, and you can see that there is this group of workers working with international clients. There is this huge gap between those in developed and developing countries. And even when we looked at the uh, regularity of clients, there is this big gap that persists in each, uh, in each of these groups. And it's also important to look at the different expenditures that these uh, workers face the commissions, the subscription plans, withdrawal fees, and this is universal. They face it regardless of where they are located. And uh, this, is, um, this means that it affects disproportionately the workers in developing countries, and this leads to a polarization of earnings. And we can see that uh, workers in the developing countries face a disadvantage, even though we saw in the previous slides that they adopted different strategies, they perform unpaid works, yet these gaps uh, still exist. And particularly from a qualitative responses, we could see that these platforms allow for discrimination. And I will close with this quote saying that there is a lot of discrimination based on your nationality. And even if you have superior skills, clients from Western countries may judge you based on your country of origin. And with this, Valeria will take over to um, with the conclusion. Yeah. Well, very, very, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, very quickly. I mean, I'm not going to go through all these. I mean, I think that what this paper shows is, in fact, that, um, let's say, there is not a boundless uh, labor market. Uh, <clears throat> differentiation still exists based on discrimination, as Nora said. But what we also see that is that these discrimination are basically in divisions are explained through the unpaid labor performed by freelancers in the way in which they cannot recuperate the kind of effort they do. Uh, and this is particularly, particularly higher for developing countries freelancers where resources are scarce and they have to, you know, struggle the highest uh, in comparison to the global north. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, fascinating results. And um, now we move to Umarani and Anna Rosa Pesole from ILO, uh, who also need to share. I don't. You, you need to share twelve minutes among you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll uh, perhaps yeah. make some changes. I just, <laughs> yeah. I just want to say, all of you who are interested in listening to the entire presentation, come on Friday at eleven o'clock to the press club, <laughs> and that's where the full presentation will happen. And this is going to be a real condensed. It's going to be the trailer. This yeah. one is the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I start. Okay, I start. So this is a project that actually we've been running for two years uh, together with the ILO and the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And it's about algorithm management and algorithm management in specific sectors, specific countries. I'm not preempting it. Uma is going to talk about the funding. But since we do not have much time, I'd like to go directly, you know, to give you just a little bit of introduction. Well, ju just give me back the slide in a second. <laughs> like, not, not so fast. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just it's just like yeah you know, the concept of algorithm management we have seen already that even if uh, there is uh, you know a need to coordinate it with other discipline I mean we took this definition which could be considered kind of like an agreeable definition mm -hmm. or pretty broad definition which is that algorithm management refers to the use of algorithms and data driven systems which are used in order to manage the workflow okay as usual when you start from the concept and then you actually translate it into practical activities you realize that this doesn't work that well. And one of the first things that we realized when we were doing the case studies is that actually there is a lot of algorithm technologies which are used potentially for other purposes. I'll just give an example, like for example, to measure the quality of the air in the establishment that we were looking at or similar things that have concrete effects on the workflow management, on the worker management and working condition. Therefore, we came to um, a conclusion that for us, it was very important to capture all this type of technology. And so we decided, and now we, can, <laughs> we decided that instead of just looking at the effect of a specific system thought and uh, uh, realized that in order to manage a specific aspect of the workers' condition and workers' management inside the firm, we were to look at any system that independently from the reason why it was introduced would have an effect, a specific effect on the worker management. So we came out with this definition, which was a little bit difficult to name, but we decided to brand it as specific purpose digital technology and general purpose digital technology. So the idea is this one. When you are using a specific purpose digital technology, we are referring to any type of system, algorithm system, that it was built in order to actually uh, fulfill a specific work management task. So it could have been like, for example, assigning the shift, uh, deciding uh, the workstation, deciding the task, allocating the task, or measuring other uh, working condition. You know, they could have been like evaluating the workers, discipline the workers, this type of... Uh, of systems. Why the second type of technology, those which are referred to as general purpose technology, are common technology that you might be used like uh, in your common, in your everyday life from WhatsApp to OneNote to other type of software, which were used, however, in order to somehow manage part of the work, um, of, of the work organization inside the, the establishment. Just to give you a very uh, quick example on how this, uh, we looked at the 
healthcare sector, the logistics sector, we look at uh, two European countries, Italy and France, and we look at two global South countries, India and South Africa. And uh, what we found is that, for example, in the healthcare, in the healthcare sector, one thing that it was very common in um, specific, let's say, called uh, technology, it was the use of the so-called hospital information system, which are basically systems which are used in order to optimize the inflow of patients, to optimize the distribution of patients different uh, in uh, different words, or to predict also uh, which is going to be, for example, the rate of access in the emergency room or similar. And these are specific purpose technology, which a clear um, effect and impact on working condition, which have, however, on the benefit, on the, on the plus side, the fact that having been designed specifically to work in that environment, they might be more prone actually to fulfill the other constraints which are related to the use of this type of technology. For example, like the privacy of both worker and patient in the case of healthcare, healthcare, uh, healthcare sector. But when we start looking at what they were actually doing, doctors you know, in the world, well, for example, we found out that it's very common that they share information about patients via WhatsApp. But even like um, like information about like blood tests, uh, your uh, uh, X-ray with the name and everything going on in this big group chat, you know, of doctors and nurses <laughs> that they are chatting about what perhaps you have or you don't have. So this was not just a problem in terms, it raised a little bit, you know, ring the bell, not only just in terms of work management, but also in terms of, you know, which is actually, which are the other uh, potential effects that might relate with accountability and the potential of harm that it could come by using this. And who's going to be responsible? Who's going to be responsible? It's going to be the doctor, it's going to be the company providing, it's going to be the responsible for the uh, data protection of the, of the hospital. So this is just to give some um, type of example. And I think that I will pass it directly to Uma in order to give her more time for the report in the five minutes. Excellent days. time. Okay, that's just one more thing I want to say as we are on the technology. One of the things that we have seen is the rise of predictive data analytics that have come in a big way. And part of that has to do with the entire digitalization of the health data. And as Ana Rosa very rightly said, this leads to questions around due diligence, data privacy, privacy regarding what data can be actually uh, shared and what cannot be shared. And also, uh, as she very rightly said, when you talk about specific purpose digital technologies or AI systems, you know, they're very clear safeguards that are there. And here you have absolutely no safeguards. So how do you actually handle that? And there's some interesting examples I hope to run through as you go back. So now uh, one more thing I do want to mention before we get on is uh, because we had to skip a couple of slides is in all the countries that we did, it was not always easy to get hold of businesses to enter these businesses and have discussions. That was one of the biggest challenges that we faced. The second thing that we did was, as far as possible, we also tried to do a comparison between public and the private sector. This was much more the case within India and South Africa, but we also tried doing the same in Italy and France. So very clearly, when you look at logistics, you find that when you're talking about business model and work organization, yeah, there is a simplification and streamlining of work processes, and it can have a positive impact on productivity, but it is not really very clear how productivity is measured and how it brings about a change. What we did find interestingly is that in terms of job losses, which is often talked about, the minute you're talking about technologies coming inside, the evidence is mixed. In Italy and France, we don't really find, and in India and South Africa, it's super interesting to see that I think it's part of the process because digitization is coming in. These warehouses are coming in a big way. There's a lot of expansion that is happening. So you find that there's no retention or reduction or layoffs, but you find expansion that is happening. But there are very clearly possibilities for labor displacement that would happen uh, in the future. And one thing that you see already that is happening is work intensity. That is increasing, leading to higher productivity. and uh, what is also happening along with it is a replacement of uh, 
proper standard employment contracts with informal contracts and no contracts at all. So the quality of jobs is suffering quite a bit. Now, there was uh, another issue that was being raised, whether with digitalization, you know, would it lead to redefinition of tasks and job roles and all of that? So what we find is there's a, quite a bit of standardization that is happening, which of course leads to uh, you know, simplification of the tasks so that you can manage better. So you do a, a scheduling allocation and all of it. But you also at the same time see much more in the global South, the two countries that we were looking at, that there is some level of upskilling that is happening because you're really moving from a manual way of operation to completely digital. And what was happening within that is workers started feeling that, well, I was a casual worker before, but now I've become a machine operator because I'm managing this machine. So my role of occupation should change and accordingly my remuneration should go up, but none of this happens, but it's only the work intensity that increases. Now, with regard to job quality and industrial relations, I think there are two points that I want to quickly make. Very clearly what you see is that there's very high work intensification that's happening in India and South Africa as a result of these systems coming in. Now we did not observe this in the European cases and the reasons for it, because there we also had a second problem that whenever we were doing the worker interviews, the managers were sitting right there. So we could not get the information that we needed. So there's the second problem that we faced. But I think what is very worrying with these practices that are coming in is, you know, the field is very well set. The companies are very well set with these work processes. There are very clear monitoring surveillance equipments right there. Now you see that it is not really used in the European context. Part of it could be due to certain rules and regulations that are there. While in India, where the labor is surplus, what you find interestingly is that they are still softer. They try to catch, they monitor, survive, catch the workers who are not performing. They send them for retraining. While in South Africa, there's punishment. And very clearly, there's a shift from regular workers to non-regular workers. Now there's a big issue and there, there, it also has a huge impact on the social environment uh, and the social interactions of many of these workers in these countries. Now, with regard to the industrial relations, one thing that we very clearly found out was low levels of involvement of trade unions. That was one of our motivations to come and present here mm -hmm. to see how is it that we can actually get trade unions more engaged in this issue mm -hmm. and try to push for it. Now, with regard to healthcare, I think I'm going to uh, sort of uh, skip this because I want to say some stories here on healthcare and how it affects job quality and industrial relations. Now, with regard to job quality, there's a huge impact that is there. You know, when we think about algorithmic management, we always think about low-end workers, right? Those at the delivery or those uh, at the shop floor and all of it. What's very interesting with the healthcare that is happening is this is affecting high-skilled workers. It is affecting doctors. So you find that, Anaruza was talking about the WhatsApp, right? Now, what they have done is that in one of the hospitals that we were looking at, you have a WhatsApp group which actually uh, captures all the discussion that is happening when they go to the patient. And this information is left public for the entire group and other groups that can see. If there is a mistake done by a doctor, the normal course would be that this is in the log sheets or this is somewhere in the computer mm -hmm. and those who are required would go and check it out. But now it becomes very public. And you know, if a mistake is done, everybody knows which doctor does it. Now it could lead to penalization. It could lead to punishment. It could lead to many other things, but at the moment, it's not very clear to what extent this is being implemented. The second thing that we see saw so with the predictive data analytic tool that has come in a big way is dashboards. Now, most hospitals have come up with these dashboards where they are monitoring uh, how many patients the doctors are seeing. Okay, if you see not only the patients, but what is the kind of diagnosis you're doing, 
What is the kind of medication at time spent? What is the medication you're giving? How does it differ across different doctors for the same kind of an ailment? And all of this is being collected without the doctors being uh, knowing about it. And then it goes to the board of directors who has full access to all of this. And at that level, a lot of decisions are being made. So, you know, this is where it becomes quite problematic. And a third example I want to say is that in South Africa, where the doctors could actually charge the fees for the patients, they have moved to a different model. It's called as a digital healthcare platform model where the idea, and you have to think that all of this is coming from the idea that let's improve the service delivery. Let's improve the, you know, the way the patient experiences all of this. And as a result, they have moved from a doctor deciding the fee to a global fee, which is again based on time spent, how many patients do you see, what kind of medication do you give, and all of that. So that has led to a huge work intensification. And on this one, I just want to add the note on this one, because one of the criteria that they use in the South African case is also the time of recovery of the patient. So normally, if you have like patient, patients with comor comorbidity, now you would tend not to get them, not to have them, because they will take yes. longer to recover. And so it's going to affect basically your ranking and your scoring and therefore your fee. Right. So this is just to give an idea. So just to conclude that what we found was a significant contrast in the cases between Europe and uh, India and South Africa. And there's very clear possibility. The stage is very clearly set for monitoring and surveillance, which are very clearly embedded within the technologies that are being used. And well, it depends. It's a matter of time to see how these impacts are going to take place. Very clearly, we see negative implications in the non-European cases. And to an extent, as we argue, that it is because of the institutional and regulatory framework. Now, I think we feel very clearly that there's a very clear need for trying to see how unions can actually engage in, a pro in this process much more proactively because now it is not really, there's no consultation process. Mm -hmm. Things are being implemented without taking anything into consideration and that's very important. And I just want to conclude with this one because I do want to say that this kind of a research is very difficult to do but very important. If we are to go forward with regard to any sort of a regulation regarding algorithm management at regular workplaces, because, okay, I'll stop, uh, I'll stop yes. by saying that. Can I, can I, that was the, yeah. I'll just quickly add something, because this, I think it's very important, you know, to conclude also what you were saying about what trade unions can do. And one of the things that we find that is that, well, they're not doing much at the moment, as for the time being, and they're not particularly concerned. And when they are concerned, they are mostly concerned about regulating the effects of mm -hmm. it. They are not at all thinking that they actually can be part of the discussion, part of the discussion of the application, the integration, the development of the technology. And this is very much related to the presentation that we, I don't know if oh, for the people who were listening to the presentation that, um, I'm so David. sorry. <laughs> okay, David, thank you very much. I had forgotten, sorry. Uh, Gave when was talking about what is the importance of being informed if you cannot actually you cannot mm -hmm. act on it and this is basically uh, something similar and okay since we're here I'm, I'm gonna keep launching my campaign about digital public infrastructure <laughs> that is what we need for trade unions to have access for you know employer and employee discuss about the real conditions that are happening on technology and with that we conclude thanks thank you very much Jonas, I move to you, and hopefully that will leave us a bit of time at the end, if you stick to like 10, 12 minutes. So, how do I... Um, So thank you very much. And for the interest of time, I will speed up a little bit 
the first part of the presentation. If anyone wants to know more about the Fair Work Project, we can discuss during the Q&A. So my name is Jonas Valencia. I'm a researcher at the Fair Work Project. I'm speaking on behalf of our cloud work and translation and transcription teams. And I'm talking about the labor conditions on cloud work platforms. So starting saying about what am I saying cloud work and Valeria is saying online labor markets and probably we will hear web-based ghost work and many terms about that. So this is still uh, a discussion regarding terminologies and concepts and at the Fair Work Project we use this term cloud work that basically means the work that can be performed regardless of where you are. It's different from geographically tethered platforms. And we have those still nascent estimations about the number of workers. Uh, this classic uh, piece of, from Cassie et al, uh, estimating 163 million. And this World Bank report from last year with a wide range from 154 and 435 million. Uh, the Fair Work Project is now in 38 countries. Uh, we are funded by the JZ and also by trade unions, uh, the Ford Foundation and other funders. And so far we have performed over 600 platform ratings, almost 300 platform changes because we assess the platform economy, but we also push platforms to implement changes According to our principles, interviewed over 5,000 workers, and we've been having media coverage and uh, generating academic publications as well. Uh, the Fair Work Project engaged with a diverse set of stakeholders. We engage with policymakers, but basically we engage as well with unions. We promote uh, joint initiatives, meetings, and we are also discussing with uh, unions about the cloud workers' challenges. What do we do? Basically, uh, the Fair Work Project developed uh, at the ILO in discussion with labor advocates, experts, uh, unions, and other policymakers. We have part of them here, what we call the principles of fair work. And we have a set of principles for on-location platforms and a set of principles for cloud work platforms as well. We developed recently a set of principles for AI and work, and my colleague Lola Britton will present them tomorrow. So if you want to know more about them, you can attend uh, the panel. But basically what you, we are assessing here are five dimensions. So pay conditions, contracts, management, and representation. Uh, our principles and thresholds include aspects such as if the workers receive the minimum wage, if the platforms have measures to uh, protect workers from risks and harms, if the contracts are clear and available, if there are communication channels and appeals process, and if the representation and free association is not inhibited, and if platforms engage with unions and workers associations. Uh, each of these five principles is, uh, is uh, transformed into two thresholds. So we have a scale from zero to 10, and we rank the platforms according to the evidence that we gather. So basically what our scorings are saying is not necessarily that the platforms are not doing something, but that we couldn't find evidence that the platforms are doing something. And we gather data from desk research, from workers interviews and from managers. And I'm talking more specifically about our last scorings from cloud work and translation and transcription campaign. So we interviewed over 1,000 workers in 94 countries in 25 platforms. So going to the findings, and I still have five minutes, so, so far going good. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> what I would like to say is that each of the Fair Work reports has as, its, uh, as the main result what we call the league table. And what the league table is showing is that we have a diverse of platforms, uh, measures and approaches to labor relations. So we can see here, and it's very important, I don't know if you can see very, very small minimum standards of fair work. So our 10 out of 10, we're not saying that this is a perfect platform. We're saying that this platform is achieving the minimum standards of fair work. And that's why this league table sometimes can be a little depressing. I know we, all, we also feel that because Unfortunately, it shows that 
some platforms are moving to respect those minimum standards and to meet those minimum standards. We had our first 10 out of 10 as a translation platform called Creative Words, but also we have many platforms that or meet only half of the thresholds or they don't meet any of the thresholds. And this shows uh, in consonance of what we are discussing in this panel and in the former panels, the problem that we see in the platform economy. So this is how we show, and I'm going to explore this a little more. I know that the it's hard to read, but basically how uh, our scorings are distributed according to the principles. And we can see here that we could grant more points uh, in the principle for conditions and in the principle for management. Uh, in translation and transcription as well, uh, but now I would like to go to the findings and explore them a little bit uh, in my last four minutes. So first of all, uh, in the principle of fair payment, we assess if the platforms have measures to ensure workers are paid. It sounds weird, but unfortunately, we, were, we just listened to a presentation about unpaid labor, and this is the reality of digital labor platforms, and that's why we assess which measures those platforms have in place. This can be an escrow. This can be a mediation team to sort out when a client return uh, work. So platforms, they adopt a different set of measures. And unfortunately, uh, our survey from last year showed that 25% uh, of workers experience non-payment. Non but and when we're talking about non-payment, we're talking about explicitly explicit situations in which the worker performed the work and was not paid for it. In addition to that, we also have the unpaid labor. And when we consider unpaid labor, 8.5 hours a week, those the cloud workers spend on unpaid labor, and a little less, 5.3 hours per week, translation and transcription platforms, because part of those platforms have algorithm management systems in which they allocate the, the tasks automatically. So the worker doesn't need to keep searching for that. So very in line with the presentation that we've seen, in our case, normally what workers are doing during this unpaid labor time, they're searching for clients, they are working on their profiles, they're preparing themselves from tasks, they are dealing with over demand clients, and the, of course, they're not compensated by that. Another important point related to payment is we assess if those platforms or have policies ensuring uh, uh, the minimum wage or if they provide us with data that shows that they pay the minimum wage. And only six out of 25 platforms, we could find evidence that they do one of the other. Only four out of 25 platforms have a policy ensuring the minimum wage. Uh, when we talk about competition as well, another topic that uh, it was already uh, discussed here, 68.5% uh, of our workers heard in our survey reported that competition increased since they joined the platform. So they are having, we have more workers, more competition, and usually this results in fewer jobs for those workers. When we talk about health and safety, only five out of 25 platforms adopt some kind of clear measure to address risks and harms. This could be, for instance, platforms in which the worker, uh, the like a sensitive content or task is flagged to that worker. Or if the worker has a problem or is harassed or something, there is a help center, there is a team that can support that worker and even uh, adopt some uh, punitive action against the client or requester. Uh, the contracts, uh, we assess, for instance, if the contract is clear, if the contract is available to workers, not necessarily this happens all the time, uh, if there are uh, unfair clauses or not, and unfortunately on cloud work platforms, it is a reality, uh, a contract full of clauses exempting those platforms from liability, and this is in line with the discussions that we have uh, uh, in the morning. And we saw that only six out of 25 platforms met all of our standards related to clear, available, and fair contracts. When we talk about management, this was one of the best, but still 
uh, we're talking about less than half of the platform. So nine out of 25 have dense that they have communication channels, abuse process, 13 out of 25 adopted and discrimination policies, only six out of 25 uh, disclose, disclose information about the methods to allocate work, including algorithm transparency, and only three out of 25 committed to a process of dispute resolution in which workers have access to independent uh, advocate. And this means when platforms acknowledge, for instance, that they can engage with workers associations or unions. So these are two codes I'm um, finishing, Inieska, and it, they are Thank showing you. basically the reality that we see on those platforms. So the first code saying that the experience with customer support the workers feel hopeless and with no power comparing to the clients and comparing to the platform. And another is a micro worker from Brazil saying that this person is not finding jobs and there is this discrimination as uh, the previous presentation highlighted and the differences in terms of geography. Finally, our report from last year highlighted the work of micro workers and the worker behind AI supply chains those platforms, they have the worst grades. And this we can see that the payment, uh, the average payment is up to $0.15 per hour. And we see a lot of problems regarding non-payment and other stuff like that. So I'd like to thank you and I'll be happy to follow up on all those findings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for keeping the time. Thank you for all the excellent presentations and for indeed sticking to time, uh, just condensing your excellent research into very narrow time frame, which leaves us with 10 minutes for discussion. Um, so I, I think I will just collect some questions. Uh, I saw one hand up, if you can just briefly introduce yourself and second hand. So let's start. Yeah. Um, sorry, maybe Mike actually. Uh, yeah, we might need that. Hi, I'm Six Silverman. My question is for Jonas. If you could, I don't know if the slides are still available, but on your slide with the last quotes, you had somebody from Spain, which, as last I checked, has not exited the European Union. Uh, therefore, the platform to business uh, regulation should apply. So it should not be legal for them to be dismissed without any appeals process. There was a presentation in the previous session about the platform to business regulation. So my, my question is, are these platforms even following the laws that we already have on the books? No. no. That's the no. Answer. Great, thanks. <laughs> yes. We, we, we answer. So while the microphone travels to An Andrea, um, I'll just say, I mean, there's riders law in Spain and um, just, just the enforcement is quite poor. So that's what more regulations, unfortunately. Hi, uh, Andrew Green. This question is for Valeria and Nora. So it was a really great presentation. And uh, like any great presentation, I want more information. And I, I think the one thing that was missing from yours that I'm very curious of, can you give an example of the type of work that was sort of typical, um, what, what the actual tasks or things that the worker and was contracting over and sort of maybe some of a, examples of the developing countries and developed countries um, where, where you were doing this. Thanks. Um, we have one gentleman in the front and then one question at the very end. Hi, my name is Stefan Lücking from the Hans Petter Foundation. I have a question for Uma and Anna Rosa. Um, I find it very interesting what you said about WhatsApp um, in the workplace because um, in the projects we conducted in hospitals in Germany, um, the problem was that the standardization by these hospital information systems was not working very well. And um, so I guess that um, the use of uh, WhatsApp is also related to this um, not working standard system. Yes. Yes. And um, also maybe also to um, the question of surveillance, what you said about the critical points, if um, a myth, um, error or mistake by the... Um, by medicine is um, um, this, uh, covered in WhatsApp. It's not as official if it, uh, as if it's covered in this um, hospital information system. Um, and okay, I, that's maybe just a comment. And uh, maybe to, to um, Valeria and um, Nora, is there other similar um, 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 
questions of not working algorithmic uh, management systems in other places. Um, there was one more hand at the very end in the last row, and perhaps I'll... And then still very quickly. Okay, so uh, Victoria Desclova. Uh, I have a question for the last presenter, Mr. Dr. Valente. Um, so one of the uh, one of the uh, the um, criteria that you used uh, to measure fair work was uh, the idea of competition. Uh, can you say something about uh, how you operationalize that concept? Because you mentioned something about um, promoting job stability and so forth, and limiting competition. Could you say something more a bit ab about that? Thank you so much. There's one person at the end of the same row, and then Sylvia, and we give the floor back to the speakers. Uh, hello, um, I'm Philip Freeman. I'm a, a research trainee at the ETY. I have a question for Anna Rosa and uh, Uma. Uh, you talked about uh, upskilling in the logistics uh, sector in uh, developing countries. Um, is Do you think there's a sort of uh, upskilling ceiling uh, beyond which algorithmically managed workers can't go beyond in the sense that by its very nature, algorithmic management centralizes knowledge, skills, um, makes uh, job tasks uh, repetitive, easily datafied, et cetera. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, all of you. I have a um, question uh, about Laura presentation. Because for me, what's striking as a lawyer is that your presentation technically shows lack of control on, uh, from the part of workers in determining many of your dimen the dimension you show, right? Price setting, condition of work, so lack of agency. And this is exactly what for what Ludovic say 800 plus days, the policy making the EU level has been trying to yeah, convey about whether there is yes or no control from the platform on the workers and your research, can you confirm this? Is, is it showing that there is lack of agency from the worker? It would be extremely interesting. And also in connection to what was said this morning, one of the questions, how can research influence policy making? This is a technical mm -hmm. finding and a fund extremely important. Thank you. Thank you. So perhaps we go with the order of presentations. Is that fine for the last uh, round of comments? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm not the lawyer expert, so this is you, right? Um, of course, it is still a market. So of course you can always as a worker say no, right? So you can say, okay, I'm not doing this job and I'm declining it. So, um, but what I looked at is beyond just, you know, declining everything, um, whether you have some kind of agency um, in influencing those uh, aspects. And uh, what I saw is that in certain, on certain platforms and in certain stages, you don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we share. Uh, I tell my story. <laughs> Anyhow, I think that uh, so regarding the tasks, I think we looked at quite uh, uh, general uh, and well-known tasks. Um, we said it in the in the paper. Uh, so we have administrative support. We have writing. We have translation. We have transcriptions. We have customer services, data analytics and also graphical designers, I would add, uh, and copywriting, IT people. So we have actually not the tiny uh, tasks only, but we really have professionals here. And this is the problem, because these professionals are reporting these kind of things. That means that they, you know, they are exploited, basically, by, by these systems. So... Um, so that's one thing. And the, um, I don't know what Nora, you want to, oh, oh, Uma, uh, so, yeah, yeah. You Maybe want to, you yeah. want to add to something? Yeah. No. No, you uh, mentioned another. Uh, yeah. Because the other question, I didn't get it. Could, could you please repeat? Yeah, I don't know. I'll call it. Aside yeah. for this function and group management in some um, areas where you did your research. Yeah. Uh, but what do you mean for mismanagement? <coughs> <coughs> because, you know, on app, yeah. Yeah, but what's um, that um, tasks are not allocated properly, that um, it's, um, there are, Problems with the algorithm yeah. and how the um, workers deal with these mm. problems. I can probably yeah, ahead, take yeah, that on straight off. So, this is an Upwork platform that we actually have undertaken the surveys. And in the Upwork platform, what it does is it's not completely algorithmically done, you have a human intervention. So, you have the first round 
where it does the matching process. And the matching process also takes into consideration people who have paid fees, bidding for the proposals, trying to have the profile on the top and all of it. And once you have the first 10 applications, then what they do is they sit with the client and they have someone from the Upwork who actually goes on talking to the workers to decide which is the match that takes place. So there's very clear human intervention that is there. But then it doesn't stop there. So there's a huge workflow monitoring process that happens there. Where you know, uh, they it depends upon the projects and it depends upon the task. They have different software, hardware tools that they request the workers to download and have it. And those tools actually take screenshots of when you're working and send it to the client. So that process also is very clearly uh, algorithmically managed. And the final thing that happens is the payments. And there, though Upwork very clearly makes it clear that the client has the money uh, payments in the escrow account so that you know the work is delivered and it doesn't go away. But even there, it's with human intervention very clearly, not with algorithm, they can decide not to make the payment. And they can just say that it falls below the standards that they have. So it's a very interesting human uh, machine interaction that you see throughout the entire process. And just one more thing to answer Andrew, I'd like to say that what we have seen largely in the developing countries, especially on Upwork to a very large extent is a lot of IT software development work. And there, there's a huge bidding process that happens. So, you know, the lowest bidder is the one who gets it. And so that's something that you see increasingly. And there's a lot of project support that comes in and then translation, transcription kind of jobs. But these are not unlike micro tasks, which are short. These are all like huge tasks, which are over a period of number of days or weeks and stuff like that. We can discuss <laughs> yeah, maybe I, I just I just come back to the question about the skilling, upskilling, because this is what you basically, yeah, okay, because the, for example, one of the other example that we saw in the case studies is the cases of nurses in uh, in Europe, where basically nurses because of the hospital information system, they were asked actually to perform tasks that before were sort of like still on the medical doctor side. So there was a, there's been also an upgrading in that case and upskilling in that case, which was not compensated neither by uh, extra money or recognition of uh, a different position. So what you will see is that the, the issue about the skills and relationship with algorithm management goes both way. So you might have that. You need to upskill because you need to learn how the machine works and you need to learn or because, for example, you've been granted a new role as for the cases of nurses, but at the same time, you might have also the opposite. So what you might have is that a previous task, a previous job has been unbundled in simpler tasks. So basically you as a worker, you will find yourself basically in performing something which is repetitive, which is uh, with a very, very um, range of freedom in uh, in the unfolding of the task. And in that case, I mean, you will have a de-skilling as well. And for the, the question about the WhatsApp, you, you wanna take that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, and I just want to say about the upskilling, one more thing that we have observed is that there are limits. Uh, it's not something that it can go on very clearly, both in the logistics and in the healthcare, they're just limits. You know, there's one level where you have the intervention of the machine and the interaction and that's it. But even that is not really recognized and that's been one of the problems. Now, with regard to the WhatsApp, I think you are right that it could be possible that that is happening. But I think it's far more than that because this is very systematic. We just talked to you about WhatsApp, but you know, there's also intervention of OneNote and tablets. And OneNote is also something like you have a form where you have to fill in all the diagnosis that you see, and that doesn't really give the freedom. So there's also a taking away of the autonomy of the doctors as a result okay. of it, because you cannot say really all that you wanted to say because it all has to be in cryptic form. So yeah. that makes it also quite problematic mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. 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 
So you are concluding the panel. Then. <laughs> okay, so thanks uh, about your question. No, they do not respect the law for a bunch of problems that we are discussing in this uh, event. First of all, they treat workers are, as self-employed and all the synonyms that you can imagine to not say worker. Mm -hmm. So they are fiber sellers or whatever. Mm -hmm. Second, we have your question is extremely important to a point that we need to discuss that th there's the jurisdiction problem, especially if, with those co companies, because if we're talking about Upwork or Freelancer or even other companies that are regional like Workan or sorry, Freelancer, or like Terra working in Nigeria, come up in France, the jurisdiction will be always a problem for workers because first of all, the contract that was signed does not allow the worker to enter with a lawsuit. And if the worker can enter with a lawsuit, the worker needs to sue the company in their jurisdiction. So how is the worker going to do that? And some platforms, they add to their country uh, to their contract binding arbitration. So you need to pay it for arbitration. So like it's not an option for workers. So this is a very, very huge problem. About the question of uh, uh, my colleague there, basically what we do is that we have our threshold, the 2.1 that tries to assess unpaid work. So we try to assess the, the average of unpaid work of each platform but also what types of measures platforms employ in order to promote job availability and to reduce competitions. For instance, we have platforms that have implemented waiting lists. Of course, that the workers that want to work on those platforms, they don't like uh, this kind of measures, but we have different measures, including from big platforms like Appen or others that somehow promote that. So we trying to measure the level of competitions, the measures that they adopt, and then uh, we grant a point or not. But if like, uh, I invite all of you, if you were curious about our methodology in our site, fair.work, you can find all the principles and the methodology and know more about that. But I would just like to highlight that uh, I'm very happy to be in this panel, not only because like I'm sharing with, uh, top level experts on the topic, but also because normally the platform work discussions is very ride hailing delivery focused. And we need to look at the cloud workers or web-based workers or whatever you want to call those workers, especially now that we have the discussion on the ILO convention. So this and the, jurisdi the jurisdiction problem is one issue, the pricing, the unpaid labor, and how we're going to coordinate the the directives are lost if we have them, uh, but especially internationally. So this is an issue not only for researchers, but for unions as well. This is something that we've been trying to do in Fair Work. Could I just speak about an unrelated topic for 30 seconds? Um, so the, the next panel started seven minutes ago, so I think we should really, <laughs> but there will be time to, to talk about over cocktails and then okay. tomorrow there will also be some break. So I'm, I'm really sorry for, for cutting this, but no you concluded problem. on an excellent note that we are escalate, we are not giving up, we escalated from the EU level that was not successful to the international mm -hmm. level with the ILO convention. Um, coming next. So with that positive uh, thought, thank you very much again for coming, for presenting your excellent research. So please join me in the round of applause. So shall we start with the... Uh, did, did you call people from the outside maybe or... Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we will start here. Um, uh, so I'm very pleased to be chairing this uh, this last uh, session. Uh, the timekeeping is really challenging in this conference, but I hope we will manage. Uh, so we're in the competitive at all costs, the disruptive business model of platform based work. And we have uh, four very interesting cases, uh, papers on case study research. Uh, so uh, let me introduce, well, first, um, sorry, I'm uh, <laughs> Dominika Polkowska and uh, Bartosz Mika. So Dominika uh, is an associate professor of sociology at Maria Cur Marie Curie uh, Slodowska University in Poland. And Bartosz is also professor at University of Dansk, 
uh, in sociology. Uh, so the floor is yours and please, yeah, let's try to keep it yeah. to 13 minutes okay. if possible. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we are going to uh, talk today uh, about uh, Poland. And uh, we are going, I, I'm going to be the first and then uh, Bartosz will continue. So first of all, uh, I want to say that uh, we started our research on platform work uh, in 2018. Uh, so far, we have focused mainly on worker side. So we talked with them to know their perspective on, on their work. This 2018 is very important in regard to uh, what we are going to talk about later. And at the beginning, we couldn't understand the way Uber uh, operates in Poland comparing to Western countries, because it was a little bit different. And today uh, we will show what is unique from our perspective uh, in a uh, right hailing model uh, in Poland and what the role of fleet partners are uh, within. Okay, so to be fast, this is what we are going to talk. So um, first of all, as I said, we did uh, a lot of research and we have already uh, uh, published few papers on this topic, again, mainly showing the workers' perspective, uh, less uh, talking about model, and we are going to talk about this model uh, today. So what is important uh, and uh, what I want to start uh, with uh, is first Uber uh, entry to Poland, it was 2014. And between 2014 and 2016, Uber operated outside an illegal framework in Poland. And this was gold period for, for everyone except the state. Our uh, interviewees said that this was the best time when they were uh, operating uh, well, uh, not legally and not illegally in, in the same moment. Uh, but in 2016, finally, Polish Minister of Finance uh, 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 said that, okay, uh, realized that there are platforms. <laughs> and uh, they decided, I mean, the ministry decided that uh, work on demand platform uh, business require registration. So uh, in other words, to be a platform worker, you should be self-employed. However, and in, from this moment, it should look like in other Western countries, but uh, it's different. As you may see, uh, there is intermediary between, between driver and Uber. And uh, this intermediary appeared in 2016. And as we talked with drivers and fleet partners as well, they told us that the idea of uh, appearing fleet partner in the system came from Uber itself. Uh, so it was their, uh, their this, well, not decision, their thought how to again bypass the existing law and uh, those intermediary fleet partners appeared, but Bartosz will talk uh, more about them later. So uh, with help uh, of fleet partners, uh, Uber drivers could continue or platform workers in general could continue uh, their work. Uh, however, there was no uh, relation apart from uh, app and nothing else between driver and the platform. All connections were made between fleet partner and Uber and uh, in 2018, that's why I uh, said it was important date. Um, uh, more uh, the, the the again the regulation changed because uh, it was the moment that uh, uh, 
again, Uber pretending to comply uh, with uh, regulations and it began to require a license. And the license were uh, from partners. So in this moment, each driver uh, had to be somehow uh, related to fleet partner who has the license. And between uh, 2017 and 2019, uh, in the, on the legislation side, uh, the government worked on amendment to the Road Transport Act that was finally announced uh, 1st of January and entered to force 2000, uh, 2029. That is uh, called Lex Uber. Why it is uh, called uh, Lex Uber? Uh, it is, uh, again, um, what I want to stress, it's in terms uh, of formal status of Uber, uh, it has achieved more in Poland than in other um, other country uh, because this this law uh, generally um, uh, introduced uh, platform and drivers platform drivers uh, the same as a standard taxi drivers so Uber uh, started from bypassing. Polish law and functioning outside any regulations and ended up with platform drivers being formally equal to, to taxi, to traditional taxi drivers. Uh, so uh, one, one example uh, of this spatial status uh, in Poland or Uber in Poland is that Uber became uh, an official partner of uh, shopping airport uh, so uh, it is the same it is the only company and the second is the normal traditional taxi company who can enter uh, uh, everywhere in shopping airport so it shows very very uh, important role of uber uh, uh, in poland uh, why it is so uh, important Another example of this was during this Lex Uber negotiations that it was, as far as I remember, 11 version of this law uh, because uh, they couldn't find uh, a solution. And in a moment, uh, the, in negotiations, uh, uh, was also involved a US ambassador in Poland who wrote a letter to Ministry uh, of Infrastructure uh, lobbying for Uber. Uh, so uh, in many, uh, in general, uh, we could say that uh, this new legal framework reduces the requirements for passenger safety throughout the entire uh, ride hailing sector. And uh, the license requirements are the same for taxi and uh, Uber drivers. Uh, and what's the role of a uh, fleet partner? We'll talk about it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, fleet partners were crucial to, to stay the platform in the business, to, to keep the platforms in the business in the first place. So uh, if our interpretation is correct, probably uh, the platform, right hailing platform at least should change significantly. If not the existence of fleet partners, uh, they were, so we can, we can describe them as a uh, gatekeepers to, to this uh, business. And uh, almost all of our interlocutors during our study, uh, so the drivers we um, surveyed uh, were in some connection with fleet partners and what was surprising for us was the fact that the the way of arrangement between those entities were very different so it wasn't a one kind of relation established in the whole business but uh, they were really uh, different and sometimes bizarre like this Uzhichanya contract we put on the slide which was derivated from real estate market and shouldn't be 
in place uh, in rate hailing industry at all. Uh, we have also, of course, rental uh, car rental agreement, which is quite obvious. If they are uh, fleet partners, they have a fleet of cars, so they rent the cars. But sometimes we even find examples when driver rent his or her car to fleet partners. So, so the, the arrangement was really uh, surprising sometimes. And we have, of course, mandate contract and self-employment contract, but only occasionally. Uh, and one during five years of study, only one example uh, of contract of employment. So, so it was really something special there. Uh, and we are still not sure if the uh, uh, driver we talked with was uh, meaning the employment contract, yeah, because he was a foreigner. So we are uh, not completely sure. I tried to uh, clarify this issue, but. It's still some question mark here. Uh, so now the fleet partners are recognized in Polish law, as Dominika said, uh, in Uberlex, but also they uh, gonna show in uh, European Union directive. We talked today a lot about this, uh, but not about fleet partners. They exist in this law as well. So they are quite uh, quite familiar for, for the legislation. So we can ask the question, uh, well, okay, you switched it. Uh, that we have a double exploitation by a platform and, and uh, fleet partner, or simply accommodating to local environment. And uh, you can see on a slide argument on both. I think that from the side of exploitation, the most important fact is that the drivers do all the work or almost all the work. So si simply, fleet partners are living for the fees from. Uh, drivers, so drivers pay two fees for uh, to the platform and to the uh, fleet partners, uh, and this middleman, the, the middle institution here, so the fleet partners aren't lowering the precariousness, so they didn't do not change the precariousness of work simply. So we could appreciate that kind of institution if they would change, uh, for example, digital control or algorithmic control or or simply precariousness of work, but they do not do it. Uh, on the other hand, they are crucial here. They, they are valid for the system. Uh, they are, in the end, the local entities. So someone who is in, in the arm length, let's say, to the driver. So, so someone who can be easily reached and in contact uh, by the driver. Uh, and they are quite common, uh, not only in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, but mostly, we, we at least we have evidence from Central and Eastern Europe, but there are examples in the literature that they exist also in Germany, for example, in Netherlands, so also, also in Western Europe. Yeah, so uh, we don't want to... Yeah, yeah, I will go to the conclusion. If we, uh, we, we don't want to decide is the double exploitation or... Uh, or accommodation, we uh, would like to propose the, the expression of the maturity of platform, at least right hailing platforms or work on, work on demand platforms. We are stick to the idea that the platforms are something uh, innovative and new. Even during this conference, yeah, we, we frame them like a future of work. Yeah, we are in this future already. Yeah. So, so they, they have 15 years already. Yeah, Uber has, or at least three now, it's the oldest in Europe, right? Hailing in the uh, company, it's 15 years old today. Yeah, and we can find evidence that that kind of arrangement, so up mediated, right? Hailing existed even before it. Uh, and we can go even further in time to, to the 90s and find out that the switch of power in the system, in the taxi industry, was in place in the late 80s. So switch of power in the favor of owners and, and investors. So they are, uh, they are quite mature already. They finally get profitable. So, so a few years, a few days ago even, uh, Uber share report uh, stressing that last year it was globally profitable, first time during its history. 
we have, of course, uh, legislation recognition. We mentioned it already. Uh, this this equalization of standards uh, between taxi drivers and uh, Uber drivers or app drivers in general. Uh, and we have the professionalization of work. So during our uh, studies, we didn't find um, much examples of uh, people using the idle assets like was in the beginning of the existence of platforms uh, and doing only additional work here. They, they simply lived for it. And even if they supplemented other income, they treat it as a, a profession simply. Okay, I will end here because we are running out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for keeping the time, really. And uh, this... Uh, and, and this reflection, this last reflection about how uh, platforms are so mature as well, links with the, the case you presented, uh, which reminds of subcontracting chains as well, right? The fact of, uh, we could speak of platform chain or, or um, uh, reshuffle of, of these uh, logics uh, in how capitalism uh, structures itself. Anyway, so now let's turn to Turkey, the Turkish case, uh, Burak Seyland and Asuman Goxlel, I hope I pronounced this correctly, from Middle East Technical University uh, in, in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, they, Ankara? Ankara? Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Ankara, uh, uh, Turkey, they, they um, are presenting this uh, uh, case study on, on the contextualization uh, of platform economy in the Turkish uh, environment. Thanks. Uh, hello everyone. It's very difficult to be the last ones, so thank you for your patience. <laughs> we will try to be very brief, really. It's good that we are in a case study um, um, from panel, I have to say. So in that sense, we'll be presenting the Turkish case to you. Uh, we know that it is um, not peculiar to Turkey. It's the case everywhere, and we have been discussing it from the very uh, morning this today and uh, everywhere in different literature. Uh, we know that uh, regarding the uh, food delivery, neither the motor courier job nor the self-employment model is uh, peculiar to Turkey. However, uh, in spite of the existence of variety of case studies from all over the world, we haven't seen much from the Turkish case. And uh, we don't, of course, claim that we are unique in terms of the food delivery uh, process, labor processes of the motor couriers. But we say that we have some peculiarities to share with you on the basis of the field work that uh, mainly Burak uh, already uh, conducted in the Turkish case. So um, we'll be presenting you a segment of that uh, today with regards to labor control uh, regarding the food delivery practices of three platform companies. Hmm, okay. Uh, three platform companies, uh, maybe some of them you know because they expanded considerably. They have been established before the pandemic, but they took the advantage of the pandemic and then they, they grew bigger and bigger and bigger in terms of their market share, consumer potential. They received lots of uh, venture capital. They, two of them became even uh, decacorns and then uh, they expanded also geographically to Europe and probably to the U US also. And of course, uh, they also needed a work workforce uh, to deliver for them. Uh, we don't know the exact number of the uh, motor couriers in Turkey, but uh, they are talking about more than 100,000 people all over the country, different forms of it, but of course working for the platforms also. There are also some other platforms, but we have chosen those three uh, in a comparative way. Uh, our argument actually uh, is that um, in terms of the labor control, there is hybrid, uh, hybrid despotism in two senses regarding the motor careers in um, working with the platforms in Turkey. Uh, we can contextualize these hybrid characteristics in terms of the control by management. It is hybrid because we have the algorithmic management, of course, in place. But contrary to um, the algorithmic management claims that everything is uh, transferred from the manager to the algorithm, we can also find the involvement of the human beings in the process in all three different platforms. So it is hybrid uh, managerial control over the workers. The second um, aspect of hybrid despotism is the control by the market. And we have seen um, that in many different case studies, and there are some specificities also coming from the Turkish case, particularly regarding the 
uh, characteristics of the local labor market dynamics and the social uh, relations of production in the Turkish case. Uh, we will be presenting those uh, to you, but before getting into that, this is the research sample. Uh, the first one was conducted by Burak for, her, uh, for his uh, master's thesis, and then we expanded it again with new people uh, from the same companies uh, by the end of 2023, and we still uh, continue conducting uh, interviews, and we also conduct uh, interviews regarding the resistance and collective representativeness representation, but it's the topic of another uh, presentation. Now, Burak is going to uh, present the uh, control by management, hybridity of that part, and then I'll be talking again regarding the control by the market. Uh, you can hear me? Okay. So I will talk about the managerial control under four different titles. Uh, as, you, as you know, the, it begins with the delivery process in Korea's case. Uh, what we have witnessed in the case study is that on contrary, for instance, in Belgium, self-employment case or in Instacart case, uh, we see that couriers get their delivery instructions one step at a time, and they can only see the restaurant's location at first. Uh, and second, couriers must follow the route set by the algorithm, which is a very specific route. And third, maybe the most important aspect is uh, the couriers do not have freedom to choose in between the assigned orders. So I remind you, this is a self-employed platform work. And uh, so this ra raises the question, uh, on what basis the algorithm functions here? So because uh, we see most of the studies on the recent literature is based on the idea of algorithmic control, that mostly operates to persuade or incentivize the courier to take more deliveries using the techniques like dynamic pricing, right? So, but despite the power asymmetry, this structure implies an interplay between the platform and the courier. The courier is someone that has the freedom of choice and who can build strategies regardless, I say the power asymmetry again, and pick certain locations, prepare spreadsheets, restaurants, pick which restaurants to go, etc. But in Turkey, we witness, on the contrary, uh, this algorithmic functions uh, is based on limiting these strategic 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 choices, uh, not to persuade them. So, uh, which conflicts with the idea behind the platform work itself. Uh, next, I will uh, discuss the, I will briefly uh, tell you about the uh, findings regarding rewards and sanction mechanism. So, I mean, uh, again, we witness uh, very specific, in very specific case studies that in uh, US, if couriers reject orders, four orders in a row, uh, they get a warning, etc. In Turkey, this grip is much more tighter. If you ignore a call, uh, ignore a delivery for eight minutes, you receive an automatic call by the platform. And if you don't uh, still confirm uh, the delivery, your, your 90 minute slot is closed. And if you repeat this, you can lose the entire day or maybe week. And uh, the other disciplinary uh, system is the adaptation scores. Uh, which has several components and which is very gamified with ranks, with uh, color systems. If you, uh, you, you, if you are delivering fast, you are in green. If you are not, you are in purple. So again, what we found uh, is different, uh, conflicting with the recent literature is uh, the gamification. Uh, we see the, uh, across multiple levels in Turkey but this time beyond just motivating couriers with elements akin to gambling, et cetera, uh, engaging in workplace games. In context of Turkey, it serves to penalize couriers. And the third, I will very briefly skip this. And uh, the Trendyol case, you see 63 hours. This is weekly, by the way, not monthly. If you don't fulfill 
90 of uh, 63 of 90 hours a week uh, your slots are closed completely and you have to work up uh, 24 20 first 12 jars defined 30 uh, of 12 jars and there is a system of absenteeism if you let's say have a 15 minutes break sign off the platform calls you are you okay what happened to you like uh, are you going to come back we need you for delivery in 12 jars and so in in Gitter, this is i only wrote it we go uh, which is a mistake in Gitter's case uh, they don't even the couriers don't even pick the shifts themselves so you I, they either pick 8 10 or 12 hours shifts and i will come to the maybe the most important point uh, this is very peculiar, I think, to Turkish case. So, so here we witness the the blend of algorithmic management with human management, with supervisors with extensive power, including termina termination of contracts by will, and uh, the operation managers can issue warnings to those claim they can't work. They can label these couriers as dissidents as uh, excuse makers and fulfill reports resulting by uh, termination. And uh, the operation manager also writes the shifts, work shifts, and decides the working areas. And with the MXCPT, you know, uh, there is this human dispatcher we witness in case of gorillas, this team leader. In Turkish case, uh, the uh, human joker figure called team leader has this uh, immense amount of authority you see some of them on the screen this is only like a, even not even half uh, the so we, we witness in turkish case that the <laughs> the platforms evolved the human dispatcher that uh, coordinates the warehouse into someone operate with algorithmic functions that creates an intermediary model that he can he has a different login system of delivery hero and he can uh, track the courier he can call the courier he can do literally anything so yeah this is uh, i will skip uh, i will leave it to okay advice mm -hmm. This was the managerial part. And then, of course, the second aspect of control is control by the market. Uh, you can easily see two components of control by the market on the screen, reserve army of labor. Actually, we use it versus surplus population because what we realized in the Turkish case was that uh, those working at the platforms at uh, food delivery motor couriers are usually um, young or middle-aged men, Turkish citizens, not really Although Turkey has so many uh, refugees, immigrants, it's not the case for those that we have been uh, interviewing or at least working with the platforms because it's probably more informal side of the story for the immigrants. So in that sense, we are talking about a, 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 um, the case of uh, structural unemployment for the uh, national population. And in a country where you have high levels of unemployment, I will show you very briefly the numbers, and uh, where the non-employment is a norm. Yes, among the young ladies, but also among the discouraged workers, etc. So uh, one reason why you will see Turkey at the fourth from the top here is because that um, many people are considered as a part of the non-employed, so they are out of the labor market, so that they are not in the unemployment calculations. So you can see that. And with regards to needs, uh, you see that it's also very high um, in numbers. So you can easily imagine that uh, those platforms are depending uh, on a massive labor, uh, a massive army, uh, reserve army of labor. Uh, that they can use to discipline also the others. Uh, and um, also we have to see that uh, platforms could absorb this massive unemployed. Uh, he could also be very easily uh, replaceable uh, regarding the size of the people. The second aspect is the economic dependency on the platforms because one characteristic from our sample shows that those people, as Brock already said, they work 12, 14 hours per day. 
Uh, they are usually working with one single platform. They can change platforms, but they are not simultaneously working with different platforms because you have seen already the uh, time slots that they have to work, etc. So in that sense, um, they are working with one particular um, platform for long hours. And here you see that uh, in Turkey, for the recent, recent two, three, two, three years, the economic conditions are deteriorating. You can see Turkey at the top, food inflation is extreme. Uh, you can also see the housing prices rent, particularly in the urban uh, areas like Istanbul. You can see it here, skyrocketed. Uh, it's incredible, really. And you can see it's in Turkish, but I put it there also. Working with minimum wage in Turkey is around 57%. Minimum wage is kind of a norm in Turkey for uh, most of the employed people. So in that sense, um, this control mechanism by the uh, market shows that uh, why do they accept to work under such harsh control mechanisms? Because there's huge competition, as Frank Epugliani already mentioned, disciplining uh, market forces, disciplining the uh, workers. In that sense, you cannot leave it because you have lots of debt to pay. You have high inflation, you have to pay rent, which is going five times more than uh, two years ago, etc. So in that sense, we see that market is disciplining, but at the same time, there is kind of the evidence, uh, sorry, two minutes more. Uh, there is a little bit of evidence showing that um, the, the motor careers is uh, accepting those conditions because if they work 14 hours per day, for six days a week, then they can work, uh, they can earn two times more than minimum wage. So self-exploiting themselves, they can as, as uh, self-employed, they can um, earn more than the minimum wage. So it's kind of a, also there is a flexibility aspect there because they used to work as waitresses in restaurants, etc. But now they have kind of a freedom to work 14 hours per day, uh, 60 <laughs> hours per week, something like that. So they say it themselves too. One small thing that I cannot go into details now, which is a very, okay, that, I, I skipped the role of the state, but if you want, Sorry. we can talk about it. These are the mm -hmm. conclusions. So I will very like, uh, like uh, it's already uh, kind of concluded, but I will like very shortly uh, talk about, okay, what does all of this mean? Like uh, what, what makes it peculiar is, First thing is we uh, we see that the algorithmic management is affected uh, very much affected by the local factors because if you have massive demand and supply to match, you need a human force, very disciplinary human force, uh, and you need to equip some kind of a traditional uh, ways to uh, you need to blend them with algorithm to uh, match this and which evolves it to algorithmic despotism to hybrid despotism uh, we can call it like that and as uh, as like we mentioned the, the the courier job in turkey began as a waiting room as an economic compensation uh, in covid after covid but it turns into the escape room to escape the traditional jobs of managerial control but it remains as a, a major uh, thing and it's uh, yeah, then the careers are simply degraded uh, into machine like units that deliver us the. It's very pessimistic. I can see it from your yes, face. But yeah, that's Sorry it. Yeah. That <laughs> thank day. you for the. Thank uh, you. Thank you, for thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for a fascinating presentation. Uh, and uh, now we. I'm sorry, I really don't like this role, but no, <laughs> we no, need no. to. <laughs> Um, so now let's go to Pedro Mendoza, uh, who's an associate professor of uh, work and employment at Heriot Watt University. I hope I'm not wrong there. Um, and again, continuing with the food delivery, but uh, other very concrete cases. I really liked actually that now we see exactly what it means for workers and the labor process. So, so Pedro, the floor is yours. Sure. If you uh, do, I have a, you can uh, change. Yeah, you so now. Uh, you can see my uh, my notes. That would be useful because my computer just died. Oh. So, so. <laughs> so, the, uh, so this presentation is about uh, how informal work uh, emerges in food delivery. Thank you. Uh, how informal work um, uh, emerges in food delivery and how 
um, undocumented workers are um, used by platforms and condoned in this um, sector in the UK. This is uh, based uh, research in the UK. So we all know about what uh, platform uh, platforms and platform work is, but uh, so platform platforms are seen as key creators, and the uh, lay uh, suggests that they exist they existed within a platform architecture. Where so I'm going to go really quickly on this because we all know about this, and some of that has been covered already. Uh, so organizational design, where where work is uh, flexibilized and optimized. So to uh, uh, easy the control and monitoring processes there. In terms of legal uh, platforms, use the employment um, contract as not employment contract, the engagement agreement as a as independent contractors for careers and the technological aspect of, as well. Um, in terms of how um, workers are, you know controlled and what we have uh, just discussed now and heard about now. So this research is about how these three aspects here kind of interlink and integrate themselves to understand, to, to see the emergence of in informalization of work. And uh, uh, but before anything, what exactly informalization is, uh, Sassen tells us that is a, um, an emergent business practice in contemporary capitalism that is not uh, empirically uh, very, um, that is very widespread in Britain. And since 2016, businesses using informal labor practices annual gen generate 10 to 12% in Britain's GDP using uh, two and a half million workers. Um, and we can see this in hand car washes and nail bars traditional traditionally uh, um, uh, in the UK, in Britain's economy. The concept of informalization covers broader downgrading of employment and working conditions, where a legitimate and formal employer um, can indeed undertake informal practices of work, for instance, paying under the national minimum wage, or not ensuring that um, uh, health and uh, and safety uh, standards are complied with. Um, so we know that informal gig work does exist, but the question that I'm trying to answer here is uh, to understand the dynamics that enable uh, informal work and employment practice to emerge and to be condoned within the informal, uh, 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 in, within the formal economy, I mean. All right, so, so that's the question actually. So this is based on methods that I've uh, on, on field work that I've conducted since uh, and some colleagues that we've conducted since 2017 and still ongoing because now we have uh, we got a small re uh, funding from Royal Society of Edinburgh uh, to continue this work which is which is interesting uh, and uh, it's nice to continue so but most of the most of the data comes from semi structured interviews with native British uh, couriers, migrant couriers, and uh, undocumented couriers. Uh, mm -hmm. Undocumented migrant couriers, those that don't, don't have uh, the right to work in the UK, but nonetheless work uh, as food delivery. So we uh, uh, want to understand how these platforms, do platforms actually are able to use uh, the exploit undocumented workers uh, in the UK. So we see uh, an interplay uh, between legal condone, condoning at institutional level and a permissive uh, tech and uh, and HR practice uh, and HR practice at company level. Uh, these are the conditions that kind of enable uh, and allow for the use of of undocumented workers in this sector. So uh, follow. Regarding the first one, the first uh, part there that we see there, uh, uh, following a number of court disputes that we have been following in the in the news, there has been um, um, a Supreme Court uh, that ruled against the case from workers 
you know, trying to be categorized as workers, and they have been um, uh, ruled against this uh, case. So they are now uh, categorized as self-employed, and that has been just a ruling in 2000, at the end of 2023, very fresh. Uh, this was based on a specific legality whereby couriers are able to name substitutes to do their work. The second aspect that we see there is uh, permissive technology and HR process, which is quite interesting. I use this word permissive because it kind of contrasts or makes us contrast with that uh, very strict and rigid technology that we see uh, within the same platform. Uh, to control and to uh, monitor the worker's performance, right? So how is, it, is this per permissive in two ways? The free login uh, to, into, the, into, into becoming a, a courier and um, identity check systems uh, that I will explain. So the first uh, part of the permissive HR and tech uh, apparatus comes from a change uh, from um, self-service booking system where workers were able to basically book uh, specific shifts. Uh, and this was based on their you know, overall evaluation, whether they were good workers or not, uh, if their performance was well evaluated by the platform or not. And they were able to access uh, peak times, which, were, which gave more money, obviously. Uh, and this change to a free login system. So this all system, this algorithm basically was taken out and uh, it was replaced by a free login system where everyone can, uh, in essence, log in uh, depending on some uh, 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 aspects uh, such as um, if, the, if you are 18 years old, old or, or more, if you have the right to work in the UK and so on. So very kind of broad aspects. Um, so yeah, so another uh, permissive aspect of HR and technology is uh, the naming of substitutes. Um, uh, so what we have seen here uh, is uh, 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 a, a way of, again, externalizing responsibilities and costs to workers, according to the platforms. It is the courier's role of, under, uh, of undertaking the checks when appointing a substitute. So you are allowed to appoint a substitute, but you have to uh, undertake a number of checks. Um, and uh, these checks are costed at 25 pounds uh, and include the proof of adult status and the possession of uh, right to work uh, documentation in the UK and whether you have 18 years old or more. Of course, most, carry, most couriers uh, we have interviewed uh, who appointed substitutes refer to this as being too much of a hassle and that basically no one was doing because platforms don't really care or check uh, in any way. So uh, what happens is that uh, I'm going to skip this. Uh, what happens is that we see an emergence of informal um, uh, labor market uh, occurring here. So we have the traditional one uh, at the top there with <coughs> workers having a relationship with platform. Uh, these are uh, native and migrant couriers that undertake the, this type of work. But then some of these couriers also um, for a, for a weekly fee, rent their account details to uh, undocumented workers, undocumented, those that don't have the right to work in the UK, um, and, uh, and therefore an informal migrant, uh, uh, an informal labor market kind of uh, uh, emerges here. So, So how does this uh, actually um, ha happens? Uh, so for instance, Mario uh, here, an undocumented worker uh, tells us, or courier uh, tells us that, uh, um, that uh, they started to working uh, to search uh, ads on Facebook 
that these are for example the ads that you can find on facebook it's uh, widely available they asked me if i needed a bike as well if i needed a gear or a helmet for an extra fee for an extra weekly fee um, another uh, undocumented courier did the didn't need to go on to Facebook because I had a cousin like we, uh, who uh, 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 um, rented or uh, kind of borrowed the account at no cost so that he could start working immediately to pay some of the debts. So basically these undocumented workers are uh, people that come into the, in the UK and indebted uh, with a lot of debt uh, from traveling and so on, but also that incurring more debt uh, because of uh, trying to get into waged labor. So what are the outcomes uh, for uh, the companies? Uh, so for the companies, uh, we have uh, using undocumented migrants meant that the, there was always available workforce, for, so an always available workforce that was present. Uh, and that was willing to work at any time of the day of the year, regardless of weather and working conditions. So we have seen a lot of demonstrations now of, uh, in the UK because of uh, low pay, uh, potentially some of these workers, 10% of these workers uh, continue to work. Couriers often spoke about always working and being available for work because uh, of their condition as undocumented and as debt owners. So we have some, uh, uh, quotes here. I don't know. So, you know, similar to the case before, uh, where uh, individuals working on Fridays and weekends uh, for uh, sometimes I work over 15 hours uh, uh, each day to compensate for the little money that I make. What are the outcomes for the for the Sorry. workers? How many? Three minutes? That's enough. Thank you. Okay. Uh, for the for the uh, workers, we have some, uh, uh, no, I've lost my presentation here, I'm sorry. Technology, I hate technology. Uh, okay, there you go. For the workers themselves, there was hyper precarity, workers reported low incomes, constantly working night and day, and obviously long working hours. Um, uh, with very little health and safety uh, stand, uh, conditions as well, because we are talking about workers that don't, do not have access to uh, basic uh, services, so, such as workplace uh, insurance, right? They, they are undocumented, so they, are, they cannot uh, in, uh, buy this uh, uh, extra uh, health and safety insurance, and which makes them highly uh, vulnerable. So in terms of uh, conclusion, we see that uh, the regulation at national level kind of meshes up with permissive company tech uh, and HR practices to create first exclusionary labor market practices uh, through se uh, second an informal labor market in food deli delivery. So going, uh, although our study uh, shows undocumented migrant contract contractors welcome the informal work opportunities because for, for them, they saw this as a, a step from not earning any money to earning some money, right? Uh, also, at, uh, our study also advances knowledge on how these dynamics act as potential progress uh, inhibitor for migrant label by locking workers into a sector and associated forms of informalization and exploitation. So what we can see here is workers being locked in this type of work and being uh, and very difficult to step out from uh, from this um, this type of work from inform informal work for the labor market it is increasingly difficult to step up uh, into the formal labor market and get a better job um, and for the society the risks um, are that uh, as the gig economy grows there is a greater danger of an expansive informal labor market and more unemployed uh, unemployment across the economy. Uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. so that I wanted to just leave there. Um, and this is kind of ongoing, uh, uh, ongoing developments as we see uh, 
a more hostile environment from the UK government migrants migrant uh, and border kind of policy uh, it will be quite a bleak uh, to see in the next uh, years or so yeah sorry about that yeah, thank you thank you for that. thank you very much perfect time keeping this time <laughs> uh, it's always easy when you're one than <clears throat> two presenters sorry Thanks a lot for this uh, very interesting presentation. And now we go to Hannes Tegemann uh, from University of Amsterdam. She's doing a PhD uh, there, no? Your PhD candidate. And also uh, she's a visiting fellow at the University of Leeds. And, um, and there will be presentation slides at some point, but I'll start already because I'm happy to just... Oh, okay, no, yeah. go. it goes um, really quick. So you can wait for your... Well, also, you know, there's a real... I'm so impressed with how this conference has been put together because I didn't know any of my other panelists before I came here today in this room. And I'm like, whoa, there's so, there's so much connection between our papers. And I think that's really inspiring. And I really want to talk to all of you more afterwards. Um, but also by putting me at the very last panel, the sort of the last person on the last panel, What's going to happen is I'm going to improvise because <laughs> I've heard so many interesting things today and just now in this panel that I kind of want to like comment on. And I'm sure I'm going to deviate from my plan, but I'll stick to sort of 10 minutes to, to be kind of quick. Just to give a little bit of context about what I do. Um, I'm Hannah. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam, where I look at the labor done by uh, online sex workers. So in the title, it says adult because I didn't want to scare you with the word sex. Um, but the thing that I'm really working on is the work that webcam performers do. Um, and I look at this in the Netherlands, in the UK and in Romania. And the case I'm talking about today specifically is in Romania. Um, but just for those of you who don't know or who will pretend to not know, webcam workers uh, do live stream performances in which they usually engage in sexual acts, but not always. Um, and they do that either paid per minute or sort of tips with tokens. Um, it's sort of like people tend to say it's like the more appealing version of porn because you get to interact with someone. Um, and that is sort of what this uh, model functions on, but it very much is like a lot of other platform work as well. Um, I think the only thing that is, should be noted about its specificity is the fact that it's highly stigmatized because it is sex work. So some of the anxieties we might have about work tend to be heightened when we discuss this work, just because people tend to have sort of feelings and ideas about sex. Um, but it doesn't make it any less legitimate as work and doesn't make it any less legitimate for a conference like this, I think. Um, so what I'm talking about today is in Romania, uh, people work a lot from studios. And now I'm thinking already about the, the Uber fleets and the fleet partners and the intermediaries that came up here. So many online sex workers, when we think about it in sort of the context of the UK and things like OnlyFans, you think one woman working from home. That is not the case in Romania. There's lots of people who work from office-like buildings with managers and then with these things called admins. And I have an admin quote on the screen who help performers do their job. Um, and they do that in many, many ways. Um, but one of the ways is that they can type on behalf of a performer to the customers. Um, so in, instead of using sort of voice and speech, quite a lot of performers still use um, typing when it comes to their performance. So they'll do on-screen performance, but the sort of interaction with the customer goes through chat. And in some of these studios, that chat is actually monitored by someone else than the actual performer. Um, that also has to do with the long history of this type of work, because when we think about Uber already or ride hailing being 15 years old, I think really if these sort of, if these sort of conferences talked about sex work more often, you'd know that, um, you know, since 1996, there's been platforms around on which people work. Like platform work is really quite old if you include webcamming, um, because that is the type of platform work that was already around in the 90s in a lot of the similar ways that it is around now in webcamming, but also in other industries. Um, so again, I'm like deviating so much from my plan. I was going to present something about the ways in which uh, admins in Romanian webcamming studios sort of lead to a division of 
emotional and immaterial labor. So I think quite often when we talk about divisions of labor, you know, if we talk about Braverman, if we talk about the traditional text, it's about material labor being split up into these little tasks. Um, and I think for immaterial labor, we don't talk about it that often because with immaterial labor, so stuff like, you know, emotional labor, relational labor, we see it as very personal and individual. But I think what digital technologies are doing is they, because of the invisibility, they allow people like admins in Romanian webcamming studios, they actually sort of create an opportunity to also ver further divvy up this really like sort of seemingly personal work, this seemingly authentic work. And also it hinges on its very invisibility because the client wouldn't buy into it if they could see it with someone else. So this entire thing sort of, it hinges on perceived authenticity, um, but it actually can be divided up into tasks for multiple workers. And I think this applies in webcamming, but I think it applies elsewhere as well. Um, if you also think about people who are sort of content creators, who have whole, sometimes whole teams behind them, who also respond to messages, who edit videos, even though fans will probably think, you know, I have a relationship with this lifestyle blogger, um, even though sometimes there's whole management teams behind these people. Um, so again, I think, you know, when I say stuff about webcamming, I, I hope you can also see how it might apply elsewhere as well. Um, so what my research is based on, or this presentation is based on, is some of the field work that I've done in Romania, mainly in the spring of 2022, um, in which I did in-depth interviews with webcam performers mainly. Um, in Romania, people tend to use the term video chat models, so I might use those interchangeably, um, but then also people who work at the studios I described before. So those are the places in which performers quite often still tend to work. Um, so there I talk to these admins who are essentially sort of assistants um, and also to some studio owners and some other experts uh in the industry if anyone wants to talk about methods i would love to but there's no time for that right now um but the sort of traditionally when people write about webcamming uh the types of labor that i described are aesthetic so the way in which you look on the screen how you appeal to audiences that way emotional so how you express sort of your emotional state and arousal whether or not it's real um, and how you create relationships through effective labor. And these are all seen to be performed by one person individually. Um, when you think about the existence of admins in Romanian studios, what I would say is that all of this labor is distributed. So you get distributed emotional labor and distributed effective labor, um, and also influencing of decisions about aesthetic labor. And I'm just gonna quickly show you some examples of that so you might get a better sense of what I mean when I say these things. Um, so when I talk about distributed effective labor, I I think there's many uh, reasons to critique effective labor as, be, as like being too similar to emotional labor and all these definitions are very muddy, um, but I tend to focus that one on, okay, effective labor is meant to produce affect in the customer. Um, and we tend to think, oh, a model does this, you, you make a customer happy, they pay you, done. Um, but an admin can say, you know, well, I type on their behalf. And sometimes that's done because not all models in Romania speak English. Um, but sometimes that is also done because as Edward told me, uh, the models who are primarily women don't know how to talk with men. And there's this really pervasive idea that men as admins are better at this job because they are better at seducing men. Um, they also all self-identify as straight. Um, so they do this work of creating an emotional state in clients that is actually sort of more profitable. When it comes to emotional labor, what I'm talking about more so is the, the emotionality that the performer themselves has on the screen that needs to be suitable to the service interaction, the way in which it's also, you know, the case for a waitress. You don't want a waitress to be grumpy. Um, when a model works alone, quite often people have told me, if I'm grumpy, I'm not going to go online. If you work from a studio, you have shifts. So again, I'm seeing parallels. Um, you, you have to go in, even on the days you're grumpy. So what admins do is they create happiness 
in models. And they really talk about this in these terms as well, managers as well. They say you make zero money with a depressed girl. So what you do is you joke, you laugh, you try to sort of keep the energy high. So they'll type messages to her. They'll do sort of things to make the model appear happy because that's how you make money. Um, which also then requires emotional labor from the admins themselves who, you know, they have to stay happy as Silvio said here. Um, so if he feels down, no one would make money is basically what he says. Um, so it requires sort of work from admins and from models all at the same time to keep this appearance up. What this I think means, it is sort of divided immaterial and relational labor is there's loads of sort of ambiguous things happening here because on the one hand it can be positive to share this work you know some of this work is really hard and I think we need to recognize that Im immaterial labor can be really taxing for people so you know if someone assists you that can be helpful on the other hand it means you have less control over your own work and the way in which you appear online and especially in a stigmatized industry that really matters for admins it means they take on quite a heavy burden of labor while not taking on the risk of being seen to perform that labor. And for managers in studios, and I think you know this is where it all comes down to, it means they have increased control over model labor and income. Because if they can sort of maximize the happiness and maximize the effective labor, they can try and make as much money as possible. And that is what it all comes down to in the end. Um, so some brief implications that I would wanna discuss are, <laughs> I think, and this panel is an excellent example, we need to talk about intermediaries in platform work way more because they do exist and not just in webcamming. I think it also makes a case for sort of these personal types of labor and the ways in which it can be divided um, that that offers an opportunity for, you know, things like skilling have been discussed quite often, but, and, but it also offers the opportunity for assistance and control in various sort of power relations that I think need to be investigated. And it really highlights the labor that is required for authentic content and for sort of all these immaterial services. Um, when, you, when you show that there's a whole team behind this production, then all of a sudden it becomes easier for people to recognize just how much work it is. And I think in recognizing some of the sort of invisible labor, women's work, stuff like that, showing these teams behind the production of it can actually be a little bit useful in getting some of that recognition, even though that recognition should have been there right from the start. Um, so I did both improvise and also still deliver my presentation. <laughs> these are the references. Um, I welcome any questions as well thank you thank you very much uh fascinating very well improv improvised <laughs> uh, and uh, now we have a bit of time still for questions because we were a bit delayed so yeah like let's say until what we have 15 minutes yes yeah so let's let's collect a few questions and then give the, the floor to the panelists Okay, so yeah, we go. I, I keep collecting. Thank you. Yes, I would have a um, kind of more factual uh, question to our Polish colleagues. Actually, the working with the intermediaries with Uber, how does it work? Is there an app with uh, two different axes, one for the intermediary and one for the for the driver? Um, and so, how is the accounting done? How does it work in a in a practical sense? Um, so because to this is linked the question, does actually have the driver nonetheless a direct relationship with Uber, also working through an intermediary? Uh, there was a question. Hi, thank you all for your presentations. Um, this is to all of you who um, looked at those intermediaries. Um, I observed similar things in cloud work, but also uh, a lot in delivery platforms in China. And they also have those managers and they distribute everything. Um, but what I was always wondering about and uh, where I would like your insight is um, what is diff like what to do with those intermediate middle managers on the platform? So what is special about them? What is new about them? Uh, how do they, yeah, how do they operate some of them? Because in the Cloudware context, I noticed that they were uh, also not knowing why they had this role, right? So they were just distributed to, um, to get tasks they, they should manage. But um, 
yeah, so what about those intermediaries? What is interesting about them? What should be uh, done? What kind of research should be done about that? Thank you. So, Victor, just call. Um, just a quick question for the last presentation I found very interesting. What I wanted to hear more about is um, if you have evidence of actually what the platforms do, because you, you spoke more about the division of labor. I found that super interesting, but I remember reading some time ago about um, basically the uh, practices of platforms via the model. So, for instance, if you uh, don't agree to the fee or if you multi-home, so if you prov provide services on se several platforms that they could, for instance, block you and so forth. So there were a lot of practices which could be quite, um, well, not legal in view of existing legislation. I'm thinking platform to business, for instance, but I was wondering if you have ev any evidence of that and if you'd like to share that. Thank you. And the last one, I don't, ah, okay. So Wouter and... Uh, okay. Thanks. I, I love all of the empirical, really detailed empirical stuff. And I, I like you, I was like, oh, it's the same everywhere. Um, so I, I'm going to follow your trajectory and, and cite some real classical sociologists. Uh, Anselm Strauss, what is this a story of? What is, what is the story of the intermediaries? And there's a, there's a British media scholar named Alison Powell who's starting to write papers about deceptive stories about the future and about technology. And I'm starting to wonder, you know, there was one story that Uber sold us all in 2018, which was, oh, we're going to have autonomous cars, right? All the drivers are going to be out of business. Does anybody remember that story? Like, that, what happened to that? That didn't work. And then we, you know, those of us who have been writing about this for a while and, and doing advocacy around this for a while was like, oh, they've automated the managers. They've automated dispatch. That's what this is about. This is a story about algorithmic management. But what I'm starting to hear from some of you is that in a lot of the cases, that's not even true either. So what, what is it? What are the platforms even, what is the value that they're adding? What are they doing? Try to be brief. Uh, yes, thank you all very much for really interesting uh, presentations. I just wanted to ask a question on, uh, I think it came out from several of the talks on this role of essentially the reserve army of labor and the vulnerability of people that pushes them to, to platforms. And um, I had a question specifically uh, to Pedro on the undocumented workers who really can be seen as the most vulnerable in, in well, maybe not the most, but a, a severely vulnerable group. Um, and whether you have in your research found any of these specific risks for these workers, what the costs are for them because they, they loan the, um, accounts, but at what cost? And does, do they actually make money out of it? I'd be quite interested in that. Um, and then a question to Hannah as well. Um, because you mentioned in your research that you also look in the Netherlands and, and the UK. Because we heard here the importance of context and the differences in regulation. And of course, when you're talking about sex work in general, they're very differently regulated in these different countries. Do you see big variation there in how this particular industry is organized? Um, yeah, and I will stop there thank you all so much last one i think and then... hey thanks everyone uh, uh simon joyce university of leeds just i mean this is sparked by what six said about the stories i mean you have i didn't believe the autonomous cars we can talk about why after but the, the remember that these plat there's two things about these platforms one is the arbitrage okay the legal and regulator arbi the regulatory arbitrage which has been part of their business model since they started. That means they tell lies systematically about what they're actually doing. That's part of the business model. So you really don't believe the hype. Um, just a, a question, something that was mentioned by the, the first thing, first uh, pair, but I, I kind of want to ask to all of you, and that's, we're talking, we're talking about business models and that's profit because that's because the big transportation Com companies and food delivery by and large don't make profit okay so uber just scraped a little profit last year 80 percent of which was based on revaluing their shareholdings in other companies uh, on a, a income of 152 billion dollars they made a, a profit of one third of a billion dollars which is almost nothing uh, but we've got a business model where individual based on built on venture capital 
where a small number of people can get immensely rich without ever making a profit in their company. Okay, so and that's I just think that introduces a whole dynamic which is not like profit and loss. It's not about surplus value. It's whatever categories you use to understand it that introduces something different to this sector. Except that I bet Hannah's companies have made a profit. So I just like you to say <laughs> something about that, about the profits there. And just also a question to Pedro. Um, the, the practices of that informal s s trading of, of, of um, j tickets to work on the companies, that's as, especially associated with Deliveroo, I think. Do you find it on others? Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I, because they've, done a, they've made it especially easy to substitute other workers, but there's been recent coverage in the news in Britain about the number of children who are doing this. Mm -hmm. So people like at the age of, there was a kid who was 15 killed whilst delivering recently in a road accident. I just wondered if you want to say something about if you've come across that in your research. Okay, thank you very much. So now uh, I leave the speakers to choose which questions they want to, uh, to answer and perhaps then continue afterwards uh, on the cocktail. Let's do it in the in okay. order of presentations. Okay, so um, I will answer the practical questions about apps and how, how does it work. So uh, driver has only Uber, Bolt or Free now app. Uh, this is the only app and this is the only connection between driver and the platform, the app. The all uh, administrative and formal issues are done with fleet partners. Uh, it means also uh, in majority of cases now, the contract of mandate between uh, uh, an intermediary and the driver. The intermediary, the fleet partner is also responsible for all those formal issues that are required by the state. I mean, the license in each city uh, and so on and so on. He's also, he, it is also responsible for taxes uh, and all, 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 and for all those uh, issues, uh, the driver is paying fee. Yes, and uh, in, in other in other side, uh, uh, it is Uber who gives money for each driver to fleet partner, and then fleet partner pays the money to to the driver. So there is no uh, no money connection, direct connection between Uber and the driver as it is in other countries. Yes, the money goes through fleet partner, and of course it is. Uh, th this fee is taken from 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 the income, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for all the questions, especially it's so late. <laughs> so so uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I, I I will try to be brief. Yeah. What what about the promise the platform made <clears throat> for, for all of us or for for the market itself? I try to uh, analyze through the Schumpeter's criteria of innovativeness and I came up to the to the conclusion that they are innovative in the organization point so so they they offer new way of of organizing business in which they are skipping the work relation and they are still able to monitor and control workforce so this is something something new thanks to the technology technology is strongly supported by venture capital yeah as, as as you said as well, so so they they try to sell us the promise of future profit simply, or, or they they at least try to do it for shareholders. Yeah, and they, and they are quite successful in that matter. So so they they were really successful in selling this promise that they're gonna introduce autonomic car, and they they gain a lot of money thanks to it. Yes, yeah, so, so they are quite. Um, quite successful in that matter. And what about partners? Uh, you ask, uh, what's new about them? Not much, I think. Yeah, that they simply show us that the the global organization needs someone in place uh, in, the, in the direct relation with uh, with worker. And if we can even implement the classical theory of the firm from Roland case. Yeah, that if it is cheaper to introduce some uh, advisor on the level of the platform, they're gonna do it. If it is a cheaper to introduce intermediary as in our case, 
they're gonna do it same thing yeah so well, yeah okay so thank you we'll talk in the killer thing uh, i will only uh speak very shortly or comment on uh, the profit first uh, i don't think uh the I will talk about Gita, for instance, there in Britain as well, right? In Turkey, so they established with uh, they established an outsourcing model, which they profit a lot, and then they made a super app that you can call a taxi, you can find a job, you can order uh, groceries, you can order food, and like like seven services they have. So uh, I don't think their first idea. And they went to Britain, they went to France, etc., USA, yeah, Germany. And uh, the profit was not the first goal, I think. It was, okay, we are making profit and let's take it all. Let's go to these markets and if we withdraw, we withdraw. What are we going to lose? Because we are outsourcing the complete workforce. So, yeah, uh, that's the first thing I can say. That That's their logic, I believe. I can't talk for them and the second thing is about the uh, what platforms uh, add as a value uh, I think we should discuss this more uh, about the global south is like the platforms invest in global north uh, promote themselves as the future right technology the future is here blah blah in Turkey <laughs> In Turkey, uh, Trendyol is the biggest platform. They, their biggest marketing strategy is we are providing employment for uh, for Turkish citizens. So, like we'll talk if you want, we'll uh, further discuss this uh, this difference. Uh, and yeah, that's it. This is the slide that we have to skip. Yeah, <laughs> I want to. Uh, at the, that point of the global north companies, yeah, that's what I have to share. Uh, that the point of the global north uh, companies hiring, especially in the UK, global south uh, uh, em employees, workers is quite interesting, isn't it? The kind of uh, exploitation continues of global south, not in the global south, but in the global north. Uh, that's quite interesting. But uh, asking the uh, answering the questions for the account holders, they would uh, uh, rent the the account for around uh, fifty to one hundred pounds a week. So uh, undocumented workers would pay uh, that uh, that amount of money uh, a week. Um, in terms of costs, that would be it, and then also obviously. Uh, paying debt, that would be the most uh, um, uh, cost that they would have. Um, for the account holders, the formal account holders, the cost would be also to lose that uh, account, which is quite uh, then difficult to retrieve, to, to get another account, because it takes a long time to, to be accepted and so on anyway. Um, but uh, answering uh, here the question, I saw also in uh, this happening in not only Deliveroo, but also Uber uh, Eats. And I see, uh, I'm, uh, I'm also conducting uh, research in Spain and other uh, and quite widespread practice around Europe as well, this uh, inf uh, informal uh, renting of accounts. So yeah, living in Spain. Yeah, I, I think we can hear the sounds of a drinks reception starting outside so i'll be quick um but i think i want to talk first about this this question of what is the story and also what is sort of maybe what is new about intermediaries and all of these things because i think my point and i'm sure maybe other people will agree but some people will also disagree is that many of these things aren't new and like the appearance of newness is a sort of part marketing strategy part sort of disposition we have for just things seeming new even if they're the same thing but repackaged and I think that at least for um webcamming tends to be the story a little bit like this is just what I what I've observed in Romania is just sort of traditional ways of working that yeah they're done through a platform 
but also it, you show up at six and you leave at two and you have a nice smoke break with your colleagues and you complain about your boss and like it's it's just the same stuff in a way and I think there are obviously like there's always new nuances and things to explore but I think it's good not to lose sight of the history of these things and sort of this traditional ways in which some things just work um and then I'll also quickly talk about the role of platforms in webcamming there's loads to say I specifically chose to focus on admins today but obviously like platforms do have the, a shaping role in in like I wrote a piece a while back about certain fetishes that you can't perform on platforms which is like it's one little thing but it also means that all of a sudden these private companies say which types of sexuality are acceptable and which types are not which I think is very problematic um and then finally about like regulation and stuff so be in the EU and in Europe generally there's no uh like webcamming and online sex work does not fall under sex work reg regulation so it just deals with the same stuff the same laws that we've been talking about here loads today apart from the fact that quite often when these laws are discussed and when they're being made webcam performers sex workers are not being taken into account even though they have been around for so many years and there's so many of them and it's a very profitable industry um and i know there's like some new work recently starting but i think really it's like it's important for this to be part of the conversation and to do it with care and sort of attention to these things. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for uh, for the input to the participants as well for the pa for the patients. Um, I think it it was we ended on a nice note as well that echoes or or discusses questions the title of the session itself because I, I was thinking all the time about how your presentations actually. Uh, yeah, question this di disruptive effect or, or what are the continuities uh, that we're discussing about. Uh, we also learned a, a lot about the, the labor process and the complexities of platform work, what it means in the in, in South in comparison to North, uh, gl the global North uh, countries. So thank you very much to all, uh, to Maria as well, uh, hiding <laughs> over there and controlling uh, the session and the, and the slides. And now let's go all for a drink. We can keep discussing outside and see you tomorrow at 9, uh, 9.30. Uh, the panel is starting, but 9, you can come for a coffee. So.